the journeys of several writers who feature Port of Spain in their work. Step into the enthralling worlds they've created. Create a literary mashup, mixing stories with a sense of place to make literature come alive. We begin at the Red House, seat of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. Of course we miss school, the sound of the actual bell, lunchtime with friends, teachers annoying us in person. <laughs> Just joking. We all really wish to make this new way of learning easier. Right Away is motivation. Right Away is support. Right Away is an escape in beautiful fantasy. Right Away is a young writer's dream. 
Right Away is a new way of learning in this age of technology. When I say Right Away, I'm talking about fascinating Caribbean characters created by top writers. I'm also talking about some really good videos presented by a writer, performer, and teacher, Lisa Allen Augustini. She's won prizes for her books and likes to tell jokes. And there's a package just for teachers so they can help us with online learning. During the pandemic, we have been forced to be at home and we still had to give out our content in our subjects. So having the videos ended up being very successful. The videos include all the crucial areas in creative writing that will definitely have a positive effect on the lives of young writers like Tia Lamont, Winnie Johnson, Sierra Najir, Hannah Isahak, Sydney Homer, Jaden Phillips, Tamara Joseph, Amali Britton. We believe that with the right support, our young people can realize their full potential and unlock a future that benefits not only them, but also their families and community. I enjoy writing. I think it's a way, the best way I'm able to express myself. I asked Miss Lisa how to get through writer's block and she answered it so clearly. She explained it and it really helped me, you know, inspired me to write my own stories. It was easy learning from home because I was in a relaxed spot. So it was easier than in school where you have to be around, you know, your friends. In addition to providing culturally relevant books to school libraries, it is especially wonderful that the program is being offered through digital learning. With support from Scotiabank, we can look forward to novels from many of the young dreamers who continue to write away. The Western Sun would create a shadow from the house. There you still had a bit of light, but without the heat, but the warmth and the cool and equilibrium. She favored that spot greatly, especially in the summer days. Mom, I'm home. No answer. Mom, are you there? Still no answer. Steadily, David walked throughout the house. At this point, he felt queer, extremely uneasy in his stomach. The pale crescent moon shone like a silvery claw in the night sky. Looking out my huge bedroom window, I could see a blanket of stars that stretched to infinity. From the Right Away workshop, it helped me to show the characters instead of tell what they are. It opened a new, you know, world for me. It was the best experience yet again, and I wish to continue to do it again. The Right Away Young Adult Literature Project is available to all English teachers via the Trinidad and Tobago Ministry of Education's School Learning Management System, SLMS. Log into the SLMS and scroll down the home page to find the Right Away Young Adult Literature course. of the Children's Bogus Lit Fest presented by NGC. Today you will see the first part of our 2021 Children's Program. Don't go anywhere, stay glued to your seats. We have an exciting lineup of shows for you. The first feature is an animation based on our folklore. It's called Lagahoo in the Lagoon. The 
dragon can change its shape to be half human and half anything it wants to be. It drags a coffin and heavy clanking chains. People say that lagahoos like muddy, cold, misty swamps and they move about under the light of that full moon at midnight. One dark night, just before a full moon, four tourists from South America came to the Mayaro Swamp because they had heard about a lagoon in an area called Misty Lagoon and they wanted to take photographs. A hermit named Manja lived in Misty Lagoon. Very few people had ever seen him because he never left the swamp. But those who had seen him said he hardly smiled and was frightening because all his teeth were rotten. The story went around that the breath from his mouth was as cold as ice, but from his nose, it was hot as fire. His old house was made of cedar. It had no lights and very small windows. It was just a wooden box. One night, Manjak was at home, sitting quietly in the dark with his dog Sam lying at his feet, listening to the sounds of the night. He heard howls of wild animals, like lap and bats flying around, the crick crick of crickets, the croaking of frogs, and the drum-like sounds of cicadas. This night was different. However, because he thought he also heard human voices. <laughs> he was worried since some hunters thought he was a lagahoo and threatened to burn down his house. He knew that the sounds were human, but the voices did not sound like Trini's. He stood up quietly, opened his door a little, peeped out, and then stood behind it. He did not know that four tourists had come to Misty Lagoon and that two of them had gone back to their car to get replacement batteries for their torchlights and lost their way. By then, the moon was bright and the men had stumbled upon Man Jack's house. They knocked on the door. Nobody answered, but the door squeaked open. So they entered. The cedar floorboards creaked, and in a moonbeam coming through a small window, they could see a snake moving across the floor. One man let out a sudden high pitched scream, Ay! Socorro! and ran out of the open door. The other one turned around, and in the light of a moonbeam, he saw a man jack standing there with a cutlass in his hand, with Sam at his side. Sam bolted outside and disappeared in the dark, chasing the man who screamed and ran like lightning. The other tourist was trembling. He peed his pants and froze with fright. He was sweating. His eyes stared straight ahead. Manja passed the tourist who stood as still as a statue and walked through the open door. He was very angry. After a little while, the other man returned with his two friends. They heard howling, screaming, and barking. They thought that Manjak was a lagahoo and had captured their friend. They stopped when they saw a chain tied to a tree, which they thought was getting taller by each second, but realized that they were standing in quicksand and were sinking. Manjak suddenly appeared and they panicked, but he threw them the chain so that they could pull themselves out. They greeted him. Buenas noches, gracias, gracias. 
We were looking for the Lagahoo and got stuck in that mud. Manjak grinned his terrible teeth at them and they were almost convinced again that he was the Lagahoo. He invited the tourists back to his house where their friend sat quietly in his wet pants. I will show you how to see the Lagahoo that passes here on nights like this, Manjak said. He told them to look through a special hole in the right side wall of the house. The four men rushed to look through the hole. One saw half man, half wolf. One saw half man, half goat. One saw half man, half horse. The other saw an old man with a caiman head. All four saw something different. But each mysterious creature pulled chains tied to a coffin. The men turned to tell Manjak what they saw and faced a half human, half tiger. They sped out the door and never stopped running until they got to their car. Ever seen a lagoon? Our second feature is called The Mystery of the Seaweed, presented by Farouk Jr. Let's check it out! I am Captain Ferdinand, and this is a story about three siblings Bravo, Amanda, and Alex the youngest, who lived near a beach in Mayaro. One Saturday night while they were asleep, Loud groaning sounds came from the ocean, and it shook the entire place. It's all right, it's just a little earthquake, said their uncle. So the children went back to sleep. Next morning, an awful smell woke them up. Together with loud noises, they scampered to the beach to find the villagers there, all talking excitedly about the seaweed that covered the sand. The villagers decided to sweep it up into neat little piles. But that night, it happened again. Sunday into Monday, weeds everywhere. On Monday, all schools were closed. Fire brigades and ambulances and police cars could be heard throughout Mayara. Reporters came seeking answers. No one knew anything. For weeks it continued. Day after day, trucks, and tractors and backhoes came to remove the weed from the sand. Bravo asked Amanda, where do all these weeds come from? They come from somewhere out in the ocean. We could go and find them for ourselves. We could borrow Uncle's boat and go and see. No way, said Bravo, but we have to find out. Hmm, she thought, there's a council meeting tonight. 8 p.m. sharp, and Granny goes to bed early. Ta-da! Fine, said Bravo, and taking Alex too. So that night, the children tied their uncle's flashlight to the front of the boat, and they set out on their journey. Away from the shore, they started the engine. The night was cold and dark, and suddenly, Something pulled the boat forward and it went faster and faster. I want to go home, said Alex. Me too, said Bravo. Maybe this wasn't such a great idea, said Amanda. Just when she said that, the engine to the boat cut off. We ran out of gas, said Bravo. The frightened children hugged each other. Just then, the boat hit something and rocked wildly. Bravo adjusted the light at the front of the boat. It's land, he said. The children scampered out of the boat. But they realized this was not the arrow. But what they saw next was something fantastic. They saw a bright blue waterfall trickling down into a lovely pool surrounded by tall coconut trees. Beside it, they saw a man with this tail for feet? He did not notice them. 
the children him. He sneezed, and large amounts of seaweed came out of his mouth and shook the entire place. So that's where it comes from, shouted Amanda. The merman heard them, and he demanded, Who said that? So yourself. The children realized that this was the seeking of the villagers to decided to tell them why they were there. After listening to their story, the sea king replied, Humans have thrown so much garbage into the ocean that the rubbish has raised my home from the bottom of the ocean to the top. I am not feeling too mad. I will not live for very long. We could tell the villagers about keeping a clean beach, said Bravo. Yes, and, and I will draw toad litter signs and put it up everywhere, added Amanda. Just then, Bravo picked some peppermint leaves from a bush and made some tea for the king. That's my granny's recipe for the food, Bravo said with a smile. The sea king took the drink, drank it, and smiled. For your help, I will grant you one wish. The children thought, and they all decided that they wanted to return home without being punished. <laughs> in the blink of an eye, they were back in their beds. The next morning, when they woke up, they realized that there was no seaweed on the beach. So the children talked to their parents about keeping a clean beach. Their parents promised to bring it up at the council meeting later that night. Just when they were about to sit for breakfast, they heard the voice of their uncle yelling outside, Hey! Who tied this flashlight in the front of my boat? The children looked at each other and smiled. <laughs> Remember kids, to always throw your trash in the bin. Now we have a segment called Reading with Dragonzilla. The name of the story is Lost in Juve. Will you read with me? Awesome! Lost in Juve One Carnival Monday morning, Anya, who was seven years old, and her father headed into town for Juve. It was the first time that she got to go when it was still dark. In Juve, you could meet Jab Jabs, Blue Devils, Midnight rubbers, muddy people, sailors, dragons, and tall, tall moko jumbies. There are people throwing colored water and a lot of noise. Whistleblowing, shuck shucks shaking, and loud drumming steel pan music pounding like the beat of your heart. Her father warned her that she must stay close to him at all times. He placed an ID bracelet on her wrist. In case you get lost, he said. That is all my information. Cell phone, name, everything. Just look for a police officer and show him this bracelet. They will find me. Do not be afraid. The first character she saw was Bookman, who was dancing nearby. He carried a big book. When he leaned forward to ask her name, to enter into the Book of Souls for the Devil. All Anne saw was the face of an angry red devil on his head. Anya screamed in fright and started to cry. Stop crying, her father said, and got her something to drink. In the dark streets filled with people, she saw a band of devils with horns on their heads. There was so much whistleblowing noise and fire sweaty blue red and black oily bodies swept past her wriggling to the sound made on old biscuit tins it was like a bad dream and anya felt lost anya's father was enjoying the festivities and was unaware of her anxiety in the midst of the bacchanal Suddenly, 
A man staggered in front of her. She gasped, letting go of her father's hand. When she recovered from her fright, she looked around. She realized that a band of dancing revelers had taken her father away. She was in the dark with strangers, devils, and noise. With no father in sight, Anya ran in the direction of a passing band in search of her father. She stumbled and fell. When she looked up, she saw Moko Jumbies as tall as the sky. She closed her eyes tightly and when she opened them again, she saw her father and ran to him. A strange man looked surprised and asked, Are you lost? Where are your parents? She stammered and darted away from him. She remembered the band on her wrist and what her father had told her about finding a police officer should she get lost. She began looking for a police officer. Suddenly, she saw her aunt, who was covered in mud and oil, except for her face. Auntie, she bawled. Her aunt pulled Anya close to her, asking, Why are you alone? Anya shouted over the music, telling her what had happened. Stay with me, her aunt said. Your father will find us. Soon after, her father and a police officer spotted Anya, covered in paint, dancing with her aunt. Anya ran to her father and hugged him. They danced together as the sun began to rise. Juve was not scary at all. It was fun. I'm so happy Anya found her auntie. Being lost can be so frightening. Our next feature is called How the Golden Tree Frog Found His Voice. It's told by Auntie Joan Osborne. Behold the lush green Aripo forest, home of diverse creatures iguana, lap, monkey, deer, snake, and most importantly, the subject of our story today is the golden tree frog. You will think that they live in such a beautiful place. They will be happy. Oh no, they have been constantly under attack by greedy hunters. These quantrels have been for hundreds of years attacking the animals in the forest to steal their feathers and also their meat, they will burn the bushes as they set fire for their meat. Well, Michael the monkey said, it's time it's finished. It must stop. He went to Oscar the Ocelot. And Oscar said, I agree with you. I agree with you. We need to have a meeting of all the animals. So he decided to go in his secret sanctuary where they normally hide when they are under attack. And they decided to use all of their skills so that they could chase those greedy hunters away. Mr. Snake said he's going to wrap across the road so that when they walk, they will stumble. Mr. Parrot said he was going to make a loud noise quack, 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 so that will hurt their ears. And the bird said they will peck them Pecked them in the eyes so they wouldn't see. And ay, 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 ay. then the spider said they're going to weave a web so it will tie them up. They decided to make a plan. When they are pointed that, when there's no full moon, when the hunters can't see nothing, they will make the attack. When the night time came, at the appointed day, the hunters, as usual, come into the forest. Mr. Big Ears, big, fat, and bald, when he walk, he walk like boom, 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 boom. Everybody could hear him, just frighten all the animals. Wait, Mr. Snake said, Oscar said, no, wait. But the hunters set a fire, 
and take the little, the, 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 the um, kerosene, they throw it on the, on the, on the wood, and they make it up and light a fire. The whole forest is light. Rolling noise, Oscar the Ocelot. <laughs> Mr. Snake, right, wrap himself around the hut, but the hunters, they attack with full force, shooting animals, shooting deer, shooting Ocelot. They were hopelessly outnumbered. Then suddenly, in order to cover their work, they set the whole forest afire. The animals were in despair. They were crying, oh God, help us, help us. Suddenly a rain came down and drenched everywhere. In their tears, the work they did not really pull them through from slippery to one called Papa because she could not do anything. She said, Papa Bo is the only man for this. When she told Papa Bo, Papa Bo was enraged. He said, don't worry. He made a secret call to all the animals in Trinidad and Tobago, in every forest, began making their way up to our people. And Papa Bo led with his army of Sukuya with the golden light going up into the forest, Lagahu and Sukuya and Mamadelo and Duel. The noise when they got to the hunters, the hunters had their guns, so they were not afraid. They began shooting at Papa Boa. Bam, bam, bam. Bullets began bouncing off of Papa Boa as they came moving forward. Moving forward, moving forward. Papa Boa and his whole army of folklore characters. Well, until this time, get so frightened, they dropped their gun and began to run and scream ah, 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 like babies out of the forest. Ah, listen, the golden tree fell. I am going to make you the guardian of this Aripo forest. All the animals cheered. You are our hero, you are our hero. You saved us, you saved us. Any time you enter the forest, you realize you hear a song of the golden tree. That is the reason that they are a guardian of the Aripo forest. It's so amazing how a small positive action can have such a wonderful and big impact. Now we're going to have a reading done by Summer Edward. The name of her story is The Wonder of the World Leaf. I stare out the window at the howling wind and rain. In our kitchen, it is warm and bright. Spicy sweet cloves simmer in hot honey water. Carry some for Granny, Mooma says, to help with the bad feeling. Granny's room is quiet, the curtains pulled shut. I help Granny sit up and sip the warm tea. Thank you, dearie, that helps. Granny tries to smile, but her head hurts. Ever since Grandad passed on, she hardly talks and lies in bed a lot. In school, it's hard to pay attention. 
we are learning about a plant called Wonder of the World. Everyone gets a leaf to put inside their copybook. This is a very special leaf, Miss says. It can grow into a new plant just like a seed. Miss teaches us about bush medicine. Long ago, plants like the one of the world were used to help sick people get better. After school, I shall Muma my leaf. What do you know about one of the world, child? Muma says, chuckling. That is thing from before time. It could cure sick people like Granny, I say. Well, it might work, Muma says, but you need plenty of leaves. So that's a short excerpt from The Wonder of the World Leaf, my new book, illustrated by Sayida Ramdial. I hope you'll keep reading to find out if Wygenia succeeds in finding a Wonder of the World plant and if she's able to make bush medicine that can make Granny feel better. Have you ever seen a Wonder of the World Leaf? Up next, we have another reading, this time by Yolanda T. Marshall. The story she'll be reading is called My Soka Birthday Party. Hi, I am Yolanda T. Marshall, a Guyanese-born Canadian author of picture books representing children of Caribbean heritage. And I am excited to share my recent release with you, My Soka Birthday Party with Jollof Rice and Steel Pens. And what a perfect way to celebrate the Children's Vocal Lit Fest on its 10th anniversary. Anne's birthday was two days away and she was super excited. Her friends were secretly planning a surprise soca party and loved soca music like her Caribbean parents been to announce. She had appointed herself as the planner. Let's confirm our responsibilities. What will each of you bring to the party? Kofi quickly volunteered to bring Anne's favorite West African dish, jollof rice with nicely fried plantains. Anne can never resist it, especially when my aunt cooks it. I will bring Palau. My mom is from Trinidad and Tobago and she is the best cook I know, Kelvin bragged. Juma asked, is it a rice dish? It sounds like Palau. A rice dish my Tanzanian father makes. Yes, it is a traditional rice dish. You should bring yours too, said Kelvin. I will, I will, Juma shouted excitedly. Benta reminded the group, we will have to play Anne's favorite music. She created a band of talented schoolmates who played the steel pans, marimba, and African and tassa drums. The children prepared to celebrate Anne's birthday with a fusion of tastes and sounds. Thank you, Focus Lit Fest. I hope that my books will shed a light in the lives of many Caribbean kids. Once again, teaching others how to celebrate us while celebrating with us. Ooh, I love steel pan music. Do you? Here's what's coming up tomorrow. You don't want to miss it. Check it out. Celebrating Caribbean voices and preserving the rich tapestry of our culture. Through literary arts and authorship, we are free to express our vibrance, passion, heritage, and the empowering narratives of our people. As proud title sponsor of the NGC Bocas Lit Fest, we have been honored to support one of the world's acclaimed literary festivals. We celebrate your journey and salute your accomplishments.
had not seen the last of the bitch. Not Mrs. Hines, the real threat. Paper? What paper? I want a shit on all your paper. You and her all right? Get the hell out of my yard. You shut your face. Will you come out? I know you. And as for you, you must think I now drop yesterday. You feel I know you're trying to take these children from the home since their dear mother gone. <laughs> God rest his soul. And now you gone so far as to bring the police for me? You dare bring police in my yard with your flimsy paper to try to take this trip? <laughs> Who the hell you feel you is? I would have never think any piece of paper could have gotten in the way of what Tanti say. But her last words that day as she put the brown grip in my hand were... We come in full, yeah? But don't tell them nothing. You hear? Mm -hmm. Auntie Beatrice always called me Cynthia like I was in school or in trouble. And she always called Tadon Codrington and he never knows she mean him. It was your Auntie Beatrice who gave you that name, dear, when you were a little tiny baby. Don't you think it's nicer than that silly name that they call you? He named Tadon. It's I who name him. Yes, darling, but that was when you were little. You're a big girl now, aren't you? I try all kind of thing to get us sent home but to my disgust oh you mustn't be naughty darling <laughs> where are we going home just now ain't you want tanti yes and mikey yes well all right paul if i boy we going home yes all right then Darling, darling, what happened? Oh, let Auntie, let Auntie Beatrice help. Tell me what's wrong. What's upsetting you? What you want? More sweeties? <laughs> we had to deal with worse before things got better. Here they are, Cynthia and Codrington. Say good afternoon, Father. Good afternoon, ladies. Good, good afternoon, afternoon, Father. Good, good afternoon, afternoon, ladies. <laughs> well, you two certainly cleaned up very nicely. Thank you. And what a nice watch, Codrington, dear. Mm, uncle, come and buy for me. Your uncle what? Dear? Uncle, come and now. Oh. oh. <laughs> That's not your uncle, dear. You only have one uncle. That's your mm. uncle, Norman. Mm. Oh, goodness. Mm. Oh, take off these damn shimmy pants, Norman. I want to cut them. Huh? Oh, my. Oh. Oh. Where are Cynthia and Codrington? Eudora, pack these children's things. Come, children. Your dead tante is taking you. God help you. I bet you say you will leave you here by your tante Beatrice. Look, my girl! <laughs> see! <laughs> well, you know. Yeah, she know big shot. Yeah, she know. Big shot in all kind of government office. Father presenting. So she gets she paper. But we wipe we backside with she paper. So now they're trying to get some tongue breeze. And in the time, I get a statement from all your father. You should have seen the bitch face in the courthouse, eh? <laughs> she looked like she panty fall down. <laughs> but that is the end of that bitch, eh? Matter fix. You live in? By your chanty. Mm -hmm. Your father self can go to hell. What say you? All ain't even have no use for here. I thought Tanti won. That that would have been the last. We retrace the journeys of several writers who feature Port of Spain in their work. Step into the enthralling worlds they've created 
create a literary mashup, mixing stories with a sense of place to make literature come alive. We begin at the Red House, seat of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. You ready? Already? It, it rolling? <clears throat> Hello and welcome to the Bocas Lit Zest. I am your host, Bookie Monster, the Book Zesser. Today, we interpret a modern classic of Caribbean literature, a brief history of seven killings. This is a critically acclaimed book that deals with big ideas. Who is a hero? What is justice? Who has governance? And killings. Plenty killings. Now we have an excerpt from A Brief History of Seven Killings with Puppets. All right, yeah, man. I will take a little ketchup. All right, stop. All right, stop. Stop! Gosh, man. You killing it with ketchup? Okay, give me some pepper. Slight, eh? Slight. I say slight. Stop now, stop. I say slight. Good man, but you go kill me. I be this now. At the at. Oh, oh, hey, hey, um. Oh. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, all right, all right, all right. Too much kisses. You're killing me with kisses. Ah, oh, you're killing me with kisses. Oh, gosh. You're killing me with kisses. Oh. What? What? You're killing me with price. You're killing me with price. No. No. What? No. You're trying to kill me with price. Sunlight does kill COVID. Mm -hmm. What? what? Is a puppy? Oh, that's the cutest puppy I ever see. Oh gosh. Oh gosh, it's too much. It's too much cuteness. It's too much. It's too much cuteness. You can't be with the cute. You can't. You can't. Oh, oh, God. He's killing me with cuteness. <laughs> all right, all right. So here this one all, yeah? So um, a, a kobo, a parrot, and a kiskidi walk into a bar, right? A kobo, a parrot, and a kiskidi, right? Like a green top parrot, not a, not unlike myself, right? Um, Walk into a Well, they ain't so much walking as they fly in, right? So it's a kobo. I tell you, it's a scarlet ibis and a... a oh, no, no. It's a kobo, a parrot, and... um. And a kiss kitty. They fly into this bar, right? <laughs> and then um, the, the scarlet ibis say to the man behind the bar, oh, sorry, it's not a scarlet ibis. It's the kiss kitty. As, as, so, so they fly in the bar, right? And then he asked the man, and the man say, all your serving bird seed here. Well, it's not the man, it's bar man. Well, hold on. It's not really a Why bar. Are you killing the joke. No, no, I have it, I have it. It's not a bar. It's um killing that joke, boy. It's a coffee shop, but it does serve drinks, right? So, so um, the... It done already? 
Shucks. This was no getting good. <clears throat> that was an excerpt of A Brief History of Seven Killings. Join us again for another episode of the Bookas Litzess. Until then, I am your host, Bookie Monster, the Booksesser, reminding you more reading, less stressing. Is books have we zessin? Is ideas we wetting and knowledge we getting? Bookie out! Our story today is drama at the Tobago Heritage Festival, written by children of Tobago. Every year, John and Nora took Billy, their champion goat, to Buku Race. But one year, Billy ran away from Buku Goat Race. The race was about to start. Bear, bear. Billy bleated because he did not want to race and he pulled away from his jockey. Billy turned around and head off the course and out of Buku. Stop, stop, stop! Nora, John and the jockey shouted as they ran after him. But Billy continued running and shouting. Run, run, you can't catch me. I am the fastest goat on the island. He got to Scarborough and ran uphill to the cannons at Fort King George. Nora, John, the jockey and some people from Buku village followed the all shouted, stop, 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 stop. But Billy stop, shouted back, run, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me. <laughs> Everybody was out of breath. <sighs> and tired. Some villagers sat down to have a water break. That goat really run fast, a boy said. Yes, he could win the race this year, answered another. Billy heard and looked back. He tripped on a rock and went rolling over and over down the hill. When he got to the bottom of the hill, he get up and he started to run. He ran past the stadium all the way to Mount St. George and bounced into a crowd of people eating food. Stop! 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 You are supposed to be running the goat race, shouted Nora, John and the jockey. But Billy pushed his way through the crowd and shouted back, Run, 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 as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I am the fastest goat in the land. But it was a harvest celebration. And the people served plenty dishes 
rabbit meat, crab, dumpling, fish, lambi, lobster, mm, barbecue chicken, duck, cassava. And he heard someone say, pass the goat. Curry, Curry goat, goat, Billy thought, and ran faster, followed by his friends. In Pembroke, he ran in and out of houses. Hey, hey, wait, 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 wait hold that goat. Stop that goat, hey, wait, wait. <laughs> and onto a field where people were pressing sugar cane. Stop, stop. stop. Stop! Shouted the villagers. But Billy just shouted back. Run, run, run. As fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the fastest goat in the land. <laughs> he ran to Roxborough and through the main rich forest. Then he ran along a river bank until he reached the sea in Palatyville. Nora and John followed running up the hills and down the hills and up the hills and down again until they got to Castara. In Castara, two sisters were putting leaves and wood and dry coconut husks in the dirt oven to bake sweet bread, coconut bread and cakes. Mm. Some of the Buku villagers stopped to buy bread, but Billy the goat was not stopping. He kept running. Stop! Shouted Nora, but Billy shouted back. Run, run, run! As fast as you can! You can't catch me! I'm the fastest goat on the island! Billy ran until he got to Mariah and bumped into a wedding party, doing the old time <laughs> wedding brush back dance from church to reception. The bride and the groom jump aside in fright. When they saw Billy Horns, Billy kept running through the wedding party, followed by his friends shouting, Stop Billy! Billy, Billy replied, Run, run, run! As fast as you can! You can't catch me! I am the fastest goat in the land! <laughs> he reached Monku Lane and Golden Lane, where under the gigantic Gangang Sara Silk Cotton Tree at Culloden, people were dancing the reel and jig. As he flashed up and down the hills again, he got to Lescato village and then onto Table Peace, where people were listening to old time stories. Now this story is about the Lajabless and the Lagaho. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Stop, stop, stop! Shouted the villagers. You are going too fast. But Billy answered. Run, run, run. As fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the fastest goat in the land. <laughs> he was scared of the fruit bats at Diana's Vale water wheel and speed pass and continued running through Plymouth. The village with Tobago's famous mystery tombstone of Betty Stephen. Before the British, it was settled by the Latvians and later the Dutch. The British established Fort James overlooking Corland Bay there in 1760s. He never stopped running. You can't catch me. You can't catch me. You can't catch me. <laughs> and sped past Blackrock until at last he reached Buku, followed by Nora, John, the jockey, and the Buku villagers. Billy shouted to the group, Run, 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 as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the fastest goat on the island. And I could prove it. He ran back onto the racetrack, followed by Nora, John, the jockey, and the Buku villagers. Everyone, Everyone get, get off, off the race course! Shouted the MC over the microphone. Billy and the jockey entered the final race, and they came last because they were so tired. But Billy was given a trophy because he was the only goat in history to run across the whole island of Tobago. Tobago. Tobago.
Everyone has a dream, a vision of what we want, the things that make us happy and help us make others happy. Let First Citizens help you paint a brighter future, a new home, a new car, a new day of living stress-free. Make the things you picture a reality. First Citizens, we put you first. One Caribbean Media continues its commitment to the Bocas Lit Fest with the sponsorship of the 2021 Bocas Lit Prize. Now more than ever, we recognize the invaluable role that Caribbean literature and those who create it play in our lives and do not hesitate to support their development through this continued partnership. As we navigate past these times and into the future, the OCM Group looks forward to the continued growth and success of the festival. Question, of course, is um, what have you? What are the thoughts that you have about the festival so far? I oh, well, doesn't think about the festival. What just does the festival? <laughs> you mean like evaluative? No, like like in general. What have what has struck you about the events that you've attended in the festival so far? Um, well, the event I organized um, <laughs> was fabulous. Um, no, we didn't expect that many people to come to lit on fleek and be spilling out the door of euphoria. And which is what we were trying to do, which was trying to take the festival writers to a community space because the community in that space wasn't coming to take advantage of the festival within the walls of the library for whatever reason. And so I guess something worked and you know. 70 people read for five minutes in a bar and there were plenty of people there and a hundred of these to applauded and screamed and drank expensive drinks and busted the bar and, um, yeah, they were home, uh, you know, until, you know, but even the DJ they go home. Which actually, like, leads into the next question, which is, um, obviously, Lit on Fleet was a gathering of people who wanted to hear uh, LGBT writers share their work. Yeah, largely LGBT people themselves, not exclusively. But. Exactly. Um, so what do you think is the importance as a result of exposing more people to the wealth of LGBT literature that is taking place in the Caribbean? Beyond the fact that it's, a, it's reminding people that LGBT people exist in the world. Just pause before you answer the question. So before you answer the question, can you just talk a bit about it? Because he's he just... Um, explain what it was like. Oh, you uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just give uh, some, yeah. yeah. For the people uh, who weren't there. Well, I mean, the goal of the event, Lit on Fleek, was to take writers who are important or significant enough to be in the festival. There are always quite a number of LGBT writers at Bocas from the beginning. Um, to but the LGBT community wasn't coming inside the festival to hear them year after year after year. They'd be reading to these rooms of just regular folks. And we wanted to change that. We wanted, because representations of LGBT people are becoming more common, but it's still not common enough in Caribbean literature, um, we wanted to have those writers' words reach a really important audience for them. So that was the goal. Um, uh, it's exciting that more and more kind of queer writers are writing about Caribbean queer experience. Um, I mean, it's not all that we write about, um, but it's also how it inflects our work, even when we're not writing about it. Um, that's, that's also powerful. And we wanted to take all of that to a particular community uh, who, for whom I want, who I wanted to experience the reflections of ourselves and the joy of those reflections in ways that I felt like, you know, was happening in the library and <laughs> you know, people were missing. So we did a little bit of that. Not enough. Not enough. But I mean, all, I, mean I, I, I call the festival a mangrove, I think. Um, 
in 2011, maybe. Uh, what are my columns? Like, what the best one I'm out? Because there's, I mean, there's so much going on, and you know, Marina Nicholas keep trying to add more and more and more and more. I'm not always sure I like all the more, but I mean, there's a, there's a richness and a variety of stuff in the festival. So this was, just, you know, this was our attempt to to ex to continue to expand that richness and variety. Okay. And what I think is my last question is. If you could attempt to convince somebody who has never attended the festival uh, that they should attend the festival in one sentence, what would you tell them? If you like anything to do with words, there's a mind-changing experience available for you somewhere in the festival room. Your hard work talent and creativity plus flow equals a new way of doing things flow is connecting all of trinidad from port of spain to penal so now everyone can work study and keep moving forward together making your home not just a home but a place to make anything happen visit discoverflow.co for more information basis of the Antillian experience, this shipwreck of fragments, these echoes, these shards of a huge tribal vocabulary, these partially remembered customs, and they are not decayed, but strong. And here they are, all in a single Caribbean city, Port of Spain, a downtown babble of shop signs and streets, mongrelized, polyglot, a ferment without a history, like heaven, because that is what such a city is in the new world, a writer's heaven. That's how Derek Walker described this city and what it meant to him in his Nobel Lecture in 1992 when he became the first writer from the English-speaking Caribbean to win the prestigious literary prize. The architecture of his poetry hung on its framework. Its color and vibrancy helped make his words come alive. 
He knew, as we all do, that a culture is made by its cities. Port of Spain has similarly inspired myriads of other writers whose work can be found here at the very well-stocked National Library, one of the most iconic buildings in the city. In fact, this beautifully restored old fire station building on the northeastern corner of the library was once home to Derek Walcott and the Trinidad Theatre Workshop. We retrace the journeys of several writers who feature Port of Spain in their work, step into the enthralling worlds they've created, create a literary mashup, mixing stories with a sense of place to make literature come alive. We'll start at the Red House, the seat of Trinidad and Tobago's parliament and the resting place for the remains of at least 60 indigenous ancestors, whose bones were discovered on the site when restoration of the building began back in 2013. In Ismet Khan's novel, The Jumbi Bird, which melds Indo and Afro mythology to explore a new sense of Caribbeanness. He describes the Red House as the largest, the tallest, one of the most beautiful buildings in Port of Spain. Painted a dull brick red, weathered with time and rain and sun, the Indians were particularly fond of the Red House. It reminded them of a Hussein the papier-mâché replicas of their heroes' tombs which they pulled through the streets at festive times of the year, amid great ceremony, drum-beating and promenading. Some say that the design was stolen from Hindustan, but there were others who knew differently. The Red House meant that they were all illegitimate children, that there were no legal records of their births housed in that building. The Red House and its bright red ink stained them at their roots. The determination by this pioneering generation of Caribbean writers to tell stories from a perspective other than the colonial gaze began to bring a shift in the way we saw ourselves, imbuing in us a sense of resilience and a belief that we could forge our own identity. Across the street from the Red House is the place that Trinbegonians colloquially refer to as the University of Woodford Square or the People's Parliament. the hub for political rallies in the lead-up to Trinidad and Tobago's independence from Britain, and a place where pan-African activists would give talks on history, philosophy, and politics during the Black Power era. A perfect example of how we took a space where indigenous people were slaughtered and enslaved people publicly hanged and turned it into a launching pad to craft our future. This square features prominently in Walcott's Midsummer Collection. Midsummer stretches beside me with its cat's yawn. Trees with dust on their lips, cars melting down in its furnace. Heat staggers the drifting mongrels. The capital has been repainted rose. The rails round Woodford Square, the color of rusting blood. Walcott was St. Lucian born, but he developed much of his work through the Trinidad Theatre Workshop, which he founded in the 1950s which is where I first met and worked with him much later, of course, after he won the Nobel Prize. And Port of Spain was always a huge inspiration. There's a line in one of his poems called The Spoiler's Return, where he says, all Port of Spain is a 12.30 show. It was a satirical look at the city through the voice of the late Calypsonian, the mighty spoiler. He says, it's carnival, straight carnival, that's all. The beat is bass and the melody, bob all. <laughs> Walcott understood that the comical aspects of Caribbean people were often a way of processing the heavy burden of colonialism, a recurring theme in his work. We 
cannot erase our history. It is a permanent part of who we are, as solid as this lighthouse. But as we overcome its painful legacy, it also holds the possibility of lighting our way, guiding us safely through to a new definition of ourselves. This Spanish port, piratical in diverseness with its one-eyed lighthouse, this damned sea of noise, this ochre harbor, mantled by its own scum, offers from wrought iron balconies the 19th century view. You can watch it become more African hourly, crusted roofs, hot as skillets, peppered with cries. So when the stores draw their blinds like an empire's ending, a cloaked wind bent like a scavenger rakes the trash in the gutters. It is hard not to see the past vision of lampposts branching over streets of bush, the plazas cracked by the jungle's furious seed. It is as if the Caribbean wants to leap proudly and fiercely into its fullness. You see glimpses of it everywhere you look. This desire to defy the odds, to rebuild selfhood and belonging from splinters of separation and suffering. It reaches its pinnacle on the hill, the East Port of Spain community that is the setting for Earl Lovelace's much loved Caribbean classic, The Dragon Can Dance. This is the hill, Calvary Hill, where the sun set on starvation and rise on potholed roads Thrones for stray dogs that you could play banjo on their rib bones, holding garbage piled high like a cathedral spire. This is the hill, swelling and curling like a macabre snake from observatory street to the mango fields in the back of Mova. Its guts stretched to bursting with a thousand narrow streets and alleys and lanes and traces and holes, holding the people who come on the edge of this city to make it home. In the novel, Carnival is the heart of our identity, as the main character, Aldrich, channels his emotions into dancing his dragon mass. Oh, he danced. He danced pretty. He danced to say, you are pretty. Calvary Hill, and John John, and Lavantee, and Shanty Town. Look at the colors of your costumes in the sunshine. Look at your colors. You is people, people. People is you, people. He wanted everybody to see him. When they saw him, they had to be blind not to see. They had to be deaf not to hear that people everywhere want to be people and that they're going to be that anyway, even if they have to rip open the guts of the city. guts of Port of Spain to the heart of Belmont. Right at the foothills of the Lavanty Hills, Belmont is actually one of the first suburbs of Port of Spain and it's a place where over time a black professional creative class emerged. And speaking of class and creativity, here's my friend the writer Barbara Jenkins. How lovely to see you Wendell. How are, you How are doing? things? Very Thank well, you. very very well. So you're home. Home by you. My home, your home. Home for all of we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Belmont. I know this is a source of inspiration for you. And the place, the writer's place, just up the road there. Um, tell me, how does Belmont figure, or does it figure in the story at all? Actually, I was quite surprised on rereading it recently that I hadn't described any place other than the pub itself, the, the bar. bar. Itself. Yes, just the bar and uh, the people. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I felt that the bar encapsulated a world. Right world representing Belmont. Right. It's called We Place, but right. the book is called The Writer's Place, yes. So I'd love to hear a little piece straight from the book and then we could talk a little bit more about, you know, the story behind it and... Okay, so I'll read a little bit about um, the main character, mm -hmm. Indira, right. coming back to the place where she has been kind of abandoned by her husband. Right and deciding she would claim it for herself. It is high noon when Indira reach home. The writer's place standing tall, solid. 
She looked up the full length of its height. How easy to see everything in clean black and white terms in stark daylight. No blurred edges, no gray areas. She straightens her back and stride across the forecourt to place both her hands against the worn, wide, barred double doors. She leans against the door for a while, allowing its strength to take her weight. How solid, how reliable it feels. The writer's place, she say, I talk into you. Yes, you. You belong here and I belong here too. Is the writer's place for both of us. Wow, the name is so incredible. And I know it's not just about the bar, but for me, I, my extension, Belmont is the writer's place in any regards. Absolutely. One of the things that's always struck me about Belmont is the diversity of the place, the multiplicity of communities. The diversity is in every direction. Um, we had the big houses around Belmont mm -hmm. Circular Road and then more humble accommodation a little further down. So you had a diversity in style and size of house, the little Warren lanes and so on are down in this area. But there was also a huge diversity of people. Yeah. Like, you know, there's a Belmont face, but it is not a face with a particular racial mix or ethnicity. It's just a face of belonging to yeah. a place. They're all mixed up. Yeah. yeah. This is a place with, with character and characters. Yeah. A short distance away to the north of the Queen's Park Savannah is the Botanic Gardens. I'm here to meet with Brianne McIver, new author of a book called Where There Are Monsters to discuss her short story, Robber Talk, for which the Botanic Gardens is one of the locations. So, Brianne, Where There Are Monsters, the wonderful title. And I know we're here to talk about Robber Talk, which is an even more intriguing title for me because I'm a mass man. So the idea of Robber Talk is right up my alley. But tell me about how you use the idea of Robber Talk in this story. Well, the story actually begins on a stage in Napa and this midnight mm -hmm. robber, he delivers this fantastic robber speech, brings the audience to their feet and round of applause. And afterwards, we see the characters, he goes backstage and he appears to be very different from his Midnight Robber persona. Right. Very meek and mild. Um, there's a girl who plays a pair of Gennard that he's interested in. Um, but as the story progresses, we actually realize that there's a darker facet to his personality and that a lot of what he says on the stage as his robber talk is actually things that he does to women and that he really is this very kind of dangerous character. I um, remember playing Ulmas as a child. I was a baby doll and okay. I loved, you know, dressing up, getting into character. And so to set a story in Port of Spain and to write about carnival was just the most natural thing in the it's world. It's natural. Yeah. It's in you. Absolutely. So we're here in the Botanic Gardens and I know that, that this location is specific to the story. The gardens, actually, it serves the purpose of the character because on one hand, well, he's a country boy, so he would love, you know, this ode to nature, um, nice to walk with a friend, romantic possibilities. But on the other hand, it's night, it's secluded, it's quiet, it's a perfect cover for monstrous activities. So I think like a lot of nature, the gardens is both beautiful, but also has this dangerous yeah. element. So, great. Would you mind sharing a little bit of the story with us? Sure, absolutely. So this is when they've just come climb, into the garden. The yep, and I'm going to do um, speak for both parties. Right. So you come here a lot? All the time. I go to the botanic gardens too. I sit under my favorite trees and read. You have favorite trees? Of course, they're just like people. The Saman's a cool guy. But the immortal's a bitch. Anna laughs. Did you learn about those trees in Matura? Mostly. My mother let me climb them. All except the silk cotton, of course. Why not? You town girls. You don't know when to be afraid. Silk cotton trees shelter spirits. That's why you can never cut them down. Anna giggles again. You don't believe that. I wouldn't risk it. 
I point to the gardens, gloomy and grey under the sliver of moon. There's one in there, I say. In the gardens? There isn't. Sure. You just have to know where to look. Are we taking a, a look at the fact that the city of Port of Spain has inspired and spawned so many storytellers and so many incredible stories and you're one of the more recent voices to, to be added to that list. So what is it about Port of Spain that inspires you? Or... I think that Port of Spain, there's so much history, there's so much wonder and it's so different. You know, you can be somewhere like mm -hmm. here, like the gardens, and just a short while away. You know, you can walk down a street, be in Belmont, completely different setting. And I think that, you know, when the protagonist is looking for the silk cotton tree, he says, you know, you just have to know where to look. And I think that it's the same for the city of Port of Spain. There's so, so much for writers. You just yeah. have to know where to look. You just have to know where to look. Where are we looking next? 26 Nepal Street, St. James, which was the home of V.S. Naipaul between 1947 and 1950, the year he left for Oxford University. This family residence inspired A House for Mr. Biswas, his great novel of 1961. Not everyone may realize that the book's title character was based on Sipasad Naipaul, Savidya's father. Amidst this mini city that never sleeps, with its bars and boutiques and markets and masjids, this architecturally ordinary house still fits the description given in the novel. The house could be seen from two or three streets away and was known all over St. James. It was like a huge and squat sentry box, tall, square, two-storied, with a pyramidal roof of corrugated iron. The house has been restored and is run by the NGO Friends of Mr. Biswas. Professor Kenneth Ramchand, who chairs the group, has promised to give us a peek. So, Professor, here we are, the famous house for Mr. Biswas. I feel as if I'm sitting in history at this moment. About, I've read the novel uh, and Naipaul is one of my favorite writers. Tell us a little bit about your efforts to ensure that we have access to a space like this. Um, you are indeed sitting in history. Huh? The chair on which you're sitting is part of the set that accompanied the dining table that we're sitting at. This table and those chairs who were in the house in 1946 when Sifasad Naipaul bought it. And I'm sitting in a spot that Vidya Naipaul claimed as his corner. <laughs> this is where he did his homework. This is where he ate. Nobody could go there. Yeah, about the efforts to get it, it's, it's a nice story because the house was put on the open market and I heard about it. And um, I quickly formed a group called Friends of Mr. Biswas. Right. And it was very lucky that I was in the Senate at the time. Within two weeks, they were in negotiations to get the house. Right. And so it was acquired in 1996. And Friends of Mr. Biswas, which was an informal group, then had to be established by Act of Parliament. Right. And after that, they put us in charge of the house to turn it into a Naipaul museum right. and a, a goal that we inserted to turn it into a house of literature that would encourage writers from every ethnic group in Trinidad and Tobago to achieve in the way the house helped the early Naipauls and Kapildeus to achieve. So what can the house teach us about the book? And what could the book teach us about this house that we're in? You could just look at the title. Mm -hmm. A house, A house for Mr. 
this author. Yeah. We put the emphasis on the Mr. Because this is a book about the life of a man from 1906 to 1953 and his struggles against a feeling of emptiness and non-entity. His acquiring of the house was a marker of his victory over circumstance. As you read this novel, by the time you come to the end, the house is a physical representation of an indestructible and indomitable man. The hero dies in 1953, right. and so did Sipasa Naipaul. This book is very much about the life of Sipasad Naipaul, the journalist, the would-be writer, the writer of a collection of short stories came out in 1943 mm -hmm. called Guru Deva and Other Indian Tales. This was a great novelist, Monkey. If he had had opportunity, I, I would say this on record, if he had had opportunity, he would have been a greater writer than mm -hmm. Vidya Naipaul. A House of Mr. Biswas has been consistently ranked as one of the, you know, top novels in the English language in the 20th century. Why do you think that is? A lot of people don't realize that Naipaul has very carefully constructed this novel. The first part is the country. Yeah. The second part is Port of Spain. Yeah. As soon as Mr. Biswas hops on the bus and gets to Port of Spain and feels the excitement of the city and so on, the novel announces that we're looking at drastic changes in the life of these people. Mm -hmm. So this book, for a Trinidadian person, this book is partly about the emergence of the Trinidadian person. I, I don't want to sound parochial, mm -hmm. you know, and, but it matters to me very much that this is a book of our civilization. In every society in the world, there are monolithic forces trying to deny you your selfhood, denying you your identity, denying you a place in the world, making you feel you are nobody and nowhere. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, I think it matters very much that it appeals to people all over the world. But I don't think that's why a writer writing out of his culture. That's not why he writes. The range of books we've delved into proves that Port of Spain is not a singular story. Many of Naipaul's subsequent books, Miguel Street, The Mimic Men, are testimony to this. As a cast of characters, as colorful as a city itself, parades across the pages. Writers understand the layers and nuances of the capital, its culture and contradictions. And the best vantage point from which to appreciate them is high above the city. Guyanese Trinidadian author Unia Kempudu writes about Port of Spain from the perspective of another hill, Lady Chancellor. Port of Spain spreads below Atta, sitting on a little stone wall at the edge of the lawn. The hills wrap her back, curving into the distance on either side. They cradle the suburbs and town gently down to the waterfront. The promising sky clear against it, clean and innocent. Baby blue, tinged with the white of heat to come. Vaulting higher, trailing scanty clouds way over the hills. The fluffy fronds of the grugubef palms and bamboo foothills close by give the scene a Casabon touch, she thinks. An illusion of colonial pastoral bliss. The beguiling tropics. Is maturity compromised beauty? It's a question that anyone who writes about Port of Spain asks at some point or the other. To achieve our own identity, what must we sacrifice? New generations of Caribbean writers will undoubtedly continue to explore the answers.
Sweat Fest is back. It may be a virtual festival, but it will be packed yeah. as ever with stories, talk, readings, extempo, poetry, new talent, classics, prizes, tributes, debate, storytelling, and more. 20 events, 100 participants. Friday 23rd to Sunday 25th April. Celebrating Caribbean voices and preserving the rich tapestry of our culture. Through literary arts and authorship, we are free to express our vibrance, passion, heritage, and the empowering narratives of our people. As proud title sponsor of the NGC Bocas Lit Fest, we have been honored to support one of the world's acclaimed literary festivals. We celebrate your journey and salute your accomplishments. Everyone has a dream, a vision of what we want, the things that make us happy and help us make others happy. Let First Citizens help you paint a brighter future, a new home, a new car, a new day of living stress-free. Make the things you picture a reality. First Citizens, we put you first. My mother had pride. Understand what I say when I say pride. She refused to have us riding free buses to go to school. Now you might call my mother a fool, but buses to her meant embarrassment and suffering. Because she was squanched up with about two much children in the bus station. So it was the bouquet of hungry breaths, danger of heads mixed with perspiration, fused with the atomic scent for growing resentment of foreign ownership and equitable distribution of wealth. <laughs> Nah, forget all that freedom health. That scent was just Miss Betsy's daughter taking off her shoes in the bus. And Miss Betsy's daughter had this American pair of shoes in the village of Kumana. So them shoes used to be smelling high like an American pair of soldiers on top Salvatore Center watching down at the middle class. Miss Betsy used to give her daughter the same shoes that take cow down and rain water and sweat to go to school. And those American shoes were too small and couldn't fit her. I see them American shoes too small and can't fit us. That is why my mother did not want me on a bus. My mother had pride. Understand what I say when I say pride. She refused to have us ride three streets away to use the free internet cafe. Now you might call my mother a fool, but free to her meant free food and free food meant they had to qualify as poor to get it. So she rather take a loan for a computer set. It was not new. But that computer set was ours. You had to be careful when using that computer set for hours. It was a fire hazard. So you had to put a fan on the computer so the computer went overheat. Then put a fan on that first fan because that fan wanted to overheat. But man, we only had one fan. But understand, my mother would take a stand at a time that seemed unreasonable just to create comfort. And when we give trouble, it used to be all man jack comfort. She was the fort that took sea breeze and cannonball, yet the thought of us children was always on her mind first. I remember all pride used to burst if one of these children was in danger. She had our futures protected before our womb was kicked in anger, in determination or desire. That is why. I call my mother super. Now I have pride. Pride for my mother and that pride I'm gonna keep. I remember 
place in rubber bands and my stretch up socks so my socks when fall to sleep and muckers within muck she accumulated a lifelong of debt to fill lunch kits and stomachs so today i may stomach any negativity knowing that it has been the lesson of something good her creativity now words in my veins it is flowing my blood no words were created in a vacuum these words are the buds of a loving and caring mother the nurture and care of my superwoman My two favorite things about Trinidad and Tobago are speed guns and tow trucks. You ever see Port of Spain when they see a tow truck? It's like, oh shucks, who foot does can move like if the tow stuck when they see a tow truck? Shouting in the people, them store like bandits announcing a hold up PBM T D seven T D four. PBM T D seven T D four. Anybody driving? PBM T D seven T D four. Cause what fate befall that blue B fourteen could be for all. It don't even have to be your fault or your vehicle. But as soon as you see that cable pull, you feel things you never thought you was capable of feeling. To see a stranger's two front wheel in the sky, $500 go bye-bye, and your pocket mourn the loss. I mean, it's not your car, but you understand the course, so you try to stop them. Of course, officer, he coming back for show. I know him. He's my sister, brother, dog, uncle-in-law. I like speed guns, too. Well, the ones who warn you from the other side. You could be pushing 120 in your little 120 wire, avert your eyes, and it's plenty lights like flickering. Unlawful fireflies, fire bun Babylon. If you wanna share ticket, you need to try harder, farer, it's fast, we fast. Who could drive past our brethren on a bypass and not beep, beep, beat the system that does beat we secrets we keep for each other deplorable. Applaudable. Squat on government land because real estate not affordable. When I was younger, the current from our house came from a wall socket in our neighbor's home. And anything we had in our fridge was our neighbor's own. <laughs> Breaking law to break bread. People who look like we does never get a break, so believe we, we just bend. Contortion portions stretch food, stretch truth, stretch through and grab whatever we need to climb. Because when a system insists in you sit down, the most radical thing you could do is rise. This is an apology to the guy that spoke love like scripture, that made me find sanctuary in the cracks of his smile and gave me an arm to rest my head and my troubles and even if that arm fell asleep he never did he made me a believer in all things divine like his voice and his obsession with the apex predator and his random spurts of information and midnight conversations about weird family nicknames and past pets all of which i would forget and he would remind me again and again and i would listen with the eagerness of a child on a grandfather's lap you were the first person I wanted to call home, to find shelter with. You were the first person to hold me accountable, the first to unlock my doors. And at first you showed no emotions. And I thought that meant you felt nothing. It turns out it meant you felt everything. Every sharp cut answer, every shrug, every pull away, every I love you left hanging. And I wish, I wish you would have told me that I wasn't loving you the right way because nothing can grow in a toxic home environment this poem is for the only guy to ever put me in my place taught me to hold my tongue think before i speak this poem is for the guy that was patient and slow to anger with me he looked for lessons in every mistake taught me to take time to teach instead of belittle this is a letter to the first guy to leave me vulnerable an incomplete home open broken yet whole to leave me wanting in need of renovation yet content and we often forget the importance of a first but it's the foundation what we begin with it's where our ideas flourish this poem is for the guy that taught me that love isn't always enough there's more to it than that and love wouldn't always get you all the way you have to work and try and cry and pray and choose to stay and choose to be solid See, I've never been a ride or die kind of girl, but you, 
were the first guy to make me want to say, till death do us part. And they say home is where the heart is. So I've been homeless for about a year or so now. And I've since moved on from what I thought home was and started rebuilding my walls. So this apology is just me laying the bricks. Family is folklore. Unlikely characters creating culture, bridging gaps, setting the foundation for future generations. Family is different personalities, like Jab Jab and Papa Boa, Sukuya and Laja Bless, Mama Glow and Duen, yet still they stand as the parents of our tradition. And they may not always mesh. Because if baby doll don't like Dame Lorraine, that don't mean that the joy of the bacchanal and the adrenaline of the lacquer race, top pump, last laps and mass through our veins, parades on stage and pulsate the very bane of our existence. And family is messy. Like Port of Spain after Carnival Monday. And family is conflict. Like a fight that break out during Juve. But that is how it is. Because family will fight all those who oppose and clean up the mess for the sake of love. Love for future generations looking to us. Unlikely characters, bridging gaps, setting the foundation. Everybody have a body, but not everybody body does body the same way your body does body. For instance, somebody body missing our air and some body body missing some hair. But that don't mean that their body is any less body than your body, yeah? Every body body different. You don't get to pick and choose the body that you're born into. If you could, I bet men would have picked a body that form fit. Somebody body born with an automatic four fit. Somebody born full length and somebody body born four fifth. But if that's where you had to work with, that's where you had to work with. Bodies just kind of weird like that sometimes. Somebody body can take care of its body, so it gives the body to a relative. Which, of course, in theory, is relative to the fact that families kind of the same. Everybody family different. Somebody family have the means to raise the child with a silver spoon and tooth. And somebody family don't even have the means to raise the youth. But I don't mean that we get to shun a family for not being what we want a family to be. For some, family might mean no one gets left behind. And for others, family might mean, look, we get born a step behind. You don't get to pick and choose the family that you're born into. If you could, I bet that somebody would have picked health and wealth. But if your family do family the way you like, when you get the opportunity, Make sure that your family, family right. Treat your family finally like your body. Give it health and wealth. Okay, maybe you didn't get to choose the family that you're born into yourself. But when you pick your family, make sure that you pick a family that suits yourself.
Palmer Adisa and I am the poetry judge, one of the poetry judges for Bocas and I was really excited to read all of those amazing books. But now I'm reading something very different. Uh, it's by a former student of mine whose name is Glodine Champion and she was, I was her supervisor when she was in the MFA program at um, California College of the Arts where I taught. And she has just finished a novel, which she actually had uh, submitted four chapters for her MFA thesis. And it's called Salmon Croquettes. And it's an exciting and important book. It deals with Zayla, a 12-year-old African-American who is a gender non-conforming young adult and the challenges she faced trying to navigate her parents, particularly her mother, who has very traditional expectations of what a girl ought to be. And Zayla is very clear that she likes girls. She's, she identifies uh, and shows up as a tomboy, uh, but she's very clear. It's a well-written, important book set in LA during the 1965. And um, I've just been really delighted that my student sent it to me and that she completed it. And I think it will really add to the body of work about non-conforming um, teens and adults, but just giving us that perspective, which I think is so important. So I invite you to check it out. It's going to be released this year, Salmon Croquettes by Glodine Champion. Yay. <music> Hi, Bocas. So lately, I have been rereading um, all the books of poems and, and books of poems collections I would have read um, over a decade ago. And at the moment, I'm reading Kamal Rafford's Born to Slow Horses again. And uh, it really reminds me of why I started writing in the first place. It's one of the first volumes of poetry that I really fell in love with and that made me kind of think of the, the possibilities of writing that, that made me sort of expand my views about what is possible and what a poetry collection could do and to see poetry in a completely different way to see it laid out on the page in a whole different way to read it in a whole different way and to experience um, writing about islands, about spaces, about landscape, about these places we call home in with fresh eyes in a whole new way. And so I'm reading it again after almost a decade has passed and, and my own views have changed so much and I've grown so much as a writer. And it's, a, a, it's definitely a, a book I will keep coming back to over and over again. Hi, I'm Gaitra Bahadur. I was a nonfiction judge for the Literature Prize this year. In terms of new Caribbean writing that is making me really excited, uh, I loved Stephen Narine's short story, What in Me is Dark Illumin. It won the, the Bristol Short Story Prize this year, and uh, it's set in Guyana in the 1970s. Um, it's a really funny story and really smart as well. Um, I recognized it. I recognized the people, their ways of being and speaking, uh, the hard time they give each other. Uh, but I'm also really excited because it is historical fiction, it's political fiction that is um, very evocative and true, right? Uh, so it, it, it gives us fictional versions of Walter Rodney and uh, 
the, the important revolutionary figures in Guyana in the 1970s. This is really rich territory and it's also undertold. Uh, so it's exciting to me to see fiction that is mirroring the undercurrents of our history in such authentic ways um, and really um, careful about details, uh, but as invested in story as it should be. Um, so I'm just really looking forward to seeing uh, what else Stephen produces. I think that it might be part of a larger work. Uh, so yeah, thanks. <music> Hi, Bocas. Hi, Caribbean, Sistrin, and Brethren. I'm Tiffany Anik. I'm reading two books now. The first is Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Animals by Alexis Pauline Gums. A beautiful meditation on how we can undrown ourselves by looking at our fellow marine mammals and paying attention to our natural environment. And the other book is How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House by Cherie Jones. A beautiful book about girls learning to be independent and strong and developing into feminist womanist women. It's already won um, the Good Morning America book club citation. I'm really excited about both of them. Hello, my name is Vanny Capildeo and I'm delighted to share with you what I'm reading now, which is Hemorrhage by Aaron Kent. This legitimate snack which is the name of Aaron's imprint for small pamphlets from Broken Sleep Books, which he runs. This legitimate snack is about his suffering a cerebral hemorrhage and miraculously recovering from it. I love this book because, one, it is legitimate snack. It is very beautiful to hold in the hand and it's exemplary of the kind of book art that we can make and the kind of book art that Caribbean poets also are making and uh, that we can disseminate, share among ourselves, uh, poetry as friendship and our homes as our archives. I do believe this is the future face of publishing. And uh, I also love this book because of the way the poems slip between states of awareness and semi-awareness, and yet the constant is tenderness and love. Here's this, an example from A God Counting Jinxes. If we're really slipping in and out of our glasses, then I suppose we should cross our arms and hope to space between us. Hope to space between us. Let's hope, and in hope, here's to the spaces between us and many, many crossings. Enjoy Bookcast 2021. <music>
No? Stud, no! <coughs> Hello, and welcome to the Bocus Lit Zest. I am your host, Bookie Monster, the Book Zessa. And today, we interpret a touching coming of age novel set in the Caribbean, Crack Crack Monkey. The story is realistic, the characters are audacious, and the themes are universal. It is an enduring classic. And now, an excerpt from Crick Crack Monkey with puppets. Uh, are we rolling? Ready? How's my hair? All right. Uh, this is Lionel Wildmane of WATT. What? FM. And we're here at the General Hospital with, uh, uh, we believe his name is Milford the Monkey, uh, where it is believed he has broken his back and apparently other bones on a piece of pomerac, one of our local fruit. Uh, well, uh, l let's hear directly from this gentleman about uh, what the events are. We go right to him. Mr. Milford, Mr. Milford? This this live TV uh, on TV. Okay, now uh, you're saying that you can't recall this, but it is obvious that you have sustained some injuries, uh, apparently to uh, your leg here and to your arm. How is it that you cannot recall this? Has it indeed affected your memory? I I, I, I don't I don't recognize what you're talking about. You know nothing happened. What happened? Please don't deny it. It's clear that there's been an accident here. And uh, it seems from the doctor's reports that it was, in fact, fruit-related. I, 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 I don't even know. Yeah, look, look, look. Have you always been addicted to Pomerac? I, I don't even like Pomerac. I don't even eat Pomerac. Everybody know I don't eat Pomerac. Mr. Milford, there's no need to be ashamed. I have had a Pomerac problem myself, as have many of us. Tell us. Tell us what happened. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I deny everything. Everybody knows he's a fake man. He's a fake man. All you go from here. Claim not to like Pomerac and yet it's obvious. It's obvious that there has been some giving over of yourself to the fruit. And now you're suffering and in pain. I, I don't remember if it affected my memory. Well, well viewers, there we have it. Although Mr. Milford is denying it, the, uh, the extent of the pain that he appears to be in appears to have affected his memory, his personality, and apparently also his sense of humor, funny bone, and his uh, ability to tell us the truth. This is Lionel Wildman reporting again from the General Hospital with Mr. Milford, who is not only lying here, but apparently is lying. W. W. A T T F M. What? Back to you in the studio. What a performance, my fellow book sessors. That was an excerpt from Crick Crack Monkey. You know, between you and me, I did never think Monkey would have stooped so low as to break his back for a piece of pomerac or even a old hamza. I just say it. But join us again for another episode of the Bocas Litzes. Until then, I am your host, Bookie Monster, reminding you, more reading, less stressing, is books have we zessed, is ideas we wetting, and knowledge we get. Bookie out! Thank you.
first Lit Fest event of 2021. I'm Alison Donnell and I'll be chairing this afternoon's event that asks what do we mean by the Caribbean in Caribbean literature? That may seem a strange question, even a trick question, and it's a term obviously that many of us who read and write and teach and publish and study may use all the time, but it's also a serious question and one for us to reflect on, I think, rightly. Does the term Caribbean literature remain useful as many of our writers are increasingly transnational in their identities? They're living, winning prizes and accruing significant readerships outside the region. Also, how does that regional identity sit alongside other identities? And I'm thinking here not just of national ones, but also how writers may want to be known and read as crime writers or speculative fiction writers or poets or nature writers. So today's panel really is thinking about how do we define that term? How do we hold on to the Caribbean in relation to literature? And how is that changing at the moment? And I'm going to give a brief introduction to my fabulous panel. Their bios are on the website, so please do look at more detail into their uh, talents. Um, so we'll start with Tanya Batson Savage, who is a writer, filmmaker, publisher. Um, and many of you will know Tanya's online magazine, Susumba, which has a fabulous literary offshoot called Susumba's Book Bag, as well as her award-winning independent publishing house, Blue Banyan Books. Hi, Tanya. Uh, Varney Capitano is writer in residence at the University of York. I'm confident that Varney will be known to BOCAS audiences. She has published seven tremendous books and eight equally tremendous pamphlets. Uh, with an eighth book, Like a Tree Walking, forthcoming from Carcanet in November uh, 2021. So, hi, Vani. Ronald Cummings teaches uh, in the English Department at Brock University in Canada. He's published widely on Caribbean writings and is involved in a number of editing projects. Most relevant probably for today's discussion, he is the editor of Make the World New, the poetry of Lillian Allen, and he co-edited uh, with me um, Caribbean Literature in Transition, 1970 to 2020. Um, so I guess I should also introduce myself. I'm Professor of Modern Literatures in English at the University of East Anglia in the UK. And I'm kind of interested and implicated as a scholar and a researcher in this question of what is Caribbean literature. Um, not just because um, I'm general editor of this project and I'll show you the, these beautiful books with all with covers from contemporary Caribbean artists. Um, so it's a three volume project that tries to map what Caribbean literature might be from 1800 to 2020. And this is the first volume which is co-edited by um, Tim Watson and Evelyn O'Callaghan. Um, and um, covers the period from 1800 to 2020. This is the second volume, which is co-edited by Ralph uh, DeLeo and Cadella Forbes that covers the period 1920 to 1970. And um, this is the third volume um, uh, that covers the period uh, that Ronald and I have edited that covers the period from 1970 to the present day. Um, I guess it's a very large project. I re realized um, sort of, quite astonishingly that I did my first editing project called The Routledge Reader in Caribbean Literature 25 years ago now. And if somebody asked me to do that again now, I just don't think I could, I'd be paralyzed by the decision-making. Um, the more I've learned, the more I realize that those decisions are really difficult. At the time, it was my teaching portfolio um, and copyright laws changed and it became a pragmatic thing to publish it when we might talk about practical decisions as well. Um, working with um, Sarah Lawson Welsh, who I also, um, we've both done a PhD at the Centre for Caribbean Studies at Warwick University. But I guess there are many things that are not to be celebrated about doing a really large editing project. But the thing that is to be celebrated is the fact that it's very obvious that the possible, you know, what might be possibly considered under Caribbean literature will always exceed any decision that you make. So any version of that will obviously be flawed and incomplete. 
Um, and when you have space to welcome lots of perspectives and voices, then I think at least the sense of the open weave of that and the, a kind of conversation about, you know, how do we decide um, what, what fits in that category and how that category transitions over time uh, is possible. So um, I'm going to ask everybody in a minute what that term Caribbean means for them kind of personally and professionally, but I was going to um, start with a little bit of an insight into this uh, book that Ronald and I have edited, which Ronald very suggestively and helpfully um, titled Caribbean Assemblages for us in trying to think about in the contemporary moment, how do we, how do we think about um, bringing together um, works under that rubric of the Caribbean. So Ronald, can I ask you to speak about that for a bit? Um, I mean, there, there are several ways that one could begin a conversation about um, the concept of Caribbean assemblages, uh, but I thought it was useful um, precisely because of some of the contestations uh, around um, the concept of the Caribbean, uh, where is the Caribbean, um, who, who counts as a Caribbean writer, um, and the ways in which those uh, conversations are ongoing. Uh, but also, um, one of the things that we talk about in the, in the introduction is the way in which, uh, over time, um, the sort of spread of writing itself and the sort of issues um, that are taken up um, have multiplied. Um, and by this, I mean that um, if we think about some of the early um, critical research um, on the field, it was thinking around questions of national identity um, in the wake of political independence. Um, and more and more we've seen uh, the attempt to complicate um, that sort of singular notion of identity as a way of structuring belonging, as a way of structuring how we identify, as a, uh, as a way of structuring how we relate to others around us and to think through um, some of the intersectionalities, the different kinds of relationalities um, that shape um, the world, Caribbean worlds in which we live. Um, so I thought it was a sort of useful gesture to that, to think about the complicatedness of the Caribbean, the ways in which the Caribbean has always been multiple, um, but the ways in which any attempt to write the Caribbean today um, has to be um, the meaning, the effect, the force of those uh, multiplicities and complexities. Yes, thanks for that. I think, I mean, there's a lot more we can say, and hopefully we will have a chance to say, but I think, um, Vani, obviously as a scholar, uh, I address and label people as Caribbean writers, but I'm interested to know from the writer's perspective, what, what, how that feels and what the meaning of that term is for you. I'm very aware that in 2012, you wrote a poem on not writing as a West Indian woman. So it seems a particularly interesting question to ask of you. Hi, Alison, thank you for that fascinating question. And I'm going to say that my perspective has changed over the years and I have become a Caribbean fundamentalist in two senses. One, that I feel it is important to have been born in the region. I find very, very great differences between myself and writers who have been born in the Caribbean diaspora. And I'm not saying that they are... had a sense of being in a majority culture. And as I was born in the 1970s, a revolutionary and independence-minded majority culture that had really shaped my imagination forever in ways I didn't always appreciate. The second way that I became a Caribbean fundamentalist was that I truly believe, and I cannot really prove, except in my creative writing and in playing mass very badly, that there's something unique happening in the Caribbean, that there's a unique crucible of history and creativity, which makes nonsense of terms like identity. And there's a great reckoning with which the origin countries are failing to deal and, and which needs to be made. So that poem on not writing as a West Indian woman, for me, the important thing was uh, the epigraph I put, uh, which I, I don't have to hand, I've given away all my copies of that book, but it was to do with uh, for those who jumped ship because the herding of people had become intolerable. And I often think of the people who have been lost in the in-between, lost in arriving, 
to some sense of the Caribbean. So that really is my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Vani. That's that. I mean, it's it's interesting for me to hear that sense of your your sense of kind of a, belonging to a community in time and place as well, and that kind of his historical kind of moment uh, that you of your development, um, I guess, social development and political development that's informed you as a writer, um, but also that I mean. For me as a scholar, that sense of kind of wanting to notice what's what's still not within Caribbean literature is really significant. So that sense of a term that might actually overwrite voices rather than include them is really important to me as well. And I think one of the things that's about, you know, why the term is still useful is because it still asks us to, to work at it, to know what, what, what more is to be known about that tradition of writing. Um, and, you know, for example, we often think about the mid century as, as this period of, of male writers. And yet I think, you know, research is showing there were so many important women writers in that period. So it's sort, sort of like to know more about our literature, the Caribbean literature, there's that need to kind of go back and revisit and to think about that you know some of those projects that you're talking about that that made the Caribbean. Um, maybe we don't know all of the vo literary voices that were in within that project as well. Yeah, well, very briefly, you see, I would like to contextualize that uh, in that growing up in Trinidad uh, with uh, books by those writers on my parents' bookshelf. Uh, I never really saw those books as definitive and I didn't see the literary culture as male dominated because my parents knew some of those people or knew their families and uh, I had a sense these were the people who had managed to go and get something published and that they were the tip of an iceberg and I had not really articulated it to myself because I was not and still am not a post-colonial theorist of any caliber but uh, I was aware that these literary productions with ISBN numbers were one very flawed and reactive expression in some cases of a culture where the telling, the making were happening on the ground in the Caribbean and as much by people who would self-identify as women or who inhabited a variety of genders. So, so, I mean, in a way, I don't really see those 40s and 50s books as definitive. I can understand it intellectually. That, that is how they have worked in the history of, of canon formation. But creatively, I see them as these little things that people have been managing to do when the great things are happening otherwise. I mean, that's, 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 it's, I think that's a, a great history or great story for people to realize because often if people are, say, taking a course in Caribbean literature, the idea that actually, you know, the, these books that have been canonized are somehow not the representative, you know, that, that literary culture was much more uh, promiscuous, was very, very different, and that you know, newspapers, I mean, even dating way, way back into the 19th century had so many voices that we've, we've lost, um, that the rep representative has become more narrow. Um, Tanya, can I ask you on a related question then, since Vani has really alerted us to how much what we, what we often receive as Caribbean literature is, is just something that's been validated through different channels to other writings. Um, as a publisher, um, what it means to you to be a publisher of Caribbean literature? Well, um, thank you very much, um, Alison. And, and honestly, as I was listening to Vani, I was like, could we not ask me anything? Can I just listen to Vani talk about this thing? I would really rather just do that because her points is really interesting and, and, and valid. And I was also thinking about the fact that um, in, in the last five years, you know, starting in 2019, because 2020 took four, And um, on, on Twitter, and I think it migrated to Instagram, that the Caribbean is not a real place. And I love that statement because it says so much, especially in what is not being said, because it, it, the conversation was always about the ways in which 
things in the Caribbean and Trinidadians would say Trinidad is not a real place and Jamaicans would say Jamaica is not a real place. Um, and it was the ways in which our lived realities often defied the rules that were set in other places and those made us unreal. And when you marry that with stories and myth making and, um, and, and complicate that further with lived realities and publishing, which is its own strange beast, um, it, it's, it, it brings me back to the fact that I think the, the important thing is not what you call yourself, but what that thing means. And, and it's particularly what I loved what Rani said about being a Caribbean fundamentalist, um, which is a term I am going to borrow for sure. Uh, and, and I think it is, it, 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 it is critical to have an understanding of when we say the word, who is saying it and what do they mean? Um, the, 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 the sign versus the symbol, you know, um, because when a when a person born in the diaspora identifies as Caribbean, they mean a different thing um, from when a person born in the Caribbean says they're Caribbean, and when a person born in in Jamaica in Kingston says it, it's a different thing from a Jamaican somewhere else. So I think the multiplicity of possibilities is a key part of that identity. Uh, to come back to the practical terms of publishing, um, I found myself wondering recently, um, as, as 2020 took a huge bite out of my business, um, what am I doing as a, a working class Black woman in publishing? Because publishing is a beast that was not created for people like me, just the, the, the mechanics of it. Worse yet, situated on an island, um, a, separated from, from much of the rest of my nearest possible market, which is the Eastern Caribbean, um, all of those have implications for what we can do. It doesn't have implications for how I identify myself. It doesn't have implications for how I identify my writers, but it does has implica have implications for how those works once produced can make their way into the world and the obstacles, barriers, et cetera, that they, they brush up against or just sometimes flat out crash into, you know, and all of those becomes a part of, of why we often think the Caribbean is not a real place and that definition is a huge part of its reality. Thanks, Tanya. I mean, I think that that kind of way in which kind of the, the I guess, the conceptualization of the Caribbean and then the kind of lived realities of it come together is something that's like all the time so important to attend to because I have to say, as somebody based in the UK, there is a kind of way in which Caribbeanness can be celebrated as a kind of contemporary global condition, you know, and, 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 it sort of strikes me as a very um, a, as a very dangerous way of conceptualizing because it forgets about that about the ongoing precarity and the kind of, as you say the obstacles within the region. I'm just it would be really interesting to hear you talk more as a publisher about those practicalities about you know working with writers in the region about getting books. Uh, it, across the region about cultivating readerships within the region because I guess as, as somebody who's looked a lot at literary history and thought about how much energy had to go into the creation of this thing Caribbean literature West Indian literature and how you know how the networks the cultural networks and the physical networks across places were built up and yet still travel routes and um, you know, map, map the routes of empire. Um, and so I'm just interested to, to know, you know the, it, like how much you can realize your conceptualization of being a Caribbean publisher. It is, it, it is, Alison. Um, it's, it is, let's use the term interesting because it captures so much that is good and so much that is bad. I recently, um, sold the um, most of the world's English speaking rights to a book we had published. Um, and those rights included Caribbean rights. So as a 
I'm here sitting talking to you from Jamaica. This is where I publish from. And I sold most, I've now sold the English language rights to most countries but Jamaica. Why did I do that? Because the practical reality of selling books to Trinidad, and this is a book that I think is really good, and I really wanted it to get to Trinidadian hands, it was proving too much. And I was selling it to a mainstream publisher in the UK. And for a reason that the first time it happened boggled my mind, I realized that booksellers in the region, and it is for reasons far older than I am, um, find it easier to buy books from the UK than for another, from another country in the region. I've approached um, uh, uh, Bayesian booksellers who say, oh, are you, are you sending books from, from Jamaica? Yes, oh, sorry, we can't buy from you then. We don't import from Jamaica. And I, I still have not got a reasonable response for that. You know, I mean, and, and that, that is a reality of bringing books into the world, the distribution. The truth of the matter is um, digital distribution can help to offset that to some degree, but then you come back to the physical reality of the world we live in. And it's that most people here still use physical books, even as much as there are different programs trying to encourage that even as much, even myself as a reader, embrace both physical and digital books and many readers do. There is the, the practical um, issue of, of getting books across borders. There is um, the, the practical issue of, of um, an absence of distribution in the region, which makes selling here near impossible. And, and, and so I had to, for the good of the book then, for the good of getting it, I had to send the book elsewhere in order for it to come back to the Caribbean and um, yeah, <laughs> that, is, that is a part of, of what we're talking about in terms of conception versus reality. And, and it's, I mean, in terms of thinking about that mapping, it's a very, very similar mapping that to the one that Lamming talks about in The Pleasures of Exile, of this kind of moving through what was the center, you know, of, 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 of empire to, to, for Caribbean voices to articulate themselves. Ronald, if I'm I just- Alison, if, yeah. if I could put a point, because I, I, I think I've spoken of the dark side of this, but I think one of the things, and it's been brought home particularly by the, by the COVID world, is that while that's a practical reality of publishing, the literary community is benefiting significantly from the digital um, conversations that happen, that's happening. And we're finding, they are finding ways around it and they're understanding that place in terms of where um, a publishing house is based and therefore the interest in the people and the work and authenticity is important and that that can influence their purchasing decisions and I'm seeing different players on the internet deciding you know what there's a version of this book that is produced by this player but I would rather buy it from an independent at home and people are making those decisions which I think in the long run will impact that that trajectory that's that's really fascinating i want to come on a little bit later in our conversation to talk about uh the about the digital space and and decision making and and literary value and so that, that's great to have that as a, a seed to pick up on ronald i was wondering for you based in canada and i know having um a lot of expertise in caribbean canadian writing how that sense of the Caribbean space works there, because there are often issues, certainly I know, I, I'm always belated in my reading of, of um, Caribbean Canadian writers, because it takes a while for their books to travel uh, to us, and whether there are almost, in the sense of multiple Caribbean literatures, whether these connecting spheres kind of, we think of them as simultaneous, but whether they're also kind of evolving chrono chronologically across uh, different places. Um, I feel like the, the present has also been a moment to rethink some of those historiographical narratives um, that we've inherited about the emergence of uh, Caribbean literature. And certainly part of that for me, um, when I moved to this space um, in Canada um, and started to do work from here was also realizing the, the long and deep 
roots of Caribbean literature um, in this place. Um, and oftentimes, I mean, we, we can think about the ways in which the Windrush narrative has held a kind of hegemony, uh, both in terms of how we narrate uh, Caribbean migration, but also Caribbean literature formation. Um, and I think some of that needs to be rethought. Um, you know, and there's been lots of interesting work uh, around this. I'm thinking about books like Beyond Windrush um, by Leah Rosenberg and uh, J. Dylan Brown, um, which, which challenged us, you know, quite a while ago to, you know, about the need to rethink those narratives. Um, and certainly Canada has been one of those spaces where there has been a lot going on, um, but has all, all but has in some instances slipped from view because of a particular kind of emphasis on the London metropole as a particular space for uh, Caribbean liter literary making. Um, so we might think about the ways in which, for instance, um, you know, John, John Hearn, you know, was born uh, here um, in Canada. We can think about the ways in which several uh, Caribbean literary scholars um, like Edward Ball, um, like uh, Victor Chang, like Carolyn Cooper studied in Canada. Um, and the ways in which um, there have also been publishing roots here. Uh, so we might think about a press like Sister Vision Press um, in the 1990s, which made a sort of radical uh, contribution to um, to Caribbean uh, writing, to Black diaspora writing, to queer writing. Um, and was important uh, to uh, literary formations in, in the 1990s. And we can also think about the, the current moment where we have major Caribbean writers like Dion Brand, um, you know, who are writing here, but also just like a wide expanse of writing. Think about um, uh, writers like H. Nigel Thomas um, and, and a number of other writers. And I'm, I'm also mentioning some of these names because um, even within the Canadian narrative of the connections with the Caribbean, uh, other kinds of narrative hegemonies emerge. So the ways in which Toronto becomes figured as a particular center where, you know, you also had writers who were writing in Ottawa um, and about Ottawa. Um, you also had writers who were writing um, in and about the prairies, you know. Um, when Lillian Allen, the, the, the Tor well, now Toronto-based um, dub poet uh, came to Canada, it wasn't to Toronto initially, right? It was to elsewhere. Um, so so I, 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 think, I think some of the, the work that we do in Caribbean literary historiography has to grapple with that tension of uh, how do we narrate the Caribbean? Uh, how do we narrate the Caribbean, even in its diasporic formations, and to think about those multiplicities and to think about those um, multiple directionalities. Because also, we also forget the ways in which people move between places. Um, I've been doing work on the writer Vic Reed, and his is an uh, interesting narrative story. I mean, I grew up hearing about Vic Reed as the writer from that generation that stayed in Jamaica. Um, and the story is much more complex. He went to England, he went, you know, um, and he was like, this is not the place for me uh, and went back to Jamaica, but then also won um, fellowships to uh, work here in Canada. And it's been fascinating um, to look in the archives and to trace his movements through the city in which I'm now living, you know, to see the change on the addresses um, in the letters in, in the archives um, as a way of thinking through um, that complexity of place in the Caribbean, um, you know, so, so, so I, I think there are other narratives in the archives and I think there are other narratives uh, within the, his, the, the broad historiographical narrative, um, which will um, allow us to rethink some of these complexities. And, and I guess that sort of shows in a way we could, I mean, there is a whole project of mapping the complexity of Caribbean Canadian writing, you know, from Austin Clark to David Chariandi or Dion Brand to Canisia Lubrin, you know, but also thinking laterally across how those writers signify and connect to writers in other places. So Austin Clark's, you know, great correspondence, which I know Michael Buckner's, you know, written a lot about and how important his radio work in Canada was, where we often just celebrate the kind of BBC Caribbean voices program. So I guess it's also trying in a way to imagine um, the paths, the sort of lateral paths, as well as the kind of complexities within those spaces that became uh, sites of Caribbean imagination. 
and Caribbean literature. And, and perhaps also to say, Alison, and, and maybe this circles back to Tanya's point, um, to some of what Tanya has said about publishing, is that several writers also left to follow their books, you know, that their books were published elsewhere and that necessitated that they go, um, you know, well, not necessarily necessitated, but that opened up, opened up spaces for them to go elsewhere. Um, so, that, so that tension between um, where Caribbean literature um, is made also um, sort of function, uh, sorry, also um, influences the, the, the shapes of the Caribbean literary communities that emerge at different historical moments. Yeah, and I mean, in a way, a, a kind of a kind of counter story to that would be, I guess, my findings recently that a lot of um, women writing within the region in the mid century were publishing with educational publishers, and and actually, it's been the kind of dereliction of academics and scholars to take those as serious publishing venues to think that you know why. Why, you know, that these, um, some of the books that became textbooks for schools actually were really valuable uh, publication venues for writers, but somehow, you know, the way we've mapped the literature part of Caribbean literature has led us away from looking at those as really important resources. Vani, um, I was just wondering in the sense of your, um, a sort of understanding of that term of, of, of Caribbean literature, not just personally for you as a writer, but also what your sense is, because now I guess we have the idea of, of the Caribbean writer um, sort of more cemented, I guess we can look back at least of a century of kind of what we have conceptualized as Caribbean writing. Do you think now that allows for more kind of a, more kind of freedom in terms of what Caribbean writers write and where they write about, a kind of a sense of a sensibility that may not need to be narrowly registered to, to place. I, I still would want to ask the question of uh, writing for whom, in a sense. And I've uh, had the good fortune to be able to sit in the Bodleian Library in Oxford and call up a lot of books that are out of print. And there are many, many names in anthologies of Caribbean writing, which are still not everyday names, even among the literary community in my experience. So I, I think there is still a lot of work of recovery to be done in circulation. The other thing I would say is that when I worked as a lexicographer for a while, one of my projects was to run through the very technical algorithm-based searches on the Oxford English Dictionary software, the regional label Caribbean, and I literally pulled up every single entry in which uh, an item of speech was labeled as Caribbean, and I re-researched them all. And what I would like to say about that is that it was descriptive, it was an evidence-based search, I didn't go in deciding, well, I'm going to look for X, Y, and Z terms or X, Y, and Z authors that I think are somehow Caribbean. I wanted to see what has had this floating label attached to it. And then what? how do I go out from there? You know, what, how do I circle out from there? And so I almost feel that nowadays with writing, looking at writers who identify themselves with the Caribbean in some way, it's important to take that seriously and then deduce from their practice. I know I was quite harsh about the diasporic contribution earlier, but I'd like to say two things about it. One, that I got very, very interested while I was doing that work for the OED in what I started calling to myself pan-Caribbean English, because in writers from the diaspora I would see them using an emerging sort of Caribbean literary standard where I could see there were certain phrases or words or turns of thought or folklore references that were taken from multiple islands of origin or multiple territories of origin. I think that's an interesting phenomenon in itself. The second thing is if, if we look towards the Caribbean diaspora, do we also open up the can of worms 
which is the other diaspora of origins, because writers in India have been treating me as an Indian diaspora writer, and I've been having to reckon with that. So do we all have to go back and do that as well? I think that could potentially be interesting. Thank you. Thanks for that. And I guess, I mean, it's also, if we think about kind of space uh, telescoping out in that sense of needing to think about the possibilities for that call, how could it call on, on the writer and on descriptions of the writer? What also strikes me at the moment is some of the stories we've told about Caribbean literature have been very generational. And now that feels much more mixed up. I mean, at the moment, I, you know, there's amazing kind of um, flourishing of, of women novelists. And we've got kind of lots of new novelists, um, you know, Maisie Card and Celeste Mohammed, and, and then kind of the generation of Alicia McKenzie and Cardella Forbes, and then new books coming out by Merle Hodge and Julia Alvarez. And I just think sort of, in a sense as well, that's kind of a real opportunity to, to rethink the story that we're going to tell, because I think we have kind of felt that there's been a sort of cascading perspective. And Vani, I'm absolutely with you that that was only what we were encouraged to read and see, not ever how it was. Um, but I wonder how it will change things now that that generational story, which seems to me to have been so kind of formative, um, will need to be kind of rethought. I don't know if anybody wants to respond to that. <laughs> I only have one very small thing to say, and then I, I think Ronald and Tanya have more expertise than I do in this area. And one is that the older I get, the more I distrust the idea of generations. Something I've found is that sometimes younger writers model themselves on the ancestors. They will name no names, but I have found relatively recent novelists modeling themselves on books that I could name from the 50s and 60s. And uh, the other thing I've found is as, as our older generation of writers uh, continue to write, uh, they are not just producing photocopies of their earlier work, they themselves are innovating. And we are in a time of incredible change, and in the Caribbean particularly acute change, both politically and ecologically. So I think some of these older writers might actually be the vanguard again. Yes, absolutely. I've, I've spotted some of that myself too, which is really fascinating. Ronald, I'm just interested in your perspective. Um, I mean, the, the idea of generations has always been kind of suspect, right? Um, one might think about, you know, somebody like Jean Rhys, uh, you know, who, who appears early, but then disappears and reappears, right? Um, and, and, you know, and, and maybe in some ways, this idea of generation has been linked to um, a particular kind of critical need to classify, to neatly arrange um, a, a really sort of vast um, and, and unsettled um, literary heritage. Um, and I think that has been that has been part of what we grapple with, right, with this question of, of, of generations. Um, and that's not to that that's not to discount the question of influence um, and the ways in which we can mark uh, particular kinds of um, I'm hesitant to use the word developments, but particular transitions, to use the language of, 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 of the, the book that we just um, did, we can mark particular transitions, right? Um, but we may not, we cannot only think of those in terms of a sort of teleological uh, trajectory. Um, but that they're 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 not linear, but they're complex, right? And and folding on each other in in fascinating ways. Um, maybe the last thing I'll say about that is, um, and and perhaps this links to um, to to something you said in uh, your final essay in uh, Volume Three of uh, Caribbean Literatures in Transition, Alison, um, where you're thinking about the work of anthologies, and you raise the question of whether they describe or prescribe. Um, and maybe some of that question of uh, the complex generationality um, and intergenerationality, and I'm using intergenerationality here, not necessarily to suggest, you know, one generation and then the next, but the ways in which writers are talking to each other um, across time, uh, mm -hmm. but also talking to each other in real time. 
point um, and the ways in which those dialogues um, are, are, are just rich and we can't necessarily prescribe those. Uh, we can attend to them with a kind of um, sensibility of reading, uh, but we can't necessarily prescribe those. I don't know if that answers the question, but but you know, I I, I think that question of of generationality is such a rich one uh, to explore and to think about. And and I, and it seems to me as well that in a way it it is a it was a tool of organization, you know, to be able to say here we have this sort of what what a mistakenly kind of small number of writers writing in these places at this time, and I think that the model in a sense, perhaps of Caribbean literature has been one of expansion, or we think, you know, expanded over place, over time to include women and include, um, you know, uh, writing that's, um, that's more expansive and challenging in terms of gendered identity or sexual identity. But actually, when we go back, all of that was happening all the time from the beginning. It just wasn't so noticed. I mean, now Andrew Selke's Escape to an Autumn Pavement is recognized as a narrative of that period. And it tells such a different story of London to, to the Lonely Londoners, which became kind of almost, um, so towering in its reputation that nothing else could could speak its truth. So I, I think, you know, it is interesting how um, that, I guess, to make something visible, you had to make something else almost invisible. And now hopefully there's a chance that that's no longer, you know, we can go back and make more and more visible and to complicate that idea of, of things kind of cascading and becoming more inclusive, to just recognize it's just, you know, what, what needs to be seen and what can be told. Uh, it is is more so. Um, I guess maybe it's interesting to ask all of you, what do you think are the changes happening now in terms of defining Caribbean literature? I mean, one of the big things for me, I think, as a reader and critic is, you know, the acceleration of translation and translation projects. So that that seems to me a really important one, but I, I'm interested to, to hear from all of you on, on that question. If I, if I may, um, and I, I wanted to, to, to jump off because I, I wanted to jump off from this question of, of generations. And I, because I think for me, one of the interesting ideas is it's almost as to, 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 to group writers according to a generation almost suggests that writers of an older generation are no longer writing, you know, and, and a lot of them, they haven't stopped. They're still producing work. And therefore, and a lot of them are producing current relevant work. And therefore that question of, of them being from a particular generation is, is really just moot. But publishing is a space that likes, let's say shelves instead of boxes. We like to know where to put a book. Um, and that, that, is one of, that is one of the things. Um, and and, and what, what, I, what I see is interesting is who gets to determine what and this happens in publishing in so many ways because we are using writer in this conversation as though the writer is the only one who determines what goes on the page and or how it is look it looks because depend and especially depending on the power of the writer in in terms of um, where they are in their career and or what they are willing to sacrifice a lot of times it is a conversation with an editor or a publisher that might determine depending on who they want to sell to. And that brings in the question of whether or not the Caribbean is a relevant marketplace, how a book will come across. And that, um, that, that, the, 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 that pan-Caribbean language that, that, um, that, that was referenced earlier is a part of that conversation. I, I remember being a part of um, an, an a couple of conversations um, on Instagram, et cetera, which talks about a particular book, which I will not name, which was written in very standard English. It was a book by a Jamaican writer based in Jamaica. But if you are a Jamaican reading this book, you would not know this based on the language. It is straightforward, standard English. And the, I think one of the reviewers had had a conversation um, with the, someone at the publishing house and they indicated that that decision was made because the market of the book was not the Caribbean. Um, so although it is a 
quote unquote Caribbean work, this is not the intended market. So who is determining um, this classification? Who is determining the shelf? And then what does that mean for what goes into it? And, and I think that's a great kickoff point for your current question, um, Addison, which is in terms of changes of what's happening. And I think um, one of the, the things, and this is because of my personal preference that I'm loving that is coming out, is more fantasy fiction. As a, as a child growing up, um, well, I, I loved I loved folk tales and my, my grandmother was a great storyteller. So I had great bonus stories at home, even though the folk tales I was reading in books didn't carry us until I think I was 12 and I got a collection of African stories, which was only on loan. So I still do not have a copy to this day, but it was a great summer when I got it that year. Um, and that leveraged into fantasy stories. And those fantasies were always either based in um, American fantasy or um, European fantasy. And it, it, that was, I never complained about that growing up. I just gobbled up the stories and enjoyed that. Um, but uh, what, what I realize now is that we are, we are getting, and, and, and it is not new, but it is more prevalent. You are having a lot of writers who are, pulling on Caribbean folklore. And some of them even housed here are pulling folklore from all over the place. One of the things I love about Imam Bash is that he is willing to take folklore from anywhere and put it in a beautiful mashup that is, is also so Caribbean because a huge part of our identity is that we are a crucible of so many identities that are, are not necessarily merging, sometimes just rubbing up against each other, you know. And in, in creating folklore, um, Imam often does that. But then different writers as well are, are doing that. I, I think since this year alone, I got about three different fantasy manuscripts um, from different writers based here in the Caribbean who said, oh, um, we realize you're interested in producing fantasy fiction. Would you have a look at this manuscript? And it is a thing that I, I think, uh, in, 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 to, to go back to that term, previous generations, a lot of writers here hadn't felt like if they were writing fantasy, they had a home in the Caribbean. So, you know, it, it's all, all of those ideas of place, who gets to say it, and what it is you're looking for, and how you define it, it you know, is, it's, it's all of that and it's all transitioning. And I think it is becoming a thing that is not yet defined, but it's certainly interesting to watch. Thanks, Tanya. Vani, can I ask you? And uh, for the sake of, of uh, listeners who might have gone out to get uh, a glass of water and come back, is that asking me about... Uh, Sorry, yes, about what you think of the factors influencing the, um, the shape of Caribbean literature at the moment. Okay, now I can't really speak for everybody and everything. So I will tell you something that uh, excites me, which is uh, I think that we need to resist uh, the hardening of identities according to identity politics based on guilt and fear and learned from the global north because uh, ideas of authorship in the Caribbean or in Caribbean associated literature could potentially be linked to ideas of anonymity, channeling, even spirit possession or collaboration. They're naturally intersemiotic or potentially intersemiotic. And so find which means, you know, working between multiple modes, but maybe having one title for that work. So for example, the translation of a Marlon James novel into a modern dance piece, which I saw one evening at Bocas in Trinidad, was amazing. And that's just one example, but also my collaboration with Andre Bagu, which uh, we presented in various places at Alice Yard, uh, which combined photographs of abandoned or decaying houses and housing lots with prose poetry. And uh, these uh, photographs were projected uh, so that the entire yard where I was reading was haunted by these ghosts of other houses from related neighborhoods. These for me are the exciting moments, exciting places of uh, interaction between literature and other forms. That, that really is the spirit of the mass, 
because you can't really just have Caribbean literature walking the roads of world literature and making a difference. But that would be like saying you can only play mass if you're playing Bookman. Thank you, Vani. And I think it's one of the aspects we haven't spoken about, but actually in the in the work that Ronald and I edited, you know, thinking about uh, what in academic discourse is called interdisciplinarity, which feels so insufficient for thinking about that, that play, the, the sort of um, way in which those two interactions become so much more together than their parts. And the, that, you know, you've expressed it so beautifully there um, in, in terms of math. So um, that, that's certainly a, a kind of, um, I don't think, again, it's not an, it's certainly not a new tradition, but it's something that I think we're becoming much more aware of. And perhaps, and digital platforms have more capacity to share, whereas often, when we look back at, at, at Caribbean literature, some of the performative aspects are those that are most easily lost to the record. Whereas now I think with the digital, it's something that we are able, uh, hopefully it's to, 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 to maintain and, and be more aware of and present to. Ronald, can I ask you the same question about Caribbean literature now? Sure, um, and maybe some of what I say will echo with um, some of what both Tanya and Vani have said. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the question of, of, of genres, um, genre fiction, genre writing, um, and, and the way in which um, the Caribbean tradition more readily embraces that. Um, and again, it's not suggesting that it's new, um, you know, but but I'm, I'm interested in the a more welcoming embrace, um, which we have perhaps seen uh, in in more recent times, um, and and I'm also interested in the ways in which that allows us to reread some of the earlier texts. Um, one of my friends, Andil Gosain, um, recently posted a, a, a picture of uh, the cover of uh, what, what we call the Lonely Londoners, but was first published as the Lonely Ones. And to look at that, um, the image of that paperback, you know, it's very much in the genre of, you know, this is a kind of sensationalist, you know, text, right? Um, you know, a kind of, of, of popular uh, fiction was being referenced through the language of the cover. Um, and, and for me, you know, like rereading um, Salki's Escape to an Autumn Pavement, I mean, there's so much, uh, for me, there, there's a way in which that's, that's a pot boiler novel, right? There's, there's so much of a kind of lurid sexual energy um, to that text. And I'm, I'm interested in the ways in which we might reread those in relationship to some of the genre discourses um, that, that, that have now been centered. Um, in Caribbean uh, critical discourse, because I think that offers us new kinds of ways into, into those texts. Um, I'm also interested in, um, and Vani alluded to this, some of the collaborative work that's happening across genres. Um, and by genres here, I mean it more expansively, the ways in which filmmakers are working with writers and on writers' texts, the ways in which poets are in conversations with dancers, um, you know, those, those kinds of collaborations. But again, those aren't new, right? Um, those have been part of the Caribbean tradition. Um, and, and for me, as someone interested in uh, the historiography of the field. I'm interested in going back and rethinking, um, you know, some of those earlier works. One of the writers I recently discovered who has been um, kind of lost to critical focus is Claude Thompson, uh, who was a, a short story writer who was writing in the 40s uh, and 50s. Um, and his book, These My People, um, is an interesting book, I mean, for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is that the, the short stories appear alongside um, lit lithograph prints by Albert Huey, um, you know, and to think about the ways in which, you know, like those early uh, collaborations um, are, you know, are, are being strengthened in terms of, you know, that kind of um, collaborative work happening between um, different artists in the contemporary moment. Um, and maybe I can also uh, point to the, I guess a kind of eco-critical term, 
turn that's happening in Caribbean poetics. Um, but that might also be again about readers and not necessarily about writers. Um, but you know, I'm thinking about Vani's new book um, and the title slips me right now. Is it Walking with Trees? No, it's like a tree walking. Like a tree walking, um, you know, and um, collection which is forthcoming thinking with trees but that also allows us to think about earlier works like you know uh, olive seniors um gardening in the tropics you know these these books that engage with land um in particular ways but i'm interested in the sort of um readerly turn um and readerly return to some of those questions uh within the um within the the, the caribbean uh, tradition and i'm also interested in and this is the last thing i'll say on this i'm interested in the sort of more expansive frameworks that are emerging um so i'm thinking here about the sort of archipelag archipelagic turn um, in critical studies um, that we see for example in nicholas lachlan's uh, so many islands that anthology that brings together um, stories from these different islands or that we see in michelle stevens and yolanda uh, martinez san miguel's um, work on um, the contemporary archip archipelagic turn. Um, and, and I think those offer new horizons for Caribbean literary studies. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's thinking about uh, Caribbean literature not necessarily mediated through the metropole, uh, through London as a particular metropole or through the US in a particular way. Thank you, that's such a rich answer. And I think it also helps us to see how, you know, there are so many possibilities and, and none of them exclude each other. And I guess that the kind of task is to open our imaginations to as many as possible all at once. And it feels like a very heady uh, uh, opportunity as well to me. I guess just kind of rounding up the session to thank you all. Um, and also maybe just to think within the BOCAS, program for the for the rest of the festival um, that there are some events coming up which show how kind of decision making around which books count is also changing in itself at the moment that um, there's very strong tools within uh, what Kelly Baker Joseph calls the digital yards now so on social media uh, uh, bookstagrams um, become very kind of influential tools for deciding, um, you know, what people will read and how they will read. Um, and there's quite a lot of kind of, I guess, counter canon making going on the uh, rebel women's group uh, in Jamaica, um, offering a kind of it's it's counter canon, um, which is it seems to me a really interesting moment. Um, and I know that Bocas has a session on crowdsourcing the canon. Um, which I guess, it, you know, we, we tend to think of anything crowdsourcing as more democratizing, but it's interesting to think how, um, how we also felt like that about ourselves as academics putting anthologies together at the time. Um, so I, um, and, I, and also I know there's a, a BOCAS project about 100 books that made us where people voted for writings that are were meaningful to them in terms of, of what Caribbean literature is, not just how it's uh, defined um, by kind of place or subject, but also kind of by that adoption by what's cherished becomes, you know, what's Caribbean literature. So I think that we really are um, at the very end of our session. I just want to thank you all for such a rich conversation. I know it's one that we could have continued uh, very fruitfully. Um, and um, I hope uh, that it will be a question that we'll all have an opportunity uh, to continue to think about as it's obviously a subject that we all care and uh, care about and kind of are invested in. Um, and one I think that continues to pose really um, interesting questions to us all and hopefully to, ex to, to excite us to think differently and creatively uh, as we go ahead with thinking um, at how we compose our own bookshelves. And I'll be thinking about that bookshelf, Tanya, very much. <laughs> As I arrange mine in very boring alphabetical order, I'll be thinking what else I might do with that from now on. So thank you all tremendously for a fabulous session.
greatest power of them all. We've got love, power, and together we can fall. One word, four letters, one four letter word. The simplicity of its sound masking its power, pure, potent. If we look beyond the physical veil, use our spiritual vision, which denies and defies our leanings towards human short-sightedness, we will see. See, like Nytiri in Avatar when she said to her father, I see you. See beyond the physical, beyond flesh, beyond man-made, ardently reinforced separations, labels, boxes, and bias. I see you, my sister, my brother. The divine in me sees, acknowledges, celebrates the divine in you. I am you, you are me, we are one, inseparable, intimately linked, linked by love. Love is not a thing. Love is the thing, all-powerful, the ultimate. Love, my people, is the final frontier. No need for the ensign to make it so. No need for Scotty to beam us up, baby. We are already here. Be a beloved with there. I see you, my sister, my brother. The divine in me sees, acknowledges, celebrates the divine in you. I am you. You are me. We are one, inseparable, intimately linked, linked by love. Ubuntu. I am because we are. Here's the thing, mother, father, everything, God is everywhere, evenly present. And since God is love, love is also everywhere, evenly present. Love is above us, below us, all around us, and more importantly, in us. We are love, cut from its wondrous fabric. We are love walking. We are inextricably connected. And in our connection, this love connection, there is immense power, light, healing, transformation, joy. I see you, my sister, my brother. The divine in me sees, acknowledges, celebrates the divine in you. I am you. You are me. We are one in Inseparable, intimately linked, linked by love. But who are we? Why are we here? We are here for greatness, for love, to love. Divine love is our birthright. Even when we seem to stand as one, we are many. We stand on the shoulders of our ancestors who went through inhumane atrocities, sanctioned deprivation, exclusion. Despite the intentions of the enforcers, they survived, endured, so we could be here. So my question to you is, what are you doing with your survival? I'm gonna ask again for the folks in the back, what are you doing with your survival? Are you showing up in your life and in the world? Are you loving yourself? Whitney and George Benson before her sang to us about it, the greatest love of all. What are we doing with our survival? Time to stop paying lip service to our lives. No more sleepwalking. Time to really be woke. Bob Marley chanted about one love, calling on us to get together and feel all right. One love, one heart. Oh, I see you, my sister, my brother. The divine in me sees, acknowledges, celebrates the divine in you. I am you, you are me. We are one, inseparable, intimately linked, linked by love. The love that makes us one. The boys found a space from which to launch the kites. Daniel held his kite close to the compass to prepare to send it up. A few people came over to check it out. Wait, fat boy shouted. You paper your kite with plastic? You sure that go fly? How you mean? Daniel replied with a sneer. Wait and you go see. Daniel heaved, heaved his yellow, green and black kite into the air. It caught the wind immediately and with a heavy buzzing gained altitude rapidly. A pair of purple clock tails 18 feet long unfurled below it. Fat boy and other spectators cheered. Everybody loves a singing kite. 
Daniel continued to let out his nylon twine. He debated whether he should slap the kite out to the sea. Whoa, Danny, Elisha exclaimed, like he wanted to reach Jakarta, my land. I want to see who will help you ball up all that twine when you're ready to go home, Elijah said, grinning. Nah, man, Daniel said. He stopped slacking out the twine. That good enough. The kite was now a shiny speck hanging in the sky somewhere over the Bogles Beach. The string pulled taut in Daniel's hand and his small biceps contracted as he controlled the flying toy. Copa, you have your belly? Fat boy called out from a few feet away as he flew his own kite. I see you put a pulling compass on your thing. His kite wasn't as far away as Daniel's, but it had climbed much higher. Just below the boy's spot on the hill, some little girls had launched flex kites. Ruth flew a small flexi that was covered with orange, black and green delicate paper. She seemed about to cry. Elisha stuck his baller into a deep crack in the dry earth and walked down to her. Ruthie kite is a dummy, Elijah said frowning. Elijah and Daniel watched as Elisha reeled in his sister's silent kite. After inspecting it for a few seconds, he called out to a boy to bring him some sticky cherry. I'm making a new singer, Elisha shouted up the hill. He installed a new thin strip of paper behind the kite's nose, then returned the kite to Ruth so she could put it up again. A high-pitched whine filled the mountain top as the kite became the latest flying craft to take to the bogus sky. The elated girls skipped in the air and gave her big brother a grateful high five. Don't slack out too much, you know, he said to her. Ayo, make room for a real kite, a fair-skinned man with a crew of three shouted. They carried a massive kite covered with white paper. A red star adorned the center of the white. Elijah's troops. Bake it real like this. Bake it practically ordered people to clear a path so that he and his team could launch the contraption. The wood framed kite was over eight feet tall and about six feet wide. The men had used pants legs joined together for the tail. Elisha stared at Bake and his crew. He said, Bake you could damage people with that kite. Why you ain't going belly and fly that? BK stared at Elisha scornfully. Little boy, know your place. Who you think you're talking to? Elisha shook his head. He went up to Daniel. Cause, watch them men with your kite. They like to use the kite to take down people on. And with this strong wind, I ain't think they have enough tail, Elijah commented. True, Daniel agreed. If that kite boot somebody, that person dead. There was no higher ground to use as a base, so the boys, along with everyone else on the hill, would have to wait and react to BK's tactics with his behemoth. BK's first attempt to launch his kite proved disastrous. His three henchmen heaved the kite from lower down the hill, while BK stood just a so I'm going to read to you from a Christmas haunting. Peanut left her friends and headed for the supermarket. Her mother had assigned her the task of getting the sorrel to make the traditional Christmas drink. Her eldest brother, Sebastian, would make the trip tomorrow, Christmas Eve, to buy the local bread and black pudding. Peanut had plans to go with him to the south of the island. A pudding run was always fun, even more so at Christmas time. Chatting with the butcher and the black pudding chef was always enjoyable. Simon and Simon had already collected the ham, pork and beef, while Samantha the youngest was in charge of the ginger beer. Everyone seemed to be on track except Peanut. Once again, the supermarket shelf was bare and so Plan B was put into effect. With two days left, she had better get that sorry, so she headed for the market. 
The 100 plus year old building would be recognized by any vendor from the past. It had changed very little, if at all. The constant hum of people talking and laughing was the soundtrack of the market, as were the voices of vendors calling to people to stop and buy. Balawu, sec dollar, bude, bude good, ripe mango, get your ripe mango. My lady, you don't want a ripe mango. Peanut walked past them all, her eyes like a military radar scanning the landscape for the elusive sorrow. It was a sunny day. It was a beautiful day. The kind of day that allowed people to spread their ways around the grounds of the market. It was all there. Mangoes and cashew nuts, watercress and celery, yams and peppers. The way a market was meant to be and so seldom ever is. This day was the kind of day that brought out the tourists to mingle and buy. The kind of day where every scene was a photograph. There were days when the rains did come. When that happened, the market was an awful pigsty of a place to be. Hurricane Thomas and the Christmas Eve trough were two such end-of-year rain events that St. Lucians would not soon forget. But not this day. Today it was a classic sunny day. The type of day the tourism authority prayed for and then advertised. As Peanut entered the compound, the smells of spices and meats and herbs filled her senses. The odor of fish and meat and fruits all mingled together, but it was the spices that really flavored the air. Every inhalation was a mixture of nutmeg, cinnamon, ginger, and related spices. You named it, the Castries market reeked of it. It wasn't by accident that the market was ranked number three in the world. She picked her way through all of this. The market seemed as devoid of the sorrel as any other place she had tried. This was frustrating. Still, she searched. She really did not want to be the only one of the James children not to have accomplished her task. Finally, she spotted a woman with the object of her desire. How much for the sorrel? Peanut inquired. Ten dollars a pack, came the outrageous quote. Peanut had expected this. It was two days to Christmas. Sorrel was scarce, so it had become a seller's market. That's a five dollar pack. You don't want it? Fine. The vendor stood her ground. The team switched to Creole, the real language of the market. Something she should have done from the start. Esma garde en cette pou. Ça c'est yon fou le pou sec dola, was her saucy retort. Do I look pregnant to you? That's a five dollar pack. Oh, pon, tie ou se a cent lisien, ti fi mwen, pou sec dola. The eyes of the vendor bulged. Oh my God, your allusion. For you, my girl, five dollars. Mwen vle toi. With a mental shake of her head, Peanut peeled the $5 bill from her wallet to pay the three parcels that she had ordered. She did a double take. Usually the notes of the Eastern Caribbean dollar carried the image of the British monarch. Yet for a split second, the money seemed to carry the images of Daddy Max, Grandpa Joe, and Mr. Lucas. She closed her eyes for a moment, and when she opened them, the images were gone. You okay? The woman asked. Yes. With the transaction completed, Peanut made her way through the sea of humanity that always occupied the market and headed home. She had a party to prepare for. October. Not even deep into autumn, but the outside temperature was close to freezing and the wind was shuffling dirt and leaves everywhere. Stepping out of his lift and out through the front through the main doors of his block of flats, Joe sniffed the cold air, then turned his face away from the stench of sour food coming from the huge bins to his left. Joe was no fan of the cold. The shivering, the runny nose, the thing got right inside of your bones. He shuddered, adjusting his scarf to make sure it covered more of the back of his head and fitted tighter around his neck. Already he couldn't wait to get back inside, but buying his daily newspaper at seven in the morning had become part of his ritual. It gave him a reason for getting dressed. Today he needed to get fresh milk, sugar as well, for the coffee he'd need when he gets back inside, when he, get, when, when he got back inside. Out of the entrance and into the street, Joe pushed down on his trilby and lowered his head to avoid a head-on with the flying bits in the air, then shoved his hands into his pockets. 
A force stopped him in his tracks. An arm was around his neck, pressing against his windpipe. He struggled to breathe. Oh! He tried to speak, but the pressure on his, on his neck got tighter. Shut it, old man, the person behind him said. His voice vicious, direct, and so close, Joe felt hot breath touch his ear. Don't say a word. Joe was being dragged backwards on his heels down the side alley that drunks and the like used as a toilet. What did... He started. Keep your mouth quiet or you'll be meeting your maker. What did... What do you think you're doing? Let me... Joe said loudly. What did I tell you? The voice said. Something like a fist was pressing into Joe's side. Into his back. Joe turned to get a glimpse of his attacker. The fire in the honey-coloured eyes took Joe by surprise. For a moment he forgot about the imminent danger he was in. He wasn't in a pissy alley headlocked by a stranger with too much strength for this old Joe to match. He was somewhere else, 40 years into his past, on the top deck of a ship making its way to England. The man tackling him wasn't a stranger either. It was a rival, Ian. Keep moving, the voice said. He's him or me, Joe told himself and jabbed his attacker with his bony elbow, hoping to destabilise him. I said, the sharp burn from a thrust in Joe's side sent his thoughts crashing into pain, raw, stinging, scorching pain. He was falling, voices mumbling, feet were running. A warmth ran down his right side. He was bleeding. My name is Darren Board Westmoss. Here I am at 75 years old, finish the autobiography of my life. To me, it is a, a beautiful experience to revise my whole life and to express it again in the form of words. I had a bit of difficulty because of having cataracts, so I couldn't write in the normal way that you're supposed to write in. So I devised a method of writing to using the Avarite sheet and using a felt pen. My brother John is now going to introduce you to the glimpses of a mystical misfit. Once I completed my stint in the occupational therapy department, I did my practical examinations and was successful. Officially, I had become a state-enrolled psychiatric nurse, eligible to practice in the United Kingdom. It was customary for nurses upon graduation to give one month's service to the hospital where they were trained before moving on. It came as a big surprise to me when another young state registered psychiatric nurse, or SRN, and I were asked to be in charge of about 10 long-term patients on a week's holiday at a seaside resort in Hastings. At first, I thought it was too much for us. It was reassuring when we heard from administration that the patients were manageable. Further, they told us that all arrangements would be in place to ensure that things went smoothly. I had known most of the patients chosen for the outing. There was Jim, Eddie, and a few others whose names I cannot recall. As we boarded the coach, I remember thinking that one had to be very perceptive to detect that this was not the average man on the street, but was a group of mentally ill patients with their nurses. On the way, we stopped at an off-road motorway services complex where lunch was pre-arranged. We soon settled down to eat. Everything was fine until we were finished eating. Jim Leach was nowhere to be found. We looked just about everywhere, but there was no sign of him. I was getting worried. I went to the area with the toilets. Jim, Jim, I called out to no avail. I noticed that all the toilets that were previously occupied were now empty except for one. Jim must be in there, I thought. I kept knocking on the door and calling. There was still no response. I then hastened to the person on duty in the manager's office to explain what had happened. I wanted permission to jump over the wall to open the door. He agreed without hesitation. I pulled myself up and looked down to see Jim sitting at ease on the toilet seat. I pleaded with him to open the door, but he would not budge. I then jumped in and opened the door. Jim still would not move an inch. My companion had to come in to assist me. We had no alternative but to put our hands under his armpits and lift him from the seat, while at the same time pulling up his trousers. 
It was a struggle to get him to stand as Jim objected, shouting, the hospital administration will never hear the end of this. Maids. Maids are ordinary persons who know who's who and what's what. Who know who's stick rods and who no longer sleep together, who had a miscarriage and whose marriage no longer works. By and large, they keep this knowledge to themselves or tell the flat pillows on the pallets on which they spend so little time or whisper to their families how not to lose face how to keep your child or mate, and what's going to be legislated. They rarely share this, though. Some dispense it to the wind because they have no contract to rescind and see their families once a year or never dare. They know who needs a physician, who needs a magician, and can refer one. They know whose little son returns from boarding school a man or torn by one. They know who to comfort, whom to give a quick embrace, and whose tears to wipe away, and whose daughter almost ran away, and who was almost bankrupt till the first daughter married the sucker with the nuclear plant. And who whispered to your child to sleep and sings of love and God and hope to the autistic one that rocks all night. They know who returns from ability beyond with a star and who is being radicalized in the basement and who will probably shoot the principal tomorrow, but no one ever asks. Street Psalm, a psalm of descent. I peep over the fences, Lord, and see them enter their basements. M14s hang from their shoulders like big necklaces, bouncing on the ammo they wear around their chests like breastplates of righteousness. My aunt, the washerwoman, tells me that the basements are full of years of canned food because they fear extinction. Down there they redact your word and leave us torn pages to believe. I will not ask you to come because you are everywhere nascent. I will not ask how long or when you will come. I will watch a hundred million snowflakes melt on a billion tongues. For you are sick with love for your pale children, and you watch as they skip down from the mount, holding the hems of their long prayer gowns, Dainty you like with both hands, Lord? They have left mounds of offerings, tithes, baptismal fonts, good deeds, and kneeling cushions on your altars. Careful not to trip, they lift the white robes high, revealing red satin lining and jack boots. Their ankles are bolstered with home ownership and fourth generation legacies. I lay in the street, face to the side, hands in modern zipped cuffs, not having heard my rights. I see when they return to their yachts and flotillas, tee off, then on parchment they design new monuments to generals returning from the slaughter of your red children. They have taken my peace. I can no longer raise my hand to my brothers. What is the price of a life of ruined brotherhood? Therefore, I ask nothing. I will not ask you to come because you are everywhere evanescent and you are full of love. And if shadows loom, they are not from you because you never leave. My name is Madeline Kupsani. I was born and raised in Trinidad, but I have lived in Canada and the prairies for the past 53 years. I'm going to read you from my book of poems called Prairie Journey. This is based on an experience which we have all had living on the prairies and experiencing winter. And it's called Subject to Icing. This is a sign that appears on the highways. 
in the prairies. The ominous sign rears its head as I approach the bridge, distracts me from the task at hand while my thoughts run on to white swathed tiers of wedding cakes with pink tipped rosebuds subtly peeping, exuding the faint sweet scent of almonds and memories of children's birthday cakes lovingly smeared with seven minute icing or slithery surfaces of simple butter icing come flooding. This is no time for nostalgic thoughts of wedding cakes or celebrations. And so with heart in hand, I cross the bridge, recalling the first time ever this warning had impaled itself upon my consciousness. It was beneath Saskatchewan's never ending skies in a waterless summer and while its land and people bled in silence, dismissing, not without some guilt, this untimely roadside marker. In thankfulness, I hurried home to Manitoba, only to find suddenly these warnings here as well. And I preferred it as it was before, before I took my heart in hand, venturing across the bridges, preferred it when I did not know such portents of impending doom existed, liked to think the care was only mine in all my epic journeys across this polar land. And I muse upon the wisdom of these merchants of the signs, who, sitting in their offices, could conceive of such a line as bridge subject to icing. It must have been a man, a woman would have known that it would never do, would only make one wonder about consistency and texture and even, will it ever dry? Bridge subject to icing. And now I'm going to read a little from my book, my novel called The Old Songs. And this scene uh, recalls old time carnival, not that old time, but not that far back, but in the 50s, Carnival Tuesday afternoon, and the, the, may, the main character in the book and her sister and their mother are standing around the Queen's Park Savannah, watching the carnival bands come out of the Savannah. The Savannah, a huge expanse of green sold to the government by a wealthy French family, was a communal meeting place. Horse racing and the annual carnival was celebrated in the savannah. And in the evenings, as cool winds from the adjacent mountains swept across the fields, alleviating the suffocating heat of the day, couples old and young strolled its perimeter. Children ran freely in its environs under parents' watchful eyes. Reigning supreme over the savannah from its western side were seven large stately mansions, boasting an architecture borrowed from many countries of Europe and from several eras of the past. These many castles, adorned with turrets and towers, each had distinctive crenulated facades. The grandiose structures were the pride of the city and the island, a testament to its colorful past in the days when sugar was king, and cocoa, not yet devastated by the disease, had enriched the island's coffers. These architectural legacies had been dubbed the Magnificent Seven by the island's Nobel laureate. In his acceptance speech, this son of the island thanked the country of India, the land of his ancestors, and England, the mother country, the land that had given him a home, but failed to mention the island of his birth. One would have thought that he had sprung full-blown from the earth like some demigod and had not been born under little Caribbean islands that had nurtured him for his first 17 years. Welcome to the NGC Bocas Lit Fest. The title for today's session draws inspiration from the profound lyric of Calypsonian and Caribbean people's poet, David Rudder, in Haiti, I'm sorry. He opens, Toussaint was a mighty man, and goes further to say, 
to make matters worse, he was black. The Haitian Revolution is a struggle of the majority group of African people who rise up against slave owners and wage a war for national liberation against the French. I imagine that we will not discuss the single figure of Toussaint Louverture for today's session. In fact, reflecting on Louverture, we can discuss the larger and irrelevant themes of the Haitian Revolution, decolonization in the Caribbean, and the concept of liberation and how it is represented in literature. In 1804, Haiti became the world's first black post-colonial liberated state. More importantly, the Haitian Revolution births the phase to end slavery in the Americas. We have the image of Toussaint Louverture. It has been shaped by historians, biographers, and creative writers. What does his career, ideals, and ultimate fate mean for Caribbean civilization? Today, I'm joined by professors Marlena Doubt and Sudhir Hazari Singh. Professor Doubt specializes in African, American, and French colonial literary and historical studies. Her first book, Tropics of Haiti, Race, and the Literary History of Haitian Revolution in the Atlantic World, 1789 to 1865, was published in 2015 by Liverpool's University Press. She had also published several other books that provide a deeper understanding on the developments in Haiti. A co-edited anthology, Haitian Revolutionary Fictions, an anthology will be published with the University of Virginia Press in October, 2021. In addition to all of this, Professor Doubt coordinates digital spaces that share visual art and print culture in Haiti and an extended bibliography of fictions of the Haitian Revolution from 1787 to 1900, Revolution from 1787 to 1900. Professor Sudhir Hazari Singh, he has, written extend, he has written extensively about the French intellectual and cultural history, publishing several books with titles such as The Legend of Napoleon, In the Shadow of the General, and How the French Think. His latest book, Black Spartacus, has been shortlisted for several prizes in nonfiction and biography writing. It is a pleasure to engage these two scholars who have made significant contribution to the academic work on Haiti and the Haitian Revolution. More importantly, both have used public platforms to speak on and educate people about the history of the Haitian Revolution and the contemporary situation in Haiti. So before we go ahead, you can follow this discussion and all our events for the NGC Bocas Lit Fest using the hashtag Bocas2021. So now let's go to the panel. And I want to big up our two presenters that we have here today. I have a reflect, reflection that I would make and I would invite you both to speak. And Marlene, you can go first. Why is it important to see the world through the eyes of Toussaint Louverture? Why must we give attention to the characters and protagonists of history? And how do literary representations of Louverture give agency to his life and power to the people of Haiti? Marlene? Thank you so much for, um, for hosting this event and for having us here. Those are some deep questions, so I will try to <laughs> tackle um, a few of them. Um, and uh, I would say um, seeing the eyes through, or the world through the eyes of Louverture, I mean, I think it, it's important to, when trying to understand, um, try to understand the context in which he lived and the pressures he was under. Um, and more than seeing the world through his eyes, his vision, what he wanted to do. Um, and, and laying that all out to me helps us to see sort of how the other revolutionaries kind of picked up the mantle where he left off um, and strove towards independence. Um, they could see that even though he never lived to see independence, that he had gained, you know, sort of laid the groundwork um, for that to continue continue. Um, and I would say that on the question of um, literary representations um, in particular, that um, one of the things that I really um, enjoyed about working on the Haitian Revolutionary Fictions project was coming across so many Haitian produced representations of the Haitian Revolution in the 19th century in, in terms of fiction, um, so poetry, novels, and plays, um, and that this is not solely kind of a 20th century phenomenon. Um, and I think it's really important because especially in the 19th century, the vast majority of the French 
um, British and US in particular, especially the German fictional representations were pro-slavery. And but of course, all the 19th century Haitian representations are very anti-slavery, um, are very kind of pro-Haitian sovereignty um, and are really kind of making, I think some special critiques um, that uh, that are important to pay attention to as a part of a much longer history of um, not just uh, the print culture of the revolution, but also of the history itself, because a lot of people learned history um, through fictional writings in the 19th century, and they read these works as offering, if not a historical truth, some kind of truth that they then took away with them. Thank you very much, Marlene. And later on, we'll discuss this idea of memory making and what people can do with memories politically as well. But I want to go to Sudhir here. You know, he write a beautiful book here on the life of Toussaint Louverture, but also many works around it. But Toussaint has been elevated to the level of myth. You have done important work to unpack that myth and in doing so have proven his outstanding human capabilities and achievements. Um, can you discuss the centrality of this figure while we, and you are as well, cautious to highlight the role of an individual when there are so many social forces um, creating a moment? Thank you very much, uh, Amilcar. Yes, that's a, a very um, important uh, tension that I tried to navigate as I, as I worked on this book, because it is a, a biography um, and, and they are a little bit out of fashion now. Um, but at the same time, I was always very keen to try and see Toussaint not just as a person uh, and as an individual, but as someone who was a representative of broader social and political and indeed intellectual forces. And to, to answer your question, your first question, why is it important to see the world through Toussaint's eyes? It's just, if we go, if we just step back briefly and think of the, the late 18th century world and the way in which it has been typically represented to us, by history and by historians, it is those representations have ended up, you know, very broadly um, seeing, seeing the world of the time through Western European or North American eyes. And I think the first really important value of um, having uh, someone like Toussaint um, tell us his, uh, seeing the world through his eyes is that he's not from there. Um, he's, he, he's giving us a different perspective. And of course, secondly, what's important about that different perspective is that it's the perspective of those who are resisting um, injustice, you know, and injustice in the late 18th century took a number of different forms. They, the form of slavery, of course, um, but also the form of economic domination, the form of imperial domination, um, it was a very um, uh, unjust hierarchical world that Toussaint faced. And it's important to see the world through his eyes because he gives us a very uh, almost unique testimony. We have lots of testimonies, lot, a lot more testimonies come to us in the 19th century uh, from people like Toussaint who are fighting uh, these similar uh, sorts of battles because of course the battle goes on in the 19th century. But Toussaint is very um, remarkable because he, he, he's living and, and operating at a time when there are very few of these voices that have survived uh, in the way that Toussaint's uh, has. And therefore, uh, I think it's a particularly precious testimony that, um, that he gives us. And, and, and thirdly and lastly, I think it's important to, to, to see the world through Toussaint's eyes because until now, at least that's my contention in the biography, even people who have written about Toussaint have actually not seen the world, tried to reconstruct his, his vision. Um, he has been used very often as a vehicle to project other ideas, sometimes very noble ideas, you know, C.L.R. James's book, on, on Toussaint and the Haitian Revolution. There's a magnificent book, and, and, and I, it's still one of my favorite books of all time, not just about the Haitian Revolution, but it's not fundamentally a book which is actually seeing it, seeing this, this, this wonderful story through the eyes of its, of its key protagonists. And this is what I really tried to do in the book. Thank you very much. Um, it's quite interesting when we look at these remarkable qualities. 
And um, I think it would be remiss of me not to live up to my Trinidad and Tobago culture identity and not introduce Bacchanal. Oh, I would like to know about the unremarkable qualities of Toussaint Louverture as well. And unremarkable, not necessarily some failure of his personality or something that we reject, but history would allow us to learn very differently from what he would have advanced. In later questions, I would ask about the issue of autonomy and um, my perspectives on it. But um, particularly around issues of gender that also emerge, his idea of the colonial administration of San Domingue um, coming out of it, you know, what are some of the maybe understood as shortcomings, you know, of Toussaint Louverture and his construction and vision of the Haitian Revolution? Is that for me to go first? <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay. Um, shortcomings. I mean, I think I would. I would um, actually refer to something that Studier said and said it, which is that. Um, seeing the world through two centuries eyes actually, or, or rather understanding his vision and reading his words and seeing what he wanted to do um, shows the way that he thought and what he, and it shows the limitations in terms of what was on the horizon for him um, of the possible, things that he thought were possible. And so um, Toussaint Louverture has been criticized a lot, including in C.L.R. James's book to a certain extent, right? Um, that he couldn't you know, get to independence. Um, but one of the reasons for that is that the context in which he lived, we have to think about how people who wanted independence from France were the white French colonists and they were traitors. And so um, if we don't understand that context, then it seems like, why can't Toussaint Louverture take this next step? But in fact, all of the most famous revolutionaries of his era, so if we think about André Rigaud and Toussaint Louverture, neither of them wanted, they, they insisted over and over that they were French, that they were good Republicans because they believed in the liberty and equality that had led to the moment of 1794. And that's, and Julien Raymond, and anybody who argued for independence to them was a traitor, like Santonax, for example, um, that uh, Toussaint Louverture defends himself by saying, you know, I'm not the one who wants independence. So I don't know that I would call this necessarily a shortcoming. I would say that it's a step on, on a path to something else, um, which, which ends up being independence, which I think is, of course, the right path um, to take. But I would say, so I would say more than a shortcoming, I would say he um, was, his, his visions were limited by what he thought was possible and what he thought was going to be ultimately good. And so when we criticize that move now, we're doing so with the knowledge of sort of what happens, a sense of historical inevitability that didn't necessarily exist in his world. Um, in terms of gender and his policies, again, I would say, for example, affirmage, the labor system that he sets up, is not one that he actually designs. He gets that policy from Santonax and from Julien Raymond, in fact. <laughs> and so he also adopts and promulgates this policy um, as, again, something that is possible um, to keep the, the colony still um, profitable. And so we look at it now and we say, oh, here is another shortcoming. But for me, more than necessarily wanting to criticize Toussaint, which is, it's always possible. I'm, I really want to understand him. So I appreciate these questions also. I'm more interested in gaining an understanding of what he lived through and what he was going through than in sort of pointing out all of his, you know, quote unquote mistakes, because another one could also be the children, his, his um, children and the push and pull and almost all the Haitian writers, the historians to the novelists. I mean, this this drama with Toussaint Louverture's children that maybe we can get into later um, structures so much of conversation because you can imagine it's it's the stuff that every great historical romance is made of. Um, so it doesn't have a, a, a love story at the center. It has a story about a father and the children he loves and um, being torn between his what he wants for them um, and what he thinks is, is the right way for the revolution to move forward. So I'll stop there and throw it to Cedier. Thank you, Marlene. Um, I, I, I agree with, um, with what you say about um, the limited horizons. And, and I think the most important thing, um, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm completely open to talking about uh, Toussaint's various shortcomings, and I do so in, in the biography. I mean, I think he, for example, he 
uh, he was a bit too secretive, um, for example. Um, he didn't even confide in his closest associates. You know, Christoph and this I didn't, didn't really know um, what he was, what his game plan was in, in 1800, 1801, 1802. And, um, uh, but I think all of that comes back to one fundamental fact, which I think people who have criticized him have perhaps um, uh, neglected to a certain extent, is that the structure that he faces in, in the late 18th century, the international structure, is one that is immensely constraining, immensely constraining. You know, it's a miracle that he got as far as he did, it seems to me. Um, because if you look at the French Revolution, right, let's let's take a comparison. Let, let's talk about revolutions. I know Amilcar is going to bring us there very shortly, but let, let's start the conversation there. Because when you're assessing Toussaint Louverture, you have to assess him as a revolutionary. So what the question is, is what 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 is the potential? What kind of uh, things can he achieve as a revolutionary? Well, one way of answering that question is to look at the French Revolution. French Revolution by 1795 is dead, right? It's finished. So the, the one of the greatest revolutionary episodes of, of that era um, peters out within three years, within three or four years of the proclamation of the First Republic. And from that moment on, it's a slide towards counter-revolution and eventually with Napoleon, something much worse. So. That's the kind of comparisons that we need to have in mind when we're thinking about revolutionary possibility. Toussaint does much more than that, right? He's able to, and, and here I would go to what I think are his strategic objectives. What are they from the early 1790s? He wants to unite the black people, right? That, that's one of the constant themes, one of the leitmotifs of, of, of everything he says. He wants to unite the black people. You know do not allow yourselves to be divided. You know, he says this over and over again to them. And, and if you let yourselves be divided, you will be defeated. He's successful in that. And indeed, that success is what paves the way to, um, to the success of the Haitian Revolution in, in 1804. The other thing that he's very um, uh, uh, keen about is to stop foreign powers from dominating Saint-Domingue. By the time he <clears throat> by the time he departs from the scene, he has succeeded in that too. You know, he he plays off um, the French, the Spanish, and the British against each other and the Americans, and he's able to negotiate this very very fine line um, among them, so that he he can preserve this 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 vital space for for the colony, um, and. Um, and, and that's the situation that he faces. And, and of course, you know, he's, he, because he's facing such, um, such tremendous negative odds, um, he makes mistakes. Um, but, you know, um, and I'll finish on this, you know, people often accuse him of kind of mishandling Napoleon. Um, I don't think he mishandles the French, you know, I think he plays it exactly right. He, he makes it absolutely clear to the French that they should not invade and attack because if they do, they will be wiped out. And if Napoleon had been more rational and more sensible, uh, as indeed Napoleon himself recognized later, he would not have sent in this, this invading force. So I think on, on those very big issues, he was fundamentally right. Thanks very much. And, and to Sidiri's larger point, around the work of the revolution. I mean, this is something that I think is worthy of being taken up. It also shows the universal character of what Toussaint was doing in Haiti, that the American Revolution does not liberate people from slavery. The French Revolution abolishes slavery and restores it in their colonies. The Haitian Revolution is a national liberation struggle that puts at the center the issue or the slavery question, anti-slavery, as a form of politics. And the question I would have for Marlene is, is to reflect on at the A-level system here for high school students, secondary school students in the English-speaking Caribbean, the way history is taught, there was an important shift that I would have to live through where they teach us Caribbean history in our first year, and then we learn world history, as they would call it, which is largely a sense of European history. And, um, I remember my history teacher who was from another time saying that this is a mistake. He doesn't understand the logic of the syllabus because you need to understand the French Revolution first 
if you are to understand the Haitian Revolution. And um, that's an epistemic shift that, and a pedagogical one that the Caribbean studies teachers were making in the Caribbean to say that you have to center yourself on the perspective of your geography and you will read history like any ordinary human being and then work the dates out <laughs> as you need to, but you center yourself on the philosophy here. I would like to ask you, Marlene, what is the utility of centering the Haitian revolution in Caribbean studies and understand it as a revolutionary process, you know, not just something that happened in Haiti? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, obviously, um, to people who study, for people who study the Haitian Revolution, we see the relationship. We see what is happening in France affects what is happening in Saint Domingue. What's happening in Saint Domingue affects what's happening in France. Um, but I also think that it's just as true. And so, what I talk to students about is perspective. When when we offer a perspective that centers Haiti in the age of revolutions, or that takes the Caribbean as a center point for the age of revolutions. It's not to say that the European or North American revolutions were not important. It's to think of things from a different vantage point. And so I think Julius Scott's The Common Wind is a really great book that shows us what happens when what's going on in the Caribbean kind of takes center stage and then a, a different history of the age of revolutions unfolds. And in that book, it is the Haitian revolution. I would say also a great book that was just published Vincent Brown Tacky's Revolt does the same thing, except it tells us we, we need to actually understand Tacky's Revolt in Jamaica much earlier, and oh, then yeah. a series of other, um, of other sort of revolutionary moments that we understand better when we take the Caribbean as not simply a bunch of fragmented islands in an archipelago, but we understand that there is a symbiosis and what is happening on one island. I mean, and there are literal examples of this, for example, Phaedon's rebellion in Granada, where it's actually like, oh, let's be, you know, a French colony instead of a British colony, because then um, we can have emancipation here too. So it, it offers a different perspective that when we look and I would say solely at the French example, then it's kind of, and, and the US American, what becomes the US American revolution, um, that it basically gives us an impoverished analysis because those narratives have crowded out the frame as being the most important revolutions. And so my goal in teaching is actually not to say, oh, the Haitian revolution is much more important than these things, but to say, let's look at a different vantage point, which then my students all say even now, um, they never learned about the Haitian Revolution, most of them um, in high school, or they they did. It was they were in AP history, some kind of advanced history course, and it was, you know, a footnote almost. Um, and so um, digging deeper into this event to me actually illuminates the other events and actually brings brings a completely different perspective of how the age of revolutions unfold and a longer age of revolutions. Because again, then now we have Tacky's revolt in there and we can continue to extend and think about Bolivar and think about the Latin American wars of independence. And, and then think about, we understand also differently what happens in the United States in terms of US civil war and emancipation um, and everything sort of ricocheting across the Americas. Thank you very much, Marlena. I, I would like to take back a suit um, you and Sudir that we alluded to, and maybe we could give some more complexity, and then we'll have some feedback from the audience as well, on the concept of autonomy. And maybe my uh, socialist politics is being a little bit explicit here. I'm very interested in understanding this conception of autonomy and uh, in the colonies, colonial administration, and Haiti still being part of this French polity. Um, the 20th century changes, political changes for Martinique and Guadeloupe as they part more of France um, provide an interesting example about this political relationship that we would see. That would be especially Césaire coming after World War II, having a very strong position on what he thinks the survival of Martinique would require um, while Europe was having their reconstruction. reconstruction sorry. So personally, I don't accept this form of political identity as a system for a Caribbean nation. But possibly my orientation in political independence as constructed in the Anglophone experience informs this. And I think more deeply revolutionary processes totally liberate themselves from outside foreign political management, control, and even a form of networks. Um, but I don't want to be reductive at all. And I know there's a lot for me to learn and perhaps persons in the audience to learn in our situation and context. So I know that this issue of autonomy is complicated. And Marlena spoke to a lot of these 
complicated issues, the problematic behind it, but it's worthy of insight. So not only to understand the meaning of autonomy for, for Louverture, I would like to know what are the lessons we could draw on understanding that this is actually a living situation of some French Caribbean territories right now. Sudhir? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I think, um, you know, it is really one of the absolutely central questions in um, both in terms of understanding why the Haitian Revolution took the shape that it did, um, and also the long shadow that that the event then cast over the 19th century and and as you say continuing all the way up to the, the continued existence of these french outposts um, um in in the caribbean um as far as toussaint's own um conception of autonomy went um i think it's it's mostly an improvisation um i think it's mostly to do with the fact that he realizes but this is just my personal interpretation, because he writes a lot and speaks a lot about many things. But on this particular issue, for obvious political reasons, he had to be silent because he couldn't reveal exactly what, what he wanted to do, both in the short term and in the long term. So what I'm giving you is just my intuition. And sometimes as a historian, you have to, that's the best that you can do. But my intuition is that Toussaint realizes by the late 1700s, that the French are preparing to restore slavery, right? That, that's what he realizes. Because when, when, when Napoleon comes to power, he passes a special law which says that um, uh, colonies will be governed according to special laws. And everybody understands um, that special means this is gonna give us uh, an opening um, to bring back slavery. And the French never use the word slavery. Even when they restore slavery, they call it something else. Right? They're so ashamed of what they do that the legislative acts don't actually contain the word slavery. Um, but anyway, Toussaint realizes this. And, and this whole notion of, of autonomy, which, which he eventually uh, brings back to the fore, uh, it, as Marlena noted, it, it's something that the that the white settlers had floated um, uh, in the early 1790s when, when they were trying to distance themselves from the French Revolution. Toussaint typically kind of reappropriates this idea and, and uses it for his own purposes. And but it's a mainly my point is it's mainly a defensive move, right? He's trying to create a situation whereby um, he will, you know. It provides Saint-Domingue with its own constitution, which is what he does in 1801. And in that constitution, it will be stated very clearly and very openly and very radically that slavery is abolished. And, and, and that is the main purpose, if you like, of this kind of autonomous arrangement that, that he sets up. It's, it's, to, it's to block any attempt by the French to actually come in and, and bring back slavery. And of course it didn't work, but I thought, I think it was a pretty good move. Um, uh, and of course, part of the reason it didn't work is because the French didn't understand it because the, the concept of autonomy, as we now think about it, hadn't been invented yet by the French. And indeed the French only come to this realization themselves 150 years later, right? <laughs> it shows you how far how far ahead Toussaint's thinking was. Um, so I think that was his short run political objective. Um, in the longer run, I think Toussaint probably thought Saint-Domingue would become independent um, in fact, if not in law. Because if you look at the way things would, would have drifted, if you look at the way the constitution is, is written, what it provides for, um, the successor to him is someone who would have been from Saint-Domingue, for example. In other words, he wanted, he saw, another way of saying this is that he saw France more as a protection, right? He, he wanted to be able to, to continue this experiment with the blessings of the French and with them basically acting as a, as a protector against other imperial powers. But I think what he thought would have happened if it had gone well, if the project had gone well, is that Saint-Domingue would eventually have drifted um, into a situation of de facto independence. Malina, you have anything further to say or what you said suffice earlier? <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think I, I definitely agree that, and also that, um, that a complete separation or break with France sort of wasn't even actually necessary at the moment that um, for Toussaint Verture, at the moment he writes this constitution, right? Because if he writes a separate set of laws for Saint-Domingue in that he can say slavery is forever abolished servitude, that clause is so interesting because it, it rephrases the question different ways to eliminate eliminate any misunderstanding. So if you think about like the three fifths clause in the US Constitution, three fifths of all other persons, again, as Sudhir mentioned in the French documents, like, oh, we're going to bring back the laws that were in place um, before 1789 or under the Ancien Regime, right? So there's a way to like obfuscate and kind of lessen the blow. And in the Constitution, which then becomes the basis for Haiti, independent Haiti's later constitutions that all spell out 1805, 1806, 1807 constitutions, there cannot be slavery. Oh, just in case you don't understand, let us restate that for you, what that means. And also that every single person is equal under the law because in French Saint-Domingue, you also had the question, you had the question of autonomy en gros, but you also had the question of petit, you know, like individual autonomy because the white French colonists were doing things that what actually ended up becoming a part of the incoherence of the French Republic. They were saying this word toute personne that had appeared in the documents of the National Assembly didn't apply to the free people of color, the homme de couleur. They were saying, but you're not persons. I mean, it's just when you actually think about the illogic of it, um, and this is what stays. So the constitution that Sudir mentioned that, um, that Napoleon basically says we can make other laws for the colony. Well, this is actually contrary to French Republicanism, which says l'une indivisible, right? And so again, Toussaint Louverture uses that fracturing. Oh, we can have other laws. Well, then I'll make them. I'll, I'll set the, the committee up and I'll make the laws then. So he uses that opening, if you will, against the French, the opening that they created because it's New Napoleon who said there could be other laws, right? Um, and so, and then uh, the incoherence returns. Now we're gonna uh, go completely against the principles of 1793, 1794, if you will, um, and bring back slavery, not just in Martinique where they say it's not, it's not bringing it back because it was never abolished there, right? Okay, this is their semantic argument. But then with Guadeloupe, where in July um, of 1802, it is actually a, a re-establishment of slavery in the law, that in the actual law, right? Um, and so that, that incoherence actually helps to propel forward the revolution. And, and Toussaint doesn't get to see it because he gets caught up in that same web. We haven't talked about um, his terrible, horrible, sad demise in the Fort du Jour um, prison. Um, again, the complete, that loss of his personal autonomy to him was so offensive in the, in the papers that he writes, the documents that he's left behind. Again, these are so precious because the, they're rife with emotion and feeling, defense of his character and behavior, and also his interpretation of exactly what happened, which I think we must, we must pay attention to. It, it's just it's such, they're such important documents, these four different versions of his memoirs um, as he left them. Thank you. And uh, I'll take two questions from the audience. I'm gonna ask one to each of you. Um, so Jalaluddin Khan is interested in learning more about uh, what is it, what are the forms of political and economic domination France had at that time in Haiti and Sudir, can you answer that for Jalaluddin? How did France economically and politically dominate Haiti? What were the forms in which it happened? Um, um, is the question uh, before before Haitian independence or or, or after? Um, because I, I think, think you know when we could talk about that uh, in in two ways. Well, maybe I'll I'll I'll, I'll do the pre pre independence bit and Marlene can talk about the post. <laughs> Um, I mean, before, before, before 1804, the French were in a very commanding position um, uh, through the fact that they had colonized the island or, or taken control at least of the, of the eastern part of, of the island since the late 17th century. And, um, and through the system of slavery, they, they developed it into um, a very prosperous colony. Um, it was called the Pearl of the Antilles. And in, in the 18th century, it, it became a place where vast quantities of sugar, coffee, 
cocoa, indigo were produced. But of course, this whole economy rested on um, the work, the, the forced coerced labor um, of, of the slaves. Um, and Saint-Domingue, um, at the height of its uh, uh, wealth and power, um, produced something like um, between a quarter and a third of um, you know, French wealth um, from, from external sources. So this was a hugely profitable colony for the French. And this is why um, at the time of the revolution, um, uh, there was so much uh, at stake um, in terms of uh, applying the principles of the revolution to this colony. Oh, I would say post-independence, I mean, here's the thing, right? I mean, the French under successive regimes in the 19th century attempt, in fact, to once again, conquer, quote unquote, Saint-Domingue in their language for the purposes of bringing back slavery. And when this continues to be unsuccessful because you have the first Bourbon restoration, you have a second Bourbon restoration, right? And as um, France goes through this and, and Louis XVIII assumes the throne, the, the Haitians at first think that potentially they will get recognition of Haitian independence by Napoleon being gone. Um, short-lived because he will come back for the famous, infamous, I should say, 100 days. Um, but no, the, one of the first things that Louis XVIII does is takes these audiences with the French colonists, the, the atmosphere is rife with, we must reconquer Saint-Domingue, get our money back, which anything that is about reconquering Saint-Domingue or restoring order are euphemisms for bringing back slavery and quelling any revolt. That's what that means. Restoring order means to bring back slavery, to stop the revolt. Um, and he sends commissioners to the island for this purpose. They, they toss about the idea of the indemnity that will be disastrous. But at that moment, the French won't even consider an indemnity. Um, and when they cannot re-enslave the Haitian people, resubjugate them, they settle for impoverishing them. That is the solution to them is they punish them. Um, and these draconian, you know, taxes and, and loans and fees and tariffs that they have to take out. And when you read the newspapers around the world that were published in 1825 after the indemnity was struck, they all say, they all look at this as absurd. It's almost as if they don't expect that, like it's sort of um, a fictional indemnity. And, and it wasn't though, it was not like the kind of debt now where, oh, well, we're gonna forgive another nation's debt and it's just the slates wiped clean. No, no, this was not an option. France definitely expected the Haitians to pay the 150 million francs and sent another delegation in 1838 by which the amount was reduced to 90 million francs. And on that basis going forward, paying the remaining at that point 60 million francs plus the tariffs and all the interest are not paid off till the end of the 19th century. Um, and then the, the actual rest of the amount into, the 1940s to 1947 is the latest figure. Um, and if France were to repay Haiti back now, repay in quotation marks, it would be between 20 and $40 billion, depending on how the amount is, comp is um, computed. Because as the research of Julia Gaffield has shown, um, Haiti also had to give France most favored nation status, which meant that they got that it hurt their trade with England, with the United Kingdom, um, and they had to give special prices to France. So if we factored in all of the parts of the manipulation, we would actually arrive at a, an enormous sum um, that does impoverish the Haitian people. Um, and so yeah, I'll stop there. No problem. I want to have a, a question that um, actually, in a way, it doesn't undermine, but it disrupts even the uh, motif and the theme for this afternoon. Um, Professor Rachel Douglas on Facebook, she asks, um, have we uh, encountered the work of Casimir's The Haitians a Decolonial History? And then the way that it disrupts these narratives of very top-down figures, these the, the Louvertures, the Black Jacobins, as we will call them, the Dessalines, the Henri Christophe, to look at other actors and, and the wider context in, in which it happens. So perhaps I'm asking more, and she is raising the issue around reflecting on uh, the plurality of actors here um, beyond Toussaint. I, I think we all agree on, on have consensus on why we center Toussaint for conversations to focus and as a site to investigate. But 
I would like to know a little bit more about these wider actors and the colonial readings of uh, the Haitian Revolution itself. Thank you. No, I think that's a fantastic question. And, um, and you know, I, just to repeat that I, in, in, in my, in my, in my, from my perspective, Toussaint is, is a symbol, right? and he's a symbol of the richness and of the creativity and of the dynamism of the Haitian Revolution. I mean, to go back to, to one of your earlier questions, Amilcar, um, what makes this revolution so extraordinary? It's that actually it is a genuinely popular revolution, um, unlike, unlike the French and the American ones. I mean, the American one isn't even a revolution, right? It's just basically, the, I mean, Th uh, Theda Scotchpo, who writes about the comparative history of revolutions, famously doesn't count the American Revolution as a revolution because the elites remain the same, right? So, you know, you have to have a, a, a different set of people running the show if you're going to talk about uh, a revolution. And what's extraordinary about this revolution is, and, and, and the, the, the scholarship of the past 15, 20 years has made this much clearer now, it's that it draws from um, an extraordinary wide and diverse uh, array of forces, you know, men, women, um, black people, mixed race people, white people as well, you know, there are white, white revolutionaries as well, um, people living in the north, but also people living in the west and even people living in the south, um, military people and civilians. I mean, uh, all, of, all of these forces we're now, uh, and we're still making new discoveries as it were. But I think when we think about this, this whole extraordinary period from 1791 all the way up to 1804, I mean, when I, when I teach my students, one of the things I say is that this is not a revolution. In fact, it's a series of revolutions, right? Which follow each other. It starts with the revolution of the enslaved in 1791, and it ends in a war of national liberation where pretty much everyone, right is is in a situation where they're resisting the foreign invasion and so this is uh, this is why uh, for my money the haitian revolution is the defining revolution of of that era because it combines all the different forms of revolutionary activity that you can imagine um, I would just add to this that one of the fascinating things in, that I loved uh, about working on Haitian Revolutionary Fictions Project was that there are certainly a lot of works where Toussaint Verture and De Saline and Christophe appear, but actually in the vast majority of works, it's it's either characters just completely invented out of thin air, or um, you see a lot of women revolutionaries in these texts. So the literary imagination of people writing about the revolution, whether for pro-slavery or anti-slavery purposes, um, they were perfectly capable of imagining just what Sudir said, all the different kinds of people who fought in the revolution, um, who participated in it, who were affected by it, whether some of the stories take us over to the United States or to Jamaica. And, and even in teaching this, it, it is simply to understand the kinds of ideas that are in the air also. What do people imagine when they think about revolution? And yes, they thought of Toussaint Duverture and they, the Black Spartacus trope was around and Avengers tropes, but they also thought of ordinary people and families, people who, and by ordinary people, I mean not generals, big famous French generals. They thought of the enslaved people who propelled the revolution forward and have their own goals. And many of these fictions start before 1791. Um, some of them start with Makandal, um, so, but some of them just start with an unnamed slave revolt or rebellion because those took place um, in the colony as well. So I would just say that it's, I hope, um, you know, and, and that's reflected in the historical record as well in terms of other characters. And so, yes, Jean Casimir's book is very instructive in this regard, but so are actually the documents produced in the era. Again, I would say Julien Raymond, for example, is someone who, even though he says, um, you know, everything was fine until this law that he doesn't like is passed. He's like, everything. But he actually talks about slave revolts and rebellions that happened before that. So you, if you look into the cracks and the contradictions, you see that we actually need a much longer history of the revolutions in the plural. I agree with that. Um, and we, and then we have a, a much different array of characters whose names, most of which we don't know, um, but some of them we do, certainly like Makandal, for example. Um, so yeah, thank you, Rachel, for that question. 
If I could just add one thing, though, um, and and it it, it sounds a bit like uh, justifying, you know, focusing on these on these big people. But if we're thinking comparatively again, the, the very striking thing about the Haitian Revolution it, it is that it is the one successful uh, revolution, and we need to think, ask ourselves, why is it that in in a context where we now know um, uh, slave revolts of enslaved people were happening all the time. And, and in a number of different areas, whether in, in the Caribbean, in, in the United States or in South America, why is it that this one works? Why is it that this one is successful? My answer, and hence, hence the way I've written this book and, and the people I've ended up focusing on, my answer is that not this isn't about one individual, it's about one idea, which is that revolutions need to be organized. And, and, and that's one thing that Toussaint and the people around him bring to this revolutionary activity, which perhaps is lacking in, in some of the other revolts that you have in Jamaica or in Cuba or, 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 in, uh, or in South America, centralized organization. Now, this is a big debate, of course, in the history of revolutionary movements. Should, should, you, should you be, you know, I mean, in the 20th century, it's, it's, the, it's the Marxists and the Leninists who, who have this kind of view of centralization. But I think Toussaint believes that centralization and, and, and leadership is actually a, an essential ingredient in, in, in making a successful revolution possible. And I think he was right in, in that respect. But that's my view. <laughs> Thank you very much, Malina. Malina, you were going to say something. I was just going to add that, yeah, I mean, I know that a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of scholars and just people don't like when we say that the Haitian Revolution is the only successful slave revolt and rebellion. But I would say that when you actually study the other Atlantic slave wars, <laughs> if you will, you can see how actually remarkable it is that the Haitian Revolution succeeds. So we actually do need to, to study what makes it succeed in, in producing the abolition of slavery and um, the end of colonialism for the island, for colonialism in fact, right? Um, not in theory necessarily, which arguably continues because for example, Phaedon's rebellion that I mentioned, they will, when you go against the colonial authorities, they will send entire armies to crush and disappear you. And this is what the history of the Atlantic slave wars is, is all of this burgeoning up of, of revolt and rebellion that lasts a long time, like Tacky's revolt, but they will crush and disappear you. They will deport you to another island. And this is exactly what happened in the colonial period um, with um, post Columbus as well, which was displacing indigenous people to other islands as well in order to quell rebellions. So to me, it, that means we do need to understand the what makes the Haitian Revolution successful in its particular way, um, because it also illuminates the the sheer force and power that the colonial um, authorities will bring against any attempt to undermine slavery and, and undermine imperial rule. I, I really appreciated those contributions uh, because I'm an organizer here as well. And one of the things I think we give up is we put the integrity to our ideas in such a pure way. We ignore that um, the struggle was always to achieve our goals. Um, as an organizer, losing is in our DNA. That's the, the life we chose. But I do think that the idea of leadership and organization makes Haiti stand up with what we would see with Bolivar and Grand Colombia, what we would see with Fidel and what he would try to do, not only as a figure, but the Cuban revolution in the 20th century. There's an achievement that is going to be made that is going to create a political destiny that is much different for better or worse at times than others. And I, I think that was really uh, profound. Again, Marlene, I really like the idea of reminding us what imperialism is. They will invade, they will return, they will come in armies, and when they don't come in armies, they will come in economics, right? And uh, that is something we need to give up on the idea that the world is fair, and they would leave you alone when you determine your freedom. Um, but in fact, the strength and the power of it goes back to what Sudhir was asking, us, saying that this is a miracle, and not being uh, mythological about it, you're trying to say the unique achievement here, it stands up in history and time. And it would read as a miracle, an important symbol that we could draw, draw inspiration from. But the NGC Bookers Lit Fest is not just a festival of ideas, it's also a festival of books. And now I would like to invite 
uh, Marlena and then Sudhir to read an excerpt of the work you would have produced around this theme um, in your own career. And I'm really excited to listen to you. And I'm sure our listeners um, are really looking forward to this. I know they are tired of me and they'll be more excited to hear about your great work. So Marlena, please go and then Sudhir. Um, so I'm just going to read one of the poems by a Haitian author. I hope you will um, enjoy this short poem um, or uh, in, in the author's words, words he wanted people to feel. Um, and so this is a poem by the Haitian poet Tertillien Guibault, um, and it's from his collection called Fatherland, Hopes and Memories. And the name of the poem is Toussaint Louverture Upon Seeing the French Fleet in 1802. Oh, these vessels that I see, it is only too true. These vessels in their holds are bringing back slavery. The savage overseer in our fields, could it be that his frightening voice should thunder anew? Could it be that the sound of fastening chains again resounds in our valleys in bloom? Could it be that faced with such tear-filled doom, my spirit should float like a ship adrift on the main? Oh no, I will fight, the despots uh, said to me upon your visage will rain down the favors of France. But in my hands, I hold the Blacks' deliverance. If I betray their cause, let me live in infamy. Valiant sons of Africa gather round me and say, should our flame ever wane? No, tis but an eclipse, the flame will rise again. Oh, I know that our foe is numerous and mighty. Great also is their valor, these warriors fierce in battle who compel victory to side with them in war, who without doubt leaving the shores, shores of the Loire told their homeland, weave us crowns of laurel. Yet facing them in combat, still I do not fear, hastening the hour of revenge for the blacks, lifting my dauntless breast to meet these lion hearts against these giant soldiers, my own size to measure. I have faith in my star and I will be the victor. When peril throws him up against the stormiest of challenges, the man whose heart towers over all outrages to match this outsized heart will see himself grow larger. Woe to whomever marches through our deep gorges. In my great plans, God is the one with whom I conspire. And already I can feel in my veins bubbling with fire, the power of creation by which a new world surges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marlena. And setting up the stage for Sudir to run after that. Good luck. Well, that's a hard act to follow. That was beautiful. Thank you, Marlena. Um, I wanted to give you um, some Toussaint because what, what I've tried to do in the book is, is to quote him as much as possible so, uh, so that people could get a flavor of, uh, of how he thought and how he expressed himself. Now, one, one thing he often did where is um, he would give, he would round up um, people uh, at, at sort of mun municipal ceremonies. And uh, in, in the late 1790s, as uh, parts of Saint-Domingue were liberated from British rule, he would show up at these ceremonies and, and give a speech. And what I want to read is an extract from one of these speeches, which he gave um, at the northwestern coastal town of Mole Saint-Nicolas in October 1798. So <clears throat> the inhabitants had just been liberated from British rule. And Toussaint used the occasion to plant a tree of liberty. He, he was a great, uh, he, he had a very strong sense of uh, envir the environment as well. And um, he was, uh, 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 he planted trees as much as possible. And so he plants a tree of liberty uh, uh, outside the town. And what's interesting about his dedication speech to the tree is that he talks, he uses the, the, the tree as the sort of theme of his entire speech. And this is a rhetorical gambit which allows him to pepper his interventions with allusions to the vodou um, spirit, grand bois, um, which means great wood, um, the guardian spirit of the sacred forest. So this is what I write. Um, for Toussaint Louverture, the sacred sapling of Mole Saint-Nicolas represented the accession of men and women of all ages, occupations and colors to quote, the beautiful title of citizen. Equating Frenchness with liberty, Toussaint further reminded his audience that liberation from British rule had brought them emancipation from the bonds of slavery. He paid a glowing tribute to his soldiers, many of whom were in attendance from the nearby garrison, 
for what he called their valiance and intrepidity in this heroic struggle. But this was no time for empty triumphalism, and Toussaint pointedly reminded his fighters that he expected them to be, like him, bearers of the virtues of abnegation and selflessness. Nor were they to expect material rewards for their successes on the battlefield, but rather what he called the generous satisfaction of seeing the former slaves of Mont Saint Nicolas as free men and women safely gathered around the Tree of Liberty. At the same time, the freedom symbolized by the Tree of Liberty was not just about the enjoyment of rights, but also the assumption of responsibilities. Those who had been part of the old order in town, the militia members who had fought for the occupying forces, or the planters and merchants who had worked with the British and even had been involved in buying and selling slaves, had a duty to what Toussaint called repent genuinely for their past errors and sincerely pledge to follow the righteous path of Republican virtue. This included all the French nationals who had been denounced by as emigres by the Republican authorities and who were generously granted an amnesty by Toussaint. The time for disunity was over. Appealing to the ideals of concord and fraternity, these are the two words that he keeps using, <clears throat> Toussaint invited these new French citizens, and I quote, to be of one heart, to be of one soul, and to bury forever at the foot of this sacred tree, the symbol of freedom, all our ancient divisions. Thank you both for those uh, powerful, you know, contributions, but also speak to the creative imagination. A revolution is not just something intellectual or even carnal and physical and military, but it's really a dream, it's desire, it's intimacy, it's driven by love which is oftentimes expressed through commitment and sacrifice. And I think that is beautiful to speak to that. Vani Capildeo, a creative writer and scholar, she said that um, uh, we should write a calypso. Um, they will crush you and disappear you. And then she went further to say that uh, the song was writing itself as we kept speaking. She said, when they come in armies, <laughs> they will come in economics. So <laughs> she, we have been getting good feedback uh, from the participants on YouTube as well as on Facebook. And um, now that you all have read um, your work um, and on the work of others, meaning that this is the type of research you'll have done and have spoken to the different types of texts that you'll have looked at, I really want to to learn more about the process, the methodology, and understanding that colonialism extracts, steals, and hides memory from oppressed people. A lot of the material written about our reality is hosted, held, and even withheld in institutions of former colonial powers. This then renders archival research and reading as deeply political acts. So I'm interested in in both of your processes of studying the French colonial archives, archives in the US, in the UK, in Spain. And um, if you could speak to the younger scholars and creative writers and helping them understand the significance and the politics of archival research and reading. Um, uh, Sudhir, would you like to go? Because I know you've talked a lot about this as well. And then Marlena, please follow up. Thank you, Amilka. Yes, <clears throat> um, it was an absolutely, um, essential part of, of, my, um, of my endeavor in writing this book that I went back to the archive. Um, because one of the things that um, I was told um, when, I, when, when I was in the early stages of um, doing this uh, research was that there was nothing really interesting left to do in the archives. And, and that's one thing, one message to, to young researchers, never believe people when they tell you that the archives have been done and that everything that has, has, uh, is to be found has been found because the people who tell you that often have a vested interest in keeping things as they are. <laughs> and uh, um, it just isn't the case that um, archives have uh, 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 handed over all their secrets. Uh, one quick digression on this. One of the things that we've just discovered um, over the past seven, eight years about British colonial history is that huge amounts of the archives uh, of British colonialism were hidden from, <laughs> from researchers 
in a separate place. Um, and basically, um, and, and a lot of them were destroyed, in fact, but now since they were found uh, almost by accident about eight years ago by a researcher who was working on the history of resistance in Kenya, and now slowly and grudgingly, the, the British state is, is releasing them and, and, and um, people are now being able to learn new things, including about key episodes in, in British colonial history. Um, so um, these stories are, 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 are the same everywhere. You know, states hold on to things, they, they try and hide them. Um, the French have been quite good, I should say, I mean, it, it's a very sad paradox, of course, that the French have literally robbed um, Haiti of its memory because all, almost all of the, the significant archives of the colonial period are actually now in France rather than in Haiti. Um, I mean, um, it, it's a very unfortunate state of affairs, but, um, but the French have at least kept the material um, in, in good condition. And I was able to, to draw on it for most of my, most of my research. Um, uh, but there still is quite a lot more um, that one can find in particularly in, in, in regional archives. Most of the work that I did was in what's called the uh, Archive Nationale d'Outre-mer, the, the overseas territories, uh, basically the French colonial archives, which are in Aix-en-Provence. Um, and there's also the National Archives in Paris, which have huge amounts of, of information um, about Saint-Domingue during this period. Um, and I supplemented it with um, visits to American, British and, and Spanish archives. Um, so I'll, I'll have, so I'll take it in kind of two separate directions, but related. And um, the first is that, um, you know, a, great mentor of mine, you know, when I'm, I was researching this story about um, for my first book on Moho de Saint-Marie and his daughter. And um, I would always hit this dead end because a lot of researchers had been interested in this and they had uncovered some documents in the um, what's called the Eta Civil about her. Um, and she said, well, it, that doesn't mean that, you know, you you don't go and look at those documents and, and look for other ones as well. And she said something that has stuck with me all these years. She said, um, and you have to find something that other historians didn't think was important. And then that's exactly sort of what happens. And so um, even though US historians had seen the name of this daughter, Emma Naid, they hadn't sort of met up with the French historians who had the daughter had a different name in these documents. Um, and, and then merging those with um, Moho de Saint-Marie's unpublished writings showed that this daughter was in fact the same person um, who was a listed on this etat civil who um, he was going to then subsequently raise as a white woman. She was a, a daughter of mixed race that he had. Um, and so, so I would say even in the stuff that other people, I hope that when, you know, students now are researching, even in the well-worn paths, like still go back to what we call Toussaint Louverture's memoirs, the published versions and the unpublished manuscript documents, and look for the things that uh, that we've missed, that the rest of us has missed because everybody has a perspective that they're bringing and things they are looking for and want to find. And that sometimes means that you don't see other things that are that are there as well. Um, the second thing is about where the archives are. Um, one of my favorite in a sad way stories, um, but I guess it ends up benefiting Haitians because Puerto Rico is closer than than uh, than France, but is that the Alfred Nemours Archive of Haitian History is housed by the University of Puerto Rico. Um, and the reason for that is Alfred Nemours was an early 20th century Haitian historian. He did a lot of military history um, and he had, you know, amassed all these documents, um, including autopsy papers about Toussaint Louverture's death, um, and I, I got to spend a lot of time um, in this archive um, with Aura Diaz Lopez, the project archivist. And, um, you know, she's given talks about this, like, you know, how did these documents end up here at the University of Puerto Rico? And when Nemours had died and he had these documents in his possession, he was living in France. Um, and the French government has very strong laws about patrimony and what can leave French patrimony. And they saw arch archival documents about Toussaint Louverture's death and they were, they allowed the documents to be given to another university in Puerto Rico because they said it didn't concern French history, which is amazing because there are, there are documents about Napoleon and Leclerc, but the frame of mind that allows 
especially someone like Toussaint Virtue, who in the constitution he wrote that we talked about said, we're all gonna die free in French, right? Um, but that he's not French. And to me, that means that the conversations that we have about archives and belonging and patrimony and ownership are very, very, have deep and longer histories than, you know, and, and when we talk to archivists, then these fuller stories about how the archive came to be. So I would also say the other thing is, don't, um, you know, and I, I know no one would ever intentionally do this, but archivists are, have so many stories and sometimes you have to just get to know them and talk to them and remember that they've been sitting in that archive longer than we're gonna be there and they're still there. And they're deeply interested in the stories that we end up telling um, and, and it adds to their understanding of the documents and then they add to ours because they have the longer fuller history of how the documents came to be there many times or can pull those other histories out for us. So that's what I would say about archives. Um, just a follow-up question to either one of you. Um, Kisha Clark asked, um, what are the National Archives in Haiti like? And therefore, kind of information that gives you that, you know, sometimes we spend to study our history of liberation, we have to go to colonial sites. But what happens in our national environments and the archives that are available to us? I'll start with the Haiti question. I mean, so the National Archives of Haiti has, um, you know, uh, suffered, has suffered um, because of climate, has suffered um, because of political upheaval. There's a lot of reasons wh why, and also just infrastructure, it, uneven in infrastructure, because again, as Studier mentioned, that the French not only, it's not, they are not just like accidentally good archivists, right? They have all of this money to preserve and keep the documents and also to, I guess, spruce them up, if you will, when they are lacking. And the British Library as well, which has a lot of documents about Haitian independence, because of all the interactions of independent Haiti with Great Britain in the early 19th century. Um, and so there have been a number of projects with the Digital Library of the Caribbean that have sought to digitize, but I think we, I don't think that digitization is the answer to the infrastructure problems. And digitization offers a new way for people to access documents, but I do think we have to work towards ensuring um, that the, the question of equity in how archives are not just produced, but preserved and maintained um, is at the fore of our thinking. And when and so when, when Haitian National Archives are closed a lot to the public, many Haitian archives are not open to the public. It's also about extraction as well, but it's also about the more people handling the documents is, is not good for them. Um, and so to keep all of that in mind, and I wish I had a better answer for the state of the archives in Haiti right now, but I would say the archivists in Haiti are doing heavy lifting um, at multiple different sites um, to, to work towards digitization, to apply for grants, but also for the question of um, repatriating documents, which Mupana, um, one of the museums in Port-au-Prince has been working with a lot of partners to be able to, for example, they purchased um, a copy of the official autopsy of Toussaint Louverture to get dresses from the court of Christophe. Um, and so making sure that we're just we're not just extractors, but that we're also good partners and collaborators and facilitators with some of that happening. Um, when we see that documents are for sale because Haitian documents go on auction a lot, which is upsetting. They've been in private collections and then private people buy them. That the thing that we should do is alert the Haitian archivists immediately and help them get funding. Um, and I know a lot of Haitian scholars and, and scholars of Haiti have been doing that instead of like, don't go to your library first, even though that might be the instinct at your university. Contact the Haitian archivist first and see first if they can if they can get the document. So, do you would you like to add to that? I mean, I don't have a huge amount more to say, except you know, uh, it is obviously a matter of resources, and um, also. Uh, and there's a huge disparity there as far as um, Haiti is concerned. Um, but uh, I wasn't able to spend a huge amount of time in the, uh, in the national um, uh, archives in, uh, in, in Haiti. Uh, I mean, I, I visited just quite briefly, but colleagues who've worked there re quite recently uh, have come up with interestingly the same story, which is there's a sort of general view that there's not much in the national archives, but actually in Haiti, but actually that's not true. And, and, and they're, they're actually now in the process of cataloging everything that they have fully. 
and they themselves are coming to a realization that their collections are richer than they themselves thought. So um, it is worth um, uh, persevering even there. Um, and uh, I mean, who knows, there may be some really interesting things that, that will emerge from, from this ongoing current process of cataloging, which is going on in Haiti at the moment. Thank you. I, um, I'm interested in, we implicitly touched on some of, on this topic, sorry, um, but I want to, to speak more directly to people who want to write the quality of work that you do, want to learn from the style as well, the mode in which you write. So there's a form of creative nonfiction that has long been used to illustrate historical events and personalities. And of course, the pioneering text by C.L.R. James Black Jacobins is as much a historical account and a kind of literary representation of Louverture and the events and these dramatic events in Haiti. But, and it appears in both your bodies of work, um, you give recognition to the historical and imaginative. I want to know um, for the benefit of our listeners, what is the value of interdisciplinarity to Caribbean studies as well as the Caribbean student? Um, so what is the value of interdisciplinary studies to Caribbean studies and to the Caribbean student? Sort of. I, I was trying to be polite. I think it is compulsory and is the basis upon which any work is possible. But uh, I, I'm outing myself now and you could say what you want or reject my position. I agree with you 100%. And I would say that I stand on the shoulders as a literary historian, a cultural historian, an intellectual historian, I stand on the shoulders of many social historians who came before me, who paved the way. I would say Bernard Moit, for example, when he turned to literature to help understand the place of women in slave revolts and rebellions, to me was just lighted a path and so many others, Barbara Bush, for example, so many historians um, and, and Michelle Wolf Trouillot, I mean, who basically said, you know, that there's, there's history in the childhood games we play, in poetry, in art, um, it's in the world that we live in. And that helped me to understand a work like Erard Dumel's Voyage dans le Nord d'Haïti, Voyage or Journey to the North of Haiti um, from 1824, where we oscillate between epic poetry and personal reflections and oral history and documentary analysis in the footnotes. Um, and uh, so I, I take my inspiration in terms of being interdisciplinary, which I also urge, I think is compulsory um, from 19th century Haitian authors themselves, but also from the you know, 20th century historians who've lighted the way and shown us that it, these are not as separate worlds that we maybe sometimes imagine because the people that who were studying, quote unquote, were also reading literature. They were listening to music. They were immersed in art and they were immersed in the physical world and they had thoughts about it and they affect and what they did affected it. Um, so all of those things to me come together just to create a fuller picture of the era and, and push forward our understanding. Absolutely. Um, and I, I couldn't have put that any better than, than Marlene just did. Um, just an anecdote, I suppose. Um, I was privileged, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, maybe last year, to hear a series of lectures by the very distinguished uh, Haitian scholar Yannick Lahens uh, at the Collège de France in Paris. And the opening lecture that she gave, I mean, it was a series of lectures about um, Haitian literature, I mean, of, of which she is a uh, uh, great authority, of course. And she started a series with um, uh, the Haitian Revolution and Toussaint Louverture. Um, and what was interesting to me was that she, she, she regarded the birth of Haitian literature as the late 18th century and the, the writings of um, all of these revolutionaries. In other words, um, the, the line that we sometimes draw very art artificially between you know, creative work on the one hand and as it were political, political work on the other, I think it's a completely arbitrary work. I mean, Toussaint is as much uh, uh, someone who's writing literature right, um, as someone who is writing about politics. And in his mind, 
that distinction would not um, even be a material one, right? He's doing both things at the same time. And of course, Yannick Lahance argues that in that process, he's actually giving birth to a corpus, which then goes on to become Haitian, this thing that we call Haitian literature. But I guess another way of making that point is that you can't you can't separate these two these two these two activities. Politics is absolutely central to uh, uh, literary to literary activity, and literary activity informs politics in, in an absolutely fundamental way. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, what the people say, as we say here, um, is that you all are making so many important references to key scholars like Trujillo and so on. Um, can you identify some of the important texts that uh, you would recommend for people to think about the work on the Haitian Revolution and the type of diverse issues or the emerging issues? Um, perhaps one of the key, the key ones to read historically that to understand how this field has developed and maybe some of the important new writing and contemporary works. So I'm not asking you if I extend a bibliography, but um, the listeners would have and the organizers will share um, some of the names and the texts with uh, our community. So if you could just mention maybe three to four, maybe some of the books that you want the public to know about other than your own. Um, I would say one of the books that I think is just um, offers marvelous interpretation and also teaches very well in the classroom, either um, as a whole or separate individual chapters is Deborah Jensen's Beyond the Slave Narrative. Um, just so much is rich in there in terms of thinking about the key figures, Toussaint, Louverture, Dessalines, um, but also women of the era um, and, and thinking about things like music and lyrics, like basically lyrics um, and the way that people back and forth um, uh, kind of dialogues that they had with one another um, that often end up being very dramatic, almost like they were plays, except they're sort of arguing back and forth. Um, and I would also say Ada Fair's um, book, Freedom's Mirror, um, is wonderful for understanding the relationship between Haiti um, and Cuba um, in the era of the revolutions. And then I would I would say some, some newer books, um, um, one is Gregory Pierrot, my co-author for the anthology, um, The Black Avenger in Atlantic Culture, which offers, has among the many wonderful chapters is a chapter about um, the, the very uh, idea of the Spartacus and Toussaint Louverture reading the Abbé Reynal's works um, that I think is just fantastic. And then um, a newer book by, I think it just came out last year by um, Chelsea Stever called Haiti's Paper War um, that is about the back and forth sort of incoherence and civil war um, of the way that the Haitian state was built and really kind of takes Haitian authors seriously um, as political actors who end up influencing um, the state. And I really could go on and on because there are so many influential historians, but I wanted to um, definitely kind of prop up the work of some of the newer writers and scholars working in this um, area, along with some of the classics, like uh, Jensen's work is definitely going to be a classic and, and Ada Fair's book already is and highly award winning. But so that's what I would sort of start with. Um, in addition to, of course, as we've been talking, CLR James, Michel Wotruyo, your David Gegas is your, I mean, that, that um, you know, we read capaciously and Julia Scott. So let me not forget um, Julia Scott. <laughs> Yes, well, I warmly endorse all of those. I was going to start with, with Julia Scott in the way, um, because um, it is just such a wonderful book and um, known, um, um, known, known to a few, but now, you know, since, since a couple of years ago, published um, and now thankfully um, available to us all. Um, one of my favorite sort of I call it a kind of modern classic, um, is Carolyn Fick's book, um, The Making of Modern Haiti, because it was really, uh, I think, a sort of turning point in the sense that it actually was one of the first to actually go to the archives and actually find this wonderful uh, richness that was out there in terms of popular activity, um, uh, the activities, the revolutionary activities of um, different groups, 
um, and of course the activities, um, the, the key role of Vodou um, in, um, in, in the Haitian Revolution. And that is something, that is one of the many areas where I think we have, we have learned um, a huge amount um, uh, over the past uh, two decades. And there have been some, there's been some really good uh, books. For example, Claudine Michel edited a book called Vodou in Haitian Life and Culture in the, in the early 21st century. Um, and uh, uh, those sorts of books, I think, uh, have brought a sort of fresh perspective on the Haitian Revolution, that this isn't just, I mean, and this is going back to, to something that you rightly pointed out, uh, Amelkar, that revolutions are not just about, you know, um, people doing material things, or even people doing things being driven by, by ideas. There is, a, there is a spiritual dimension always to, to a revolution. And in the case of the Haitian Revolution, that spirituality centers, not, not exclusively, but, but it centers to a very large extent on, on Vodou. And, and I think we still have more to learn about that, but, but, but a lot of scholars have, um, have taken us in, in that direction. And um, uh, um, there's a book also um, under that heading by Tony Presley Sanon called Histoire Across the Water. Um, Haitian History, Memory, and the Cultural Imagination, which was published in 2017. That's also uh, really interesting on this phenomenon. So that's my little contribution to kind of uh, emphasize the role of voodoo. And the professors have spoken, the professors have spoken, given us homework. Um, Malena, you're going to say something. I would, I would like to add a book because I think it's so important. It's um, Michel Rovetruyot's first book written in 1977 called Tidi Feboulé sous was recently translated into English um, and published with Liverpool University Press as Stirring the Pot of Haitian History um, because along with the important history of Vodou and thinking about archives, I think we also need um, to understand the role of Creole in Haitian society and scholarship in Creole and scholarship that emanates from Haiti. Um, and so uh, to second Rachel Douglas in the comments, um, um, Jean Casimir's book, A Decolonial History um, of Haiti, was recently published by the University of North Carolina Press. And these are Haitian texts that didn't have as wide of a circulation from being published in Creole, being published in Haiti in the case of Casimir, the work of translation, which is definitely a social justice issue, as Gina Ulysse always says. Um, and, and so reading Haitian authors, if we can, if in the native language and making sure that they're part of our bibliographies, and then also seeking out um, translations of those works when possible and adding them as well to classes and to our own sort of reading lists. That's important. And uh, we're approaching the end. I have one more question, so we'll have to be a little bit brief to keep our time. And uh, I'm really grateful for all the contributions that we've made. And perhaps I want to reintroduce the political question for Trinidad and Tobago, for Belize, for Suriname, for Guyana, on the idea of the multiracial character of the Haitian Revolution. And uh, there's a dominant frame in the writing of the Haitian Revolution and even Caribbean literature that reinforces the black-white binary, the African-European history as a, a binary, a, a contentious relationship between the two, indigenous peoples, African groups, the presence of voodoo, the Roman Catholic Church, Jean de Couleur, the Europeans and their political thought have all influenced Louverture and the people of Haiti. And his struggle was to also construct not just the liberation of African people, but a multiracial society, which I was going to say society, a multiracial society in which there is a certain equality and dignity for all peoples. And I wanted to know if you could give a very brief comment. I know it's a big task, but a brief comment on the importance of that vision that Louverture would have advanced for the dignity of all persons and racial justice for him was part of a universal humanity on a project for the liberation of all peoples. I know Sudhir talks a lot about this in the work around fraternity, and, but if you could um, speak to that a little bit, and then Marlena, and then we'll do the close. Thank you very much, uh, Amelka. Well, I think you've said it just very beautifully yourself. And um, uh, the, only th the only thing I was going to add to it was what you've already mentioned, which is that for Toussaint, this is about brotherhood, fraternity. 
And that's the kind of concept around which he organizes this. And, and perhaps what I would say is that this is where his republicanism comes through. Um, he, he really believes in equality and equality in this sense means actually treating people with equal dignity. Equal, equality of dignity is, is the sense in which he's a Republican. I mean, he's not, unfortunately, perhaps, uh, he's not a socialist Republican, so he doesn't believe in, in equality in that sense. But equality of dignity is something that mattered hugely to him. And you see it in, um, in, the, um, in the way that he's trying to, and, and I would argue actually succeeds, this is one of the other extraordinary things that he does, I would argue. He helps, of course, with, with, with the active uh, 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 mobilization of all these wonderful uh, groups of people uh, to create a people, right? I mean, in, in 1791, the Haitian people didn't yet exist. And, and in 1804, they exist, right? They are there. And they are there because of this extraordinary revolutionary activity that people like Toussaint and others have put together and, and then creating this uh, society where uh, people have, at least in, in, in principle, uh, equal dignity is one of the other great achievements of and, and great legacies of the Haitian revolution. Thank you, Sudhir. Malena, we have less than one minute. Can you give us a closing reflection? Yeah, I would say definitely that we see um, Toussaint Louverture's ideas reflected in Haitian law. Um, there's a Haitian proverb also that says, tout moun se moun, every person is a person. And to me, when you study Haitian revolutionary history, it sounds like a very simple phrase, but it, it, it's so resonant because as I mentioned earlier, the question of personhood, the question of a human being, the question of manhood, the question of citizen, all of these things that get folded um, into that term and the idea that a person cannot be alienated from their personhood, which is the principle on which all of the early Haitian constitutions were built, was that people had to have, all people had to have equal rights of representation under the law, and they all had to um, come together under one big family, to use a sort of Desalinian kind of um, term, that, and that there could not be enmity between brothers of the same family, by which he meant all of the Haitian people. Um, and so I, I hope that those principles of unity reflected in Union Fait la Force um, that are not evident right now um, in our society in the United States, um, in Haitian society where there's fracturing, um, that we remember that actually the revolutionary principles are good. The Haitian revolution did not fail at all. It's we are not living up to the principles of the Haitian revolution. The principles themselves are good and right and, and they hold up very well. C'est la fin. It was a pleasure to have both professors Marlena Doubt and Sudhir Hazari Singh for the NGC Bobes Lit Fest. And this brings an end to our session this afternoon. So all everyone, all, Toot Moon, please join the conversation on social media with the hashtag Bocas2021. Thank you very much, professors. It was a pleasure being with you. And um, we look forward to seeing you. Um, sometime in person in Trinidad and Tobago, but as well as the book has said first. So many thanks. I'll be here too. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>
Saturday. You know what that means. Stand and Deliver is here again. My name is Rokas and I want to welcome you to it. I hope that you guys have been enjoying the NGC Bocas Lit Fest so far. I know I have and we have a lot more in store for you guys for the rest of the weekend. So you don't want to go anywhere. This is the place to be. Alright, so we're kicking off Stand and Deliver today with Ivory Kelly. Check out this piece. Tell me how you feel about it. Hi, I'm Ivory Kelly. I am a Belizean author and today I will be reading an excerpt from one of the stories in my recent book, Pengering, titled Dear Editor. Their Editor is about a young indigenous farmer and his wife whose great ambitions are to acquire the legal title to the government-owned farmland that they currently occupy and to have children and raise their children on this farmland. Unfortunately, they experience a pangering, an upheaval that threatens both of these dreams. I'll be reading two small pieces from around the beginning and middle, and I'll be skipping over some parts. By the time he pauses for breakfast, the sun is well along on its swift trip inland. Leaning against a stout inup, Valentino gazes upward into its shady branches as he eats a portion of the tortillas with beans and pepper from his food container. He chuckles to himself as he remembers one of the stories his grandfather used to tell about the gods who sit in the branches of the inup watching the human activities below. To Valentino, they are merely entertaining stories, silly old-fashioned beliefs like praying to the mountains before going to hunt in the forest, which some of the men in the village still do. Yet, as he bites into a second tortilla and looks around his farm, Valentino relishes the thought that the gods are looking down on him, smiling. The hospital grounds are desolate and poorly lit. Only a couple of the light bulbs on the upper and lower verandas of the narrow two-story building are on. Inside the maternity ward, Valentino leads Selene to a chair at the nurse's station, which at the moment is unattended. With Lily still asleep on his shoulder, he goes in search of a nurse, his rubber boots thumping as he walks down the corridor. Valentina returns a moment later, followed by a middle-aged Creole nurse who appears to be in no hurry. Taking a seat in the chair across from Selene, the nurse asks, when the pain starts, speaking more loudly than is necessary and looking at neither Selene nor Valentino. About two hours ago, around eight o'clock, Selene says, you have your clinic card? Valentina reaches into the bag and holds out the card with Selene's prenatal record. Put it there, the nurse says, pointing her chin at the table, still making no eye contact. Valentina's jaws tighten as he places the card on the table. On most other occasions when he, like many other Mayas from the villages, experienced this kind of treatment when they came to town, town people speaking to them as if they were children or acting as if they weren't there, Valentino didn't always bear the indignity in silence. But this time, he takes a slow, deep breath and manages to quell the flood water roaring in his chest. The nurse finishes the paperwork and points Selene toward one of the beds. The white sheets, the letters PGH written with black permanent marker on the hems, is thin and worn, but clean. Valentina helps Selene get settled and prepares to return home. He stops at the nurse's desk on his way out. He hesitates, and the nurse finally looks directly at him. We have two nurses on shift tonight, sir, plus the doctor is on call. Your wife will be all right. Lily stirs on Valentina's shoulder. As he exits the ward, he takes one last look at Selene, who has both hands pressed hard against the back of her waist as she paces the floor beside her bed. She is the only patient in the maternity ward tonight. Selene recognizes the pressure at the base of her pelvis, like an urgent need to stool. 
The baby is coming, but no nurse is anywhere in sight. Selene screams for help. No one comes. She screams and screams until her throat becomes raw. Still, no one comes. So tell me about Trinidad. Whenever I talk about Trinidad, I end up sounding like a travel agent. Truth is, there's not much going on there I can tell you about. Nothing except for goat races. That's Tobago. You're telling me that a whole country isn't interesting enough to sustain a 10-minute flirtation at an alphabet dive bar? Or maybe I'm the one who's uninteresting. <laughs> no way you believe that. I can tell. You really don't think much about your country, huh? I'm from a town of 700 people in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, and I can tell you a thousand one things about it before I run out of stuff to say. I'm not saying it's an interesting place, it's boring as hell, but things happen there. So tell me something interesting about it then. Okay, well, down in Campbellton, that's my town's name, back when I used to live there, we had a serial killer, murdered 13 people, then disappeared. The cops thought that whoever it was must have been living right there in our town. How's that for interesting? It's a bit morbid. Not the kind of conversation I'd use in a bar to get someone to warm up to me. He killed 13 people, you said? That's right. 13 that we know of. But there's always bound to be a few more, don't you think? I guess that makes sense. Were you scared? It's strange. Even though it was just a town of 700, I always had the feeling it could never happen to me. Really? I figure most people would be paranoid. Even in a town of 70,000. Well, there's a bit more to the story. Do you want to hear it? Of course I do. So you are interested. I never said it wasn't interesting. It's just that people come out to dive bars like this because their lives are miserable. The last thing they want to hear about is a small town tragedy, I'm sure. Your life isn't miserable like everyone else? I didn't say that. I just happen to be interested in those sorts of things. Plus, you can't start a story without finishing. She paused, took a sip of her martini. Alright, get this. The real reason I wasn't scared was that this serial killer didn't just kill anyone. The 13 people, they all had something in common. She paused again. You gonna tell me? I asked. Just building suspense. A story's no good if you can't tell it right. Well, it's working. What did they have in common? They were all spinsters. Spinsters? You never heard that word before? Should I have? Hmm, I guess not. Now that I think about it, I only ever use that word when I'm telling this story. A spinster is an old woman who's never been married. But it's a bit more than that. It's a kind of sad word. A spinster isn't just unmarried. She's too old for anyone to want to marry her. It's like she missed her chance. What's the word for a male spinster then? doesn't exist. Men never get too old to marry. One of life's little injustices. Anyway, this killer only targeted spinsters, like I said. So I didn't feel like I was ever in danger. Mm -hmm. How old were you then? Around 28, I guess. Not old enough to be considered a spinster, if that's what you're getting at. So at what age do you become a spinster then? Definitely a lot older than 28. But beyond that, no age in particular. Hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? What is? Well, let's say you wake up one day with one wrinkle too many on your forehead, and all of a sudden you're a spinster. One day, you're not a target for the serial killer. The next day, you're a murder waiting to happen. What do you do? Do you marry just for the hell of it, or do you take your chances with the killer? I moved to New York. In a city of 8 million, I'm sure I can meet some lonely sap who doesn't mind a bit of gray hair. Get hitched and move back to Iowa with my peace of mind. Problem solved. Would you ever really move back? Not a chance. And that's got nothing to do with the serial killer either. 700 people is way too small. You understand. Yeah. For me, 1.3 million people is too small. Is that how many people there are in Trinidad? More or less. Although I feel like I've been using that figure for the last 10 years. What about you? Would you go back? Not if I had a choice.
Thank you so much, Brandon. Now, you guys will realize by now that everybody experiences things differently. So, Aliyah has an interesting, very short story for us inside Stand and Deliver. Aliyah, take it away. My silent screams. You slip out of me so easily, noiselessly, painful, voiceless, till I put the pen to paper and the ink becomes my silent teardrops, splattered so formally. It's a miasma of emotions. Silent screams escape as I bawl my eyes out, noiselessly, painful, voiceless. And finally, it is over. I am empty, numb and hollow. My goodbye driven out of me, noiselessly, painful. I think I can't do this again. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. We inside stand and deliver. I hope you guys are having fun. I hope you guys are intrigued and captured by these stories just like I am. Let's head up to the UK. J.A. Lovelock is up next. J.A., take it away. The cane. I remember the first time I was caned. I was barely six years old. I had only been at Rollington Primary for a minute, well, two weeks and some change, when my teacher, Miss Dixon, lashed out at me. She was mad and I was reading. I was always reading. It was and is my favorite thing to do. And as I loved reading so much, I thought I could do it when and where I pleased. I didn't get it that when the teacher is teaching, I should pay attention and not read my book. She had told me to stop it several times before, but I could not help myself. I read on. So this one day, in the hot and humid Kingston heat, she lost it, grabbed the cane and whacked me. We were all shocked all 46 year olds, me, and I think even Miss Dixon herself. The cane came down from a great height and caught me on my right hand and the little finger, the top end of which turned all the colors of the rainbow, red and yellow, pink and green, orange and purple and blue. The immediate sting of the pain was unbearable. This happened just before the afternoon recess. And by the end of the school day, the pain had not changed much. I went home and did the only thing a six year old would do. I told my grandmother. It is generally understood that if at school and the teacher whips you for whatever reason, you never ever go home and tell your parents for fear of getting another walloping. Fortunately for me, at six years old, I didn't know that. So on reaching home, I marched straight up to my grandmother, told her the teacher beat me, and showed her the battered finger. Now, my grandmama was a very mild-mannered and genteel lady, not given to uproar and bad language. I don't recall what she said about a matter of such gravity, if she said anything at all. But the very next day, she was up at the school. She spoke to Miss Dixon in private, so I couldn't tell you what words passed between them. But what I can tell you is that after my grandmama left, Miss Dixon asked some of the older girls to escort me to the ice cream van located at the school gates, whereupon I could have whatever snowball, popsicle, and ice cream 
of any size, price, or quantity of my choosing. Dear reader, I would have loved to tell you that that was the end of my association with the cane. That the cane and I parted company by mutual agreement and no hard feelings. Sad to say, the cane accompanied me up to my final year of primary school and beyond. But let's ignore that for a moment because at the end of that first year at Rollington Primary, I was awarded a book prize for being the best reader in the whole school. The language of women writers must heal. How? How? How do I keep them safe? Canice Jackson, 20 years old, murdered, body dumped. Jasmine Dean, sight impaired U.S. student, abducted, disappeared since 2019. The list is endless. Women and girls raped, bodies burned, mutilated, tossed like rubbish in empty lots. How? How do I keep them safe? And what does it say about our development if despite all our efforts, gender-based violence is on the rise? How do I keep them safe? Perhaps we need to stay in the Kumbala until we can erect walls of protection for every girl and woman. How do I keep them safe? What strategies do I need to employ to end gender-based violence? How does this community of women writers help to do more than shed light on these outrageous crimes? The duppy of Canice Jackson wants to know. The father of Jasmine Dean wants to know. The writer, gender specialist and cultural activist in me wants to know how, how. The voices of Caribbean women writers have gained worldwide recognition and many of us write and illuminate the plights, the inequities, these femicides, these acts of misogyny, these patriarchal crimes that have escalated. So how? How do I make my words heal? How do I turn my words into medicine? How do I make my words have power? beyond the page. Fix those men who beat, punch, berate, then strangle, mutilate, defile, and move around and among us. How do I keep my sisters safe? How do we as a woman's community help to keep all women safe? What is it that we need to do? I am a woman with daughters. I have many friends with daughters. I feel vulnerable, sometimes alone, often fearful. How? Tell me how, what is it I'm not seeing? What else should I be doing? What is it that we all need to do to reduce and eliminate gender-based violence? How? How do I prevent another Canise Jackson from being murdered and body dumped in a lot? How do I keep another three-year-old girl like Novelisa Campbell from being raped, then hacked to death? How do I keep the hundreds and millions of women in Jamaica and Trinidad and Barbados and Antigua and all throughout the Caribbean and the world safe? How do I eliminate femicide? How do I eliminate rape? How do I eliminate rage and fear? How? 
Now more than ever, my words must be powerful to prevent and correct, neutralize, heal and transform. What are the words that I'm struggling for? What are the words that will fix this? Words that transform. How? 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 Some very powerful pieces of insight stand and deliver today. I hope you guys are taking notes. I hope you're paying attention. I'll be able to catch it all. And if not, you can always check it out again right here on the Bookers channel, right? So we inside the NGC Bookers Lit Fest. This is Stand and Deliver. To wrap up things today, let's head across to Barbados and then Guyana. And I'll see you guys again shortly. The old man tugged at my sleeve and asked, How are you, mother? How are you, Ardy? I turned, puzzled, I didn't know any yardy. He was mistaking me for somebody else. You don't remember me, he insisted. I is Nikki. I didn't remember any Nikki. Nikki, the milkman. Well, if you don't remember me, you got to know my sister Brenda then. The tall, thin girl that used to walk so fast. She left and gone away. This, this is 25 years now. I turned to go, but he caught hold of my arm. People are always asking me about she. Boy, I really wish that Brenda would come back home now before it get too late. Get all of that coolness out of she system, you know? Know that she's still real. I still don't understand why she... She didn't feel that she didn't have to, to leave home. Home? My mind wondered, where is home? After that first middle crossing and subsequent crisscrossings, there was no home, only escape. All is the need to find a plane, jump on it and wave. Always jumping from the empty steel pan to the frozen melting pot, running to cut canes, cut corners, pick peaches, pick fears, push baby prams, push anything. Hustling, struggling to gain the world only to feel your soul go up in smoke, cracking your spirit and your cold heart melting nightly and dripping slowly through your eyes. The old man's voice brought me back. She changed. She ain't like one of me no more. She sounds so, so sour upon the phone. She voice ain't pleasant. She language ain't right. I don't believe she'd like to laugh no more. The two of we roll and tumble in the same belly and we go up like one person. Now I can hardly remember she. My recollection gone feeble. I don't want Brenda to come back when I get old and daughter she can't talk to she. And I don't want she to come back freeze up in a box to bury. If she can stay here and live happy when she was alive, when she would want to come back when she died. What good would do she? And uh, what about me, Father Lord? I don't want to wait in the sweet by and by to see my sister again. We regarded each other in helpless communion. I had nothing to offer for I too had fled from the spirit to the flesh. Uprooted and planted in foreign dirt, I had been transformed. I could not feel his emotion. I could not share his pain. While he poured his old soul out, I thought impatiently of my next appointment. Embarrassed, I turned to go. It was nice talking to you, son. Get home safe. I was about to turn the corner when he shouted, Hey, you just here from Radcliffe? But <laughs> I didn't know any Radcliffe. The place was 57 Stanley Town, New Amsterdam. It was about 8 o'clock on Old Year's Night of 1949. 
Four people sat on a sofa in Eric Benfield's lamplit sitting room. With them sat fear, malicious and aggravating, that they might not endure its dreadful countenance. One of them, Eric Benfield himself, put out the flame of the lamp. It was a wrong move, for a gross darkness immediately rushed in and teamed up with fear. Together, the evil pair braced heavily upon the people and so oppressed them that they spoke not a word. Silence at once took opportunity and like a thick smoke filled the room. Someone had to break the silence before it stifled them all to death. 49 years old Kathleen Fullerton did. She said, think we can hang? Eric? Eric Benfield opened his mouth to answer, but the words refused to come out and he was forced to clear his club throat before he said, never the day can you bore punt. Who can stop me? Which power is greater than mine? Everything is covered. Nothing is left exposed. Nobody can swear that they saw a thing. I made sure of that. People will only speculate. But there must be proof beyond reasonable doubt before there can be a conviction. I know law. Kathleen said, I feel better now, Eric. But between me and you, if Milk Lady didn't come at the time she come, everything would have been okay. Eric Benfield, brother to Kathleen Fullerton said, and she made so much noise. She was actually boisterous. She didn't need to be so boisterous. Vulgar woman, a vexation to the spirit. The sudden loud noise threw me off. It also damaged the spiritual process. But if I had just a little bit more time, I could have pulled things right back together. Kathleen said, I know. Benfield said, but what happened is killing me. Halfway is not my style. I like to do things perfectly. I like to complete a job properly. A fine finish, I say. Kathleen said, it's not your fault, Eric. Jeremiah Fullerton, husband to Kathleen Fullerton, squeaked, he's wounded. Have you tell me? He's wounded. Fear was strangling him, and he could barely make the sound of a rap. Kathleen hissed, if you did bring the by like you said you would have, we wouldn't be in this mess. Jeremiah jumped up and fear lost its hold on his throat so that he barely stopped himself from screaming and spoke instead between his teeth. These shit always look good upon somebody else, especially if the somebody is me. Go ahead dear, plaster it, but keep some for put upon Dorothy here. She send away the first sacrifice. Nasa? Now, usually, Friday and Saturday would be our two stand and deliver shows inside the NGC Bocas Lit Fest. However, this year, there have been so many participants, so many people wanting to be a part of stand and deliver, we had to have a third day. So you know what that means? We'll be back tomorrow on Sunday. So which part are you going to be? You're going to be right here with us. My name is Rokas. Thank you so much for being a part of Stand and Deliver today. And I want to encourage you to come back tomorrow. But the day is not done yet. We still have more inside the NGC Bocas Lip Fest. Stick around. Celebrating Caribbean voices and preserving the rich tapestry of our culture. Through literary arts and authorship, we are free to express our vibrance, passion, heritage, and the empowering narratives of our people. As proud title sponsor of the NGC Bocas Lit Fest, we have been honored to support one of the world's acclaimed literary festivals. We celebrate your journey and salute your accomplishments.
Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever, wherever you are in the world and welcome to the NGC Bocas Lit Fest 2021, Making History with Lauren Scott and Lauren Francis Sharma. I am so pleased and get these two books that even though they are historical fiction, still feel very timely, very fresh very much like they're dealing with a lot of the issues that we're still figuring out and, and, and grappling with today. And um, yeah, they're just extremely well-researched, sprawling works of historical fiction. So I'm very happy to introduce you to Lauren Scott and Lauren Francis Sharma. Lauren Scott's book is Dangerous Freedom and Lauren Francis Sharma, Book of the Little Acts. So I'm going to introduce both of them now. I'm going to begin with Lauren. Welcome to you both, first off. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> right. Lauren Francis Sharma is the author of Book of the Little Axe, the 2020 American Library Association's Libraries Transform Book Pick, and the Till the Well Runs Dry awarded the Honor Fiction Prize by the Black Caucus of the American Literary Association. Lauren is a child of Trinidadian immigrants and has written about Trinidad in both her novels. She's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Michigan Law School. Lauren holds a degree in English literature with a minor in African American studies from the University of Pennsylvania and a JD from the University of Michigan Law School. Lauren's more recent work can be found at Barrel House, Electric Lit, The Lily, as well as the anthology Us Against Alzheimer's. Lauren is also a book reviewer for the San Francisco Chronicle, a McDowell Fellow, serves on the board of the Penn Faulkner Foundation, and is the assistant director of Bradlove Writers Conference at Middlebury College. Welcome and thank you very much, Lauren. And now Lauren Scott, who is no stranger to any of us at Bocas, um, I'm sure we've met at some point at a Bocas at some year or other. Um, Lauren Scott is a prize-winning Caribbean novelist and short story writer from Trinidad and Tobago, also a nonfiction writer. He has been awarded and shortlisted for Commonwealth Writers' Prizes, Best Book and Best First Book in Canada and the Caribbean. He was three times nominated for the International Impact Dublin Literary Award. He was once longlisted for the Whitbread Prize and the Booker Prize, and he was awarded the Tom Garland Short Story Award. Academic research has included the Golconda Research Writing Project, a public history project, the recording and transcribing of oral histories from the sugar in Trinidad. He has also researched extensively the life and times of Jean-Michel Casabon, Trinidad's 19th century artist. He is the recipient of a Lifetime Literary Award for his significant contribution to the development of Trinidad and Tobago's literature in recognition of the 50th anniversary of Trinidad and Tobago's independence. He was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 2019. Welcome and thank you very much, Lawrence Scott. So um, what we really want is to hear from these extraordinary novels. So I'm going to ask both writers, I'm starting with Lauren, to introduce her novel to us and read from a bit of it. And then Lauren, I'll ask you to do the same. So I'm gonna sit back and enjoy these two readings. Thank you, Ariana. And Lawrence, it's great to be here with you. I'm very, very pleased to share the screen. Um, so I've written a book, uh, Book of the Little X, um, set between uh, Trinidad and um, in the American West, uh, specifically what will become Montana. Uh, it's uh, dated uh, late 18th century into the uh, early 19th century about a family um, in Trinidad. Um, the protagonist is a, a young girl, uh, Rosa who we see um, makes her way from Trinidad to the American West eventually. Um, so I'm gonna read a little from the uh, Trinidadian parts um, first. It's 1796 and Trinidad has been colonized by the Spanish for over 200 years. The Rendons are a free black family and they farm the land that they own. The father Damas is the most respected blacksmith on the island and he and his wife Myra have three children, Eve, Jeremias and Rosa, who's their youngest. 
Eve was the first to notice the dust clouding the road. Demaster and Don had taught his children that when there was an unrecognizable approach, they, that they were to gather and arm. Mama instructed Rosa to keep an eye on the covered wagon, a type rarely seen outside rainy season. And she urged Eve to ring the bell that hung just over Papa's cane rocking chair. The haze about the wagon was uncertain of clearing and Rosa knew if the wagon drew closer, trouble would be harder to dissuade. She was the next best shot after Papa and Jeremiah. So when Rosa aimed a hundred feet ahead of the wagon, spooking its horses for a loss of 50 yards, it was intended only to be a warning. It's Byron, Papa said, climbing the stone staircase to join them. And cousin Philippe is with him, Eve added. Papa met the men at the palm trees. Rosa watched her uncle and father greet each other with a nod. Words had long been inadequate between them. Ama greeted Tio Byron as he and Papa led the wagon to the mouth of the walking path. Mon frere, she said, and Papa grimaced. He told Mama that he felt it rude when she spoke French with others in his presence. Mama had troops long and hard. Before telling Papa she thought it rude that he thought to say it was rude. Bonjour, Tio Byron held his sister's face. The grip resolved, but gentle. It was an unexpected gesture for the siblings had been at odds since soon after they'd arrived to Trinidad from Martinique at the end of 1783. For boat passage and a 16 acre plot of land, the three brothers, their wives, and Myra, their one sister, all free mulattoes, had sworn allegiance to the Spanish crown, to Pope Pius VI, and to one another. But let the brothers tell it, and Damas Rendon had come between this last and most important alliance. Tio Byron examined Papa's rocker, outfitted with a feather cushion. He seemed to wish for a seat that Papa did not offer, so instead he remained standing, complimenting Eve, the spitting image of Mama, on her beauty and remarking what a big girl Rosa had become. Get inside, all of you, Mama said to the children. Tio Byron fanned himself with his hat, his creamy skin glistening like damp dough, his thin hair lying flat with sweat. I think it's best if Jeremiah sets himself right here, he said. Jeremiah's eyes cast about as if in surprise, while Papa sat upon his rocker, chewing a piece of dry salted bark until Tio Byron turned to Jeremiah, his oldest nephew. I understand you've been spending quite a lot of time at the Degans property. From Rosa's vantage point, Papa showed no sign of irritation, save he removed the bark from his mouth and set it into his shirt pocket. Together you read books, you talk learning man's things, isn't that so? And sometimes it's not just you and Degan sitting at Le Grand table, sometimes you have a guest, oui? Papa stood now and Rosa swore she could see the rod in Papa's back straight and hard. Say what you say in Byron, Papa said. Tio Byron scraped the soles of his boots upon the veranda. Rosa remembered when Mama told her how Tio Byron in Martinique, in Martinique had earned money playing the fiddle on the veranda for guests of the monsieur who owned the land where they worked. Mama had spoken of Tio Byron with such admiration that Rosa had asked if she too could learn to play the fiddle. Mama told her fiddles were only for boys. Rosa remembered wondering how it was that boys had become so fragile that everything seemed to be set aside for them. Now Tio Byron turned to Jeremiah once more. Sometimes you come all the way to my home and you just pick up Francine so you and she can spend time with the Gans, isn't that so? Jeremiah, with his right shoulder to the window, latched his thumbs about his braces. And sometimes you and she talk about your futures, isn't that so? There's nothing wrong with that, Jeremiah said. Your future together? Papa moved Tio Byron, moved toward Tio Byron. He stood a few inches shorter than Jeremiah's now, but Papa's shoulders were more squared, as if he'd been chipped from something more solid. Byron, what's this you saying? Papa took a step toward Tio Byron. Francine is now with child. Your Jeremiah has made certain promises and I intend to ensure he keeps them. Papa's shoulders drooped. Rosa was certain of it, but quickly they firmed again, as if remembering their solid roots. Mama on the other side of Jeremiah sucked in her breath. Jeremiah, is this true? No, I took her there to talk. We didn't, I didn't make any promises. Eve arrived then with two mugs full of sorrel. Tio Byron snatched his and Philippe's share from the tray, 
downing the contents in seven crude gulps. Byron, you wash down your drinks, so be on your way, Papa said. We'll be in touch. I know you think of yourself as a man of integrity, Damas, but I know different. And I come to make sure my gal has the future that Gasson here promised. This is not about my boy and Francine, Papa said. This is about two families, and I'm the head of this family. Une famille de masse. You believe us to be separate. This has always been the problem. Take your leave, Byron. We'll be in touch. What I can seem to get from Francine is how exactly Gosson here convinced her he would make things right. Francine is 15, Byron. She's practically a woman, Mama said. And Jeremiah is a big boy. Look at him. Papa said himself before Jeremiah as though he would not permit an assessment of the boy's size. I'm asking him to be a proper man, Byron said. You can't ask a boy of 12 years to be a man, Papa said. He snatches my Francine and takes her where he chooses. He's certainly a man. He kidnapped her. Is that what you're accusing him of now? Even if she went willingly, it didn't give him the right to, I've done nothing, Jeremiah said, moving beside Papa. He was a small boy again, malleable, compliant, Damas' son, if only for that one moment more. We had a quarrel and we stopped speaking. A lover's quarrel, we, Tio Byron said. Papa held Jeremiah's hand, reminding Rosa of the way male frogs kept their tadpoles protected in their mouths. Walk with Francine next time you come, Papa said to Tio. I want to hear this story from that mouth of hers. As a matter of fact, I'll bring she now. Tio Byron and Philippe moved toward the wagon. The five Rendons watched Tio Byron instruct Philippe to unveil the cloth covered wagon. Rosa rose to the tips of her toes, mouth agape as Tio hoisted Francine from the wooden bed. Her long dark hair, sweaty and creased, pasted to the gauze swathing her pale neck. Tio Byron lugged her by the arms, tilting her torso so that she might be posed across the lip of the wagon to display her shrouded wrists. Come now and talk to your Byron, shouted from below. See what your boy has caused my girl to do to herself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button for a second. Thank you very much, um, Lauren. I mean, Lauren. Lawrence. <laughs> On to you, thank you. Hello. Hi, Lawrence. Hi, hi. Tell us a little bit about your novel and can you read for us okay. from a bit of it, please? My book is called Dangerous Freedom. It's about a real historical character who is known as Dido Bell. There's a famous portrait of her that we know as the Elizabeth Murray portrait, used to be known as Elizabeth Murray and a Negress, or Elizabeth Murray and her maid, but it's now known as Elizabeth Murray and Dido Bell. And she lived at Kenwood House, which is very close to where I live, um, with Lord and Lady Mansfield. She was put there by her father, John Lindsay, who was a naval officer in the New World in Florida, in the port of Pensacola, where he met Dido's mother, Maria Bell, um, and had Dido there as a, a child. And then they come to London. Um, my story moves between the present, a present, and a past. The present is Dido has now left Kenwood House, and she is married to John Davinier, and she's living with her three sons and a housekeeper, Lydia and Lydia's brother in Pimlico, a part of London in the South. Um, and she is looking back on her life as a child, as a young girl and as a young woman. Um, so we move between the present and the past. The present is Elizabeth Davinier and the past is Dido Bell. I'm gonna read from the very beginning because that kind of sets up the book a bit. At this time of her life, Elizabeth Davinier was living in a modest house on Ranley Street. It was the winter of 1802 and the last of autumn lingered in the fallen leaves. Another war was stirring. She felt that she was in a fortunate state, though not with all her freedoms. 
many of those had been threatened or never given. But nevertheless, she was satisfied now with her husband and her sons and mostly occupied with her memories, which on evenings came gently as evenings could. She recalled when she was a small girl swaying in a hammock in a different climate with its brief sunset, her mother telling her the story of her life. It's four years since you're born on your father's ship. We up and down the islands. Remember the year, child, 1761. You're going to have to write it down one day. The ribbons of light then were mixed with the shadows on the pitch pine floor of the porch. They swung to and fro in a silence filled with the breaking of the waves on the nearby shore and the scratching sound of palm branches in the breeze. A long, long time ago as her mother would say in her sing-song voice. That was in Pensacola, the British port in Florida. It was a geography her father had taught Elizabeth with his maps, pointing to where he had bought her mother from the auction block and then put her in his house, which was on the front with the tall ships moored between the shore and Santa Rosa Island. Light was different here, on Ranley Street, not far from the banks of the River Thames, where the creeks, water meadows and marshes lay just beyond the streets of Pimlico, choked in spring and summer with nettles. It had been her home for these last eight years. What was even more different now was her name, that she was called Elizabeth or Lizzie by her husband, John. He would keep to formalities in public, calling her Mrs. Davinier. But he called her Lizzie when he greeted her with kisses and cuddles, whispering Lizzie, Lizzie, Lizzie darling, like a young lover. How sweet it was now to have his name in marriage, a proper surname, a real name, a free name, not that silly name Dido, not that slave name. Her sons called her mama. She was fortunate. She had to keep telling herself, despite the loss of her mother. Some of her more gentle memories and her mother's stories of Pensacola were filled with names, just sounds now, like those of the birds that sang in the trees, Creek and Chickasaw, Choctaw, and the name that made them laugh aloud, almost falling out of the hammock, chief cowkeeper. Elizabeth listened more intently when her mother started to tell a harder story. We find them people here when we reach by boat and they drop the anchor in the harbor. We so exhausted, so starved and thirsty and not daring to think that we might step upon land again them chains, such a part of we limbs, that not to have them shackled to each other, to our ankles and to the boards, don't seem usual and ordinary at all when we come to stand upon the dry ground and have to walk, stumbling like we are custom on the deck of that terrible ship. Elizabeth enjoyed making up her mother's voice. She wrote it as she heard her speak, to find her on her tongue was to keep her close. To try it on the page was to keep her even closer and not to lose her ever. She had promised to keep on writing and to send for her. Elizabeth never found out why her mother had stopped writing after only one letter, despite all the letters she herself had written. Dearest Mommy, had she been recaptured? It remained a mystery, despite the many inquiries Elizabeth had made over the years. When she had asked her father on his infrequent visits, he always answered, soon, my pet. Then she had asked her master, the Lord Mansfield, and his wife, Lady Betty, and then above all, Beth, her master's great niece, her sometimes childhood companion. They had all evaded her question. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Lawrence. To, I think you've both chosen very, very interesting places to, to begin, to introduce um, listeners to these books, um, very intriguing moments um, of, of, of change and of, of transformation for both these characters. And, and for Dido, this is where we first meet her. And this is where she begins we have this sense that her entire life is driven by this question of why did mother never write? Why have I not heard from her? What has happened to her? And, you know, for Lauren's novel, you have this whole question of we meet a family about to be split or, or, or facing this particular challenge where splits that perhaps were already there are about to be really, really sort of ripped open. So thank you very much for, for those two readings. I wanted to ask you both, what drew you to these stories? How did you come across these stories to begin to want to even work them into the fiction? Laura, um, Lawrence, you said that um, the, the painting, I'm sure, was a very, is a painting that we all sort of no one would have heard about, but what is it about Dido's story that drew you to want to write about her again? Well, in a very kind of obvious way, I live very close to Kenwood House and I walk there and I visit. It's a wonderful house to visit, it has a marvelous um, art exhibition. It now has a copy of the famous portrait which is actually the original is in Schoon Palace in Scotland. But the story has been there actually, uh, she appears in a long poem of mine in 1995. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was re researching my novel, Aylred Sin, um, where there is a portrait also, the portrait of the Duke of Somerset with a black boy and a dog looking up at the Duke. Um, it's a kind of portrait that Dido's portrait evokes, but Dido's portrait is slightly different and it's something mm -hmm. we can talk about at some point. Um, but the story has been there for a long time with me. And you know, when we hear the story of Dido, we don't hear the story of Dido. We hear the right. story of Lord Mansfield and we hear the Mansfields and Kenwood House. And then we hear Dido was a black aristocrat. And it's like a bit of a fantasy in a way. Um, and even in the remarkable film, Belle, which Ama Asante made, which I enjoyed, she is romanticized, I think. It's a kind of Jane Austen um, story, costume drama. Um, we are dealing with marriage. Um, so I wanted to give this silent character a voice. And you know, she lived on, she lived on with the Mansfields for years, with Mr. Lord Mansfield in particular, looking after him and then had her own children and so on. So I wanted to bring all that out, not this strange character in the portrait. We can talk about that later maybe. And it's nice to meet you, Lauren. I hadn't um, said that before. And nice to meet you, Ayana. Um, Thank good. you very much. Both, so Lauren, in your case, I remember I read an interview and you mentioned coming across the figure, the historical figure of Edward Rose or someone that, that if not was exactly like how you have him in the book, inspired by um, this historical figure. So I wondered if you also had a similar moment where this character was sort of, this, this person was sort of living with you for a while or how you possibly came to write about this time period. Yeah, um, I did come across Edward Rose, um, who uh, Rosa ends up marrying later on in her life. Um, but he wasn't the first person that sort of I, I stumbled upon. Um, my imagination actually brought me to, to Rosa first. After I um, after I wrote my first novel, uh, To the Wall Runs Dry, I had a lot of people, um, particularly here in, in the U.S., asking me questions about sort of why I had such a diverse cast of people, you know, what is mm. it about this island? You know, they have 
all these people from all these different places. And, um, and it got me really thinking about how um, people outside Trinidad don't really understand Trinidad's history. So I sort of knew that I wanted to touch upon that at some point in some book. Um, and I, strangely enough, was listening to um, uh, Willie Nelson, who's a country Western star. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, he was being interviewed and um, and I began to think about, you know, my parents and, you know, and how they they listen to country Western music. And that came, you know, from living in Trinidad and having country Western music being on the radio. And so um, I began thinking about my childhood and Westerns and watching Westerns. And um, and I really began to think like, oh, I wonder, you know, um, what were black people doing at this time, you know, and, and, right. and so I, I picked up um, Dr. Eric Williams, one of his books, and I just sort of thumbed through it. And because um, I had this idea of this girl living in this house and some land in Trinidad. And, um, and as I was going through his book, I realized, oh, yes, you know, indeed, there could actually be free black people living um, in Trinidad at this time. And I began to dig and explore more. And I knew I was going to tell a story that connected the United States or what would become the United States um, to Trinidad. Um, but when I found Edward Rose, that's when I knew how it was going to happen. Edward Rose was um, a black man who um, who'd been who lived and was raised with uh, the Native American tribe, the Crow Crow Indians, up in um, in Montana and. Um, and I knew when I met him uh, in on paper that I was going to have Rosa meet him uh, at some point. And so the, then the next question becomes, how is that going to happen? <laughs> and that's the thing that becomes so fascinating about about your book. You know, you as a reader, you begin and you, you know, I'm not going to, I'm trying not to have spoilers. It's going to be really hard, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, you begin and you wonder how on earth earth do these people meet? How has this woman ended up with these people? How, how has she made this, this journey, this trek across, across the world at this point as not an enslaved person? And this is the thing that I find very interesting about both, um, both your protagonists. These are people who are very much of their time, but sort of anomalies or for us as modern readers would seem to have been anomalies in their time. I think, you know, our, our grasp of, of history is, you know, sometimes a little bit wonky where we think, okay, this, this everything began in slavery and then there's, there's, there's slavery and then there's post-slavery and there's pre-slavery, but there's no, not enough a sense of maybe the in-between ways that not just black people, but even your other characters who are, um, white and Native American mixed race people, you know, in, in Lawrence's book, you have people who are free coloreds, who are white abolitionists, all these people living in these in-between spaces. I wonder if you could both talk about um, just the process of research and, and finding these anomaly characters that populated both your novels. Uh, Lawrence, I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that um, for me, the voids in our history was actually a great opportunity. Uh, you know, when I was going through um, Dr. Eric Williams' books, um, you know, there's some census material that I come across. You know, sort of letters from um, from from colonial colonialists um, writing back home to Europe. Um, their census materials that sort of outline, you know, the number of free black people, the number of coloreds, the number of um, enslaved Africans, and so on and so on. Um, but the only people that were telling the stories, their stories, were the were the white men who were who were writing back home, and um, and I thought, well, these people are here, the numbers are here, so where where are their stories? And you know, I I don't know whether they wrote them or not, but it would it was really an opportunity then for me to um, sort of you know I, I call it sort of critical imagination, but um, but this this sense that. They exist and they must have stories. So um, let me let me see if I can if I can um, create this story for them. But but more than that, you know what I also realized in my own research, um, and I and I, I noticed this with Lawrence as well, is that people are moving about quite a bit in this part. Of, you know at this time, you know it, it's not just you know white men who are moving, but 
human beings are moving, they're resettling, they're, they're finding different places and encroaching on other people's spaces and all of that, all of that's happening. And it's not just the people that we've become accustomed to reading about in, in the history books who are moving. Um, and, and so I use that as a, a great launching point for me because the possibilities were endless then. I could totally imagine, and I'm sure Lawrence, you found, you found the same thing. Yes, I mean, my story, I think, because my story is such a kind of established story, or some people think they've established a story right. which has been repeated all the time. I was very, and I'm intrigued by the story because it's a very conflicted story. You know, I think this young girl growing up in this family, you know, her, Lord Mansfield is not a monster, but he is neither a revolutionary. <laughs> And he's neither the sort of person who brought about abolition, which sometimes there are claims for. So there are a lot of conflicts. The, the actual portrait is a conflicted portrait, I think, because Dido is um, wearing a lot of the, if you'd like, um, features of many of those other portraits of black portraiture in the 18th century. You know, she's wearing a turban and she's a very telltale feature. She's carrying a bowl of fruit which most of the enslaved children in the other pictures mm -hmm. are carrying. Why? I don't know what David Martin, the artist, really was trying to concoct. And I, she has a view of herself, of course, in this novel. Um, so that is, it's, the research is there in a way, a story has been given to me, but I have to go, maybe like Toni Morrison says, you have to go to a site and you find these fragments some of them are quite established fragments and people tell you that's the story, but there are all these other fragments and then you have to invent and you have to imagine. I mean, most of my book is an invention. It's, it's mm -hmm. imagined, it's not the story. Um, and that is what, I think that is my purpose in a sense with all my novels, it's about people who return to places who've been away and come back people go somewhere to unearth something and that's what I've wanted to do with my research um, but connected with what Lauren is saying it is about the telling of stories yes mm. I mean I was just reading about Lauren's book my apology is again I haven't read Lauren's book but reading about it it is the stories right and without any spoilers I mean it's going to be the mother's stories that are going to be quite extraordinary in this book um, but there is a story that Dido, Elizabeth, and now Elizabeth Davigny is trying to tell. And as Lauren was saying, it's white men who have been giving all these stories. Mm -hmm. the, and with Dido, it's a white artist. You know, a, a, a painting is not a photograph. Um, it's a construction. Um, right. Why is she constructed in this way? Why is she so othered, exoticized, sexualized um, in the way which her cousin is so beautifully um, settled in her, in, 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 you know, in the clothes of her, of, of her time. There's a fascinating, I got, stop me if I'm talking too much, Ayana, but- um, No, I was about to say, I love the way you handled that. I love the way you handled Elizabeth's reaction to seeing herself framed in this way. She almost like, who is this person? Yes, yes. Who is that person? Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's a fascinating mm -hmm. thing where a designer who makes dresses in paintings and wear, tries to wear them. And it's a called A Stitch in Time on the BBC. Wonderful program. Mm. And she tries to make this dress and they decide that Dido's dress can't be made. It's oh, actually gosh. a costume. It's a bit of a, something from a dressing a box or something like mm -hmm. that. You know? And it's a charade, you know, it's a kind of pretense, yeah. And in so many ways, I think that's the, I mean, you're both writers of historical fiction generally, not, not just with these novels. And I'm sure there is always that, that impulse you've both spoken about to say, look it, let, let's, let's set the record straight or let's assume the record that we've been given is not straight and sort of figure out, okay, you know, where are the gaps? Where are the bends? Where are the parts that we have not explored or have not looked at? And um, one of the things that I, I was really, really drawn to with both 
your novels is that, you know, when you have this huge expanse, in either of your novels, you could have, you could have come into the story at many different points, right? Um, Lawrence, you could have started chronologically and had Dida was a little girl coming, but instead you chose, okay, I've chosen a time to enter this novel. And it's 1802, if I, if I remember incorrectly. And Lauren, the same, you've chosen a particular time, even though they both kind of go back and forth in time, but there's still a point that you have to enter the established historical record. And I wonder how you felt or how you went about balancing narratives where parts of the story are fixed because they're history and then working with where is unfixed or where you're challenging or pushing back on. Is that too long a question? <laughs> no, no, no. I, it's actually a really good question because um, because that that that's the challenge and also the exciting part I think about working with historical fiction is there there are fixed parts of it. Um, you know, when I came into thinking about this book, <clears throat> I wasn't sure how I was going to sort of incorporate you know, um, the, the British coming to, to Trinidad and, 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 you know, but I knew I had to be in 1797, right? I knew that that was the year that was going to be an important year. So mm -hmm. would I start in 1796? Would I start, where was I going to start? Um, and, and much the same um, <clears throat> with, uh, with the parts of my, my novel set in, um, set in the U.S., um, one of the other characters who is a real life character is, um, is, is David Thompson, who um, out west in, in the United States, sort of Idaho, um, part of, 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 of the country, um, he's a very famous explorer. And he left a, a huge um, collection of sort of um, botanist drawings and, um, and uh, you know, just a, a long record of his travels sort of from Canada um, to, the, to the Western parts of the United States. Um, and so I used that record as a way to help one of my characters sort of ground themselves. Same thing with, um, with Edward Rose, who I knew lived at a certain time. So everything sort of had to meet at certain points. And, and it was like putting together a puzzle, um, but it, it felt, to me, like a gift in some respects, that I had these markers um, that I could right. work around, um, and so you know, then the research became to came to fill in those what's happening in the world at this time, um, you know, what's going on before then that might have affected, you know, one of the one of the things that I mentioned would, was what happened in 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 Haiti, right, and and before um, everything takes place in Trinidad, there's this very um, huge effect. And, the, and, and when we talk about the Haitian Revolution, we don't often speak about the ripple effect it had, not just in the Caribbean, but in Europe. What's happening in Europe when this thing takes place? You know, the French are horrified, the English are nervous, everybody's very unsettled by this. And it really, really shook, um, it shook the colonial powers and it had an, an, an immense effect on, um, on freedom for, for black people later on later on. So there were so many pieces of history that, you know, there's, there's this weaving process that, that happens. But, um, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, I, I, I love Hilary Mantel and she, um, she's, you know, one of my favorite writers and she often, you know, sort of talks about sort of following the facts. But when you're talking about people who are generally forgotten in the facts, um, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of work that one must do in order to sort of um, be able to create these stories. I mean, we know that people are there and yet they're not in the historical record. There are no facts in some respects to build around. And so um, so really it's much more than just weaving. <laughs> there's 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 literally cotton making, right? Like I'm yes. pulling cotton off and you actually make creating the thread. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I agree, Lawrence. Yeah, I agree with Lauren. You see, I think it's a, it's a truth they're trying to get at, another right. truth which is not in the history. Um, and again, that's a Toni Morrison thought, um, which has influenced me there as well. But the time, yeah, times are set, dates are very important, mm -hmm. but um, it's the age of enlightenment and the slave trade is still going on. Mm -hmm. The revolutions are all around us. 
at that period as well. Um, so all that was important. But my book started in a different kind of way. It was a very different sort of book. It was written in the first person to start with. Um, and it was called The Testament of Elizabeth de Vignier. Um, and she tells the whole thing in a much more linear way, um, in a sense. And it didn't work for me. But what it, mm -hmm. and it didn't work for someone who helped me with the beginning of the book. Um, but it made me enter Dido in a way, and Elizabeth in particular, um, by speaking in her voice. I, I found a note in a, in a 2014 notebook the other day of Elizabeth. It, it, it's not in the novel, actually. It's Elizabeth talking. Um, it, you know, I had to, Margaret Busby asked me the other day, how did you enter this woman like this? How did you enter the story in that way? And it, it, I think writing it in the first person to start with really, really helped mm -hmm. me there. But um, so, yes, I think coming back to an earlier question, it's the research is very important, but actually right. it is the, the coming out of the research into what you really want to do, which is to free this person who has not been heard in history. I, I'm repeating myself there a little bit. She hasn't been heard. We have all these views very forcibly repeated over and over. And that's what's happening here in England at the moment, where somebody like David Oroshoga, the historian, mm -hmm. is saying, you know, these houses, these great houses, they must tell their histories. They must allow those histories to come out, you know. But just for a moment, I'd like to go back to something with Lauren. It was exciting for me, you know, to discover how how important the free colored and free black people were in Trinidad. I never knew very much about that history. And I, in researching Casabon, you know, how exciting it was to discover this whole community. For me, it was all around San Fernando where I had grown up myself. I mean, Corinth Estate, which the Casabons owned was just across from where I grew up in Pitimon. Um, it was wonderful to discover that history. And I was given the opportunity to research French Creoles. Well, I knew French Creoles very well. My mother came from a white French <laughs> family. So, but these were not the French Creoles I was going to research, you know. And it was, again, that history has not been, you know, free mulatto, when that was written, for instance, um, that was somebody making their voice heard, saying to the English, we, our voices need to, be, need to be heard. The laws need to change. Um, so that's really what we're about. I don't consider myself a historical novelist. I consider myself somebody who goes to a certain site and is inspired, inspired by stories. And I want to tell the story. I want to tell the story, particularly of the one who hasn't been heard. Yeah, the silent one, the silenced one. The silenced, yes. One of the things that I found really interesting too about both your novels is that as much as, and I think that's the mark of when you know the research is on point and when the world is really rich, is I also find, found myself wondering about, so for instance, every time um, in, in your novel, Lawrence, I'm wondering, gosh, but there, there are all these mentions of other Black people in London at that time, in varying states of freedom and freedom, some of whom are enslaved and have run away, some of whom are in this quasi-free state where they might be domestic servants and houses. They're not supposed to technically be enslaved, but they are. And it's a similar thing that I wondered about with, with Lauren's novel, that if there was a Rosa, then are there others? Who else? Who else are we not seeing? And once you, and one of the things about these two novels is once you open that door, that it changes your entire concept of what was happening in these places that we've assumed that we knew so very well. We assume we know London. We assume we know the American West. The American West has figured so strongly in so much of Caribbean fiction, but through a Hollywood sort of trajectory by the time it reaches us. How do you see, I wonder how you feel about that, just, you know, to know that 
I'm not just, it's not just this, this character that I've, I've developed or I've written about, but you're opening entire worlds and for other writers to even say, oh gosh, I could do that. I could write about that. I never thought that I had liberty <laughs> to even explore. How do you feel about that? Uh, <laughs> that's the goal. I think that's the goal, right? I mean, like um, the, what, you, what I always want to do is to make my reader question and to make them go and find more information for themselves. Um, I, I love that part about reading myself. I love that part. That's the, it's the learning of reading that, um, that, that makes it so exciting. I'm learning something new from this book and now I want to know more. I had, um, you know, I've had a number of people say that to me, not just um, about, you know, sort of the American West, but also, you know, my own father, you know, he's, you know, he's reading the parts in Trinidad and he's like, I, you know, I didn't know some of this. Um, and, um, and I felt like, yeah, you know, I, I feel um, very proud, um, but also sort of sad that it's, <laughs> that it's taken this long to, um, for someone, I mean, I, you know, I don't particularly think that, um, that I've created anything new. I, 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 you know, I've, I've linked what seems like a very natural progression of a human being's life. Um, but the fact that, um, that it hadn't been done before, at least I think it hadn't been done before, mm -hmm. um, speaks to how, um, how daunting and how, how, um, I don't, how oppressive the, the ways that we're, we are taught um, can be to our, to our imaginations and to our minds. And mm -hmm. so, um, so to imagine that, um, that there were, you know, black people out West, isn't that, isn't that, a, it's not a big stretch because indeed they were on the land. And indeed, why wouldn't there be, <laughs> why wouldn't there be? And that's, and it, that's exactly what I kept asking myself. Like I kept thinking I'm writing this book. I know it sounds strange, but why, why not? Why not? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a part in my story where, um, where Rosa has to actually leave, she, she's leaving the island. And um, I began to find research about the ships that were coming into Trinidad. And there was a revolution happening in Mexico at the time. And people were sending goods from Trinidad to Mexico to support this guerrilla revolution. And so the ships were moving. If the ships are moving, someone's on the ship. Someone's on the ship. Things are on the ship. And so, um, so it just, you know, it just, oh, there were so many opportunities, uh, so many opportunities that were, that, that, that were brought out by, by very small slivers of, of, of information that I gleaned from, from research. Um, and, and I, as I said before, and I'm repeating myself now, but, you know, this, this, it, it really, really was, was a, a wealth of, um, of opportunities created, um, you know, in, in the research, so. Lawrence, I'm sure you found the same thing. As I said, when you start to look for the Black presence in London, it's almost like, well, how did I not see it before? They're everywhere. Yeah. We're everywhere. Some of that history is there, and that is interesting mm. to, to explore. And it has been told by, some of it has been told by historians. But, you know, listening mm. to Lawrence speaking about her character made me feel, well, maybe I didn't take... I was wondering about Maria Bell, you know, the life I was giving to her, because she, she is not, I, I am not hampered by history with her. I have to invent her. We know very little about her. That was her. the next question I was going to ask and you. I so have got a very good. Big, big chance with her, I think. <laughs> And somebody said, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. And now listening to Lauren, you know, she's taken, she's taken this woman all the way, you know, where she's taken her and mm -hmm. whom she's married and the whole life and the story she has to tell her son and all of this stuff. Um, yes, I am. I was stuck with my book. I was stuck mm -hmm. with my book until I discovered Maria Bell's voice not the voice of london the london voice i found was fine but what was i going to do with her what was i going to do with her when she went back to pensacola because yeah. that's not a big hit that's not a big um, secret in a way the fact that she goes back mm -hmm. um what was i going to do and what was she going to find there and what was she going to do with herself and nobody here is going to tell anybody about that tonight but uh <laughs> or a lot of no it. spoilers no spoilers you know and it was wonderful to be released into her voice, really. 
And as you say, a frontier woman, uh, you, you mentioned that as a sort of comparison mm -hmm. with Lauren. Um, and that was very freeing. And once I found her voice, um, her voice back there, um, the book really moved on then at that point, you know? The, That's what the, I find fascinating, how when we, when we talked about this earlier, Lawrence, that um, historical fiction, you think it's about the facts, but it's so much about imagination as well. And as you just mentioned, how just, how Maria Bell, and, and, and just for, for listeners, Maria Bell as Dido's, Dido Elizabeth's mother, she opens up a whole range of, 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 of possibility in this novel, very similar to how, to Rosa's life. They've, they both lead these very, I hesitate, I'm not gonna use the word free, but neither, their lives don't follow the course that history wanted to set for them. Mm. And they find they find lives outside of, 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 in spite of their varying states of unfreedom. Is that, that might be too clumsy a way of saying it, but. No, I agree with, I mean, you see Maria Bell, we hear about her and it's, there's it one sentence, she died. Right. <laughs> she died. And they, she died. I, we didn't even know for a, a long time whether how long she had spent in London. That was again quite a quick affair. It happens mm -hmm. like that in the film Bell. You you don't see her at all. That you know, no, Dido doesn't ask about her mother. A child of mm -hmm. five being put with these people. Impossible uh, for her not to her ask. Mother about is her mother. so central to me. You know, this longing for her mother, um, mm -hmm. and she now a mother you know, with her three sons um, is such a central thing for me. But I was always so shocked Maria Bell died. And, you know, we are lucky that actually somebody, an archaeologist in Pensacola, has begun to discover things about her. Uh, we don't know, there may be a whole other story. But um, so out of those fragments, again, it's coming to a site and you have these fragments and how do you imagine, how do you invent from them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was, that to me is the, is, the, is the heart of the book really, in a sense, this longing for the mother and who the mother turns out to be. Really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You won't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, no, but both of these books um, are really interesting to me in that they are stories being told by the children, essentially, and um, and the and the mothers are leaving their stories behind to help create a sense of identity for these for these characters. Um, and I think you know, to me, that those those are it's a wonderful thread between these two books. And there's that, that longing. <laughs> Sorry, Ayana. No, I just said I think I was. It, it's it's almost heartbreaking. Not almost heartbreaking. It, it is heartbreaking. The fact that both. These, these, these young women, it, the ways in which they are denied, denied them, it, it, for Dido, denied her mother in a lot of ways, or the question of what happened to her mother, what happened to her mother. And for Rosa, never feeling, I suppose, that she quite lived up to whatever is that sort of feminine ideal that her mother so you know, so represented. And that, that's a whole other dimension that we haven't even talked about really with um, both these novels, just the, these, um, these tight laced gender constructions <laughs> and both the characters sort of find themselves having to, having to fit into, you know? So which is why I think it's so great when you have a character like, like Maria Bell, who, as you said, Lawrence, she died. <laughs> the way you, you've presented her represents a whole different possibility for how a woman could have lived at that time. Yes. Which I think is, is amazing. And also, um, you see, mm -hmm. sorry, yeah, no, just very quickly, the same for Dido, the Dido Bell we uh, keep hearing about. Um, by making her um, a woman with her children in an ordinary home with her husband, and she's not well, yes. uh, you know, I just felt, I, 
I just found that there, there's, there are some other portraits of her, you know, verbal portraits. The, mm -hmm. the governor of Massachusetts has a portrait of her. You know, a black came into the room. He was visiting Mansfield at yes. the time. I mean, we, with this book, we have tried to make a different portrait. And this portrait is um, triggered, um, suggested by Phyllis Wheatley, the African American poet. Um, and who, as Margaret Busby was telling me the other day, was in London. She's a contemporary of Dido's, you know, and her book is being Look published. At that. Yes. Um, mm. Now, you know, it's very difficult when you're writing a book to have, she can't be meeting everybody, you know, <laughs> she can't be. Mm. And what's going to be clunky and what isn't, you know, already have a meeting allowed, a Equiano. Um, so I had to be careful. Um, but Phyllis Wheatley is there and publishing her first book of poems in London. And the poet, and when, you know, I feel this is closer to Dido than Mark, David Martin's portrait, really. Yeah. Your presentation of Dido, she is, she's, there's a quiet, thoughtful, um, you know, woman who is worried about her children. Educated. You know, educated, genteel. Quote unquote, I don't, I don't like to use those words, but that's very much anti the sort of saucy, um, exactly. you know, sexualized yes. version in the in the, the painting of her. Yeah, and it was Bridget Brereton, the Trinidad um, Caribbean mm. historian, who told me that in my Casabon book, where the character Augusta mm -hmm. is, um, she said, you know, you got her right. She is the belle of the house. Very often the mulatto woman was the bell. Mm. She was there mm -hmm. either as a mistress of the master or in the house available. You know, mm. and there were people who thought that, that Dido was there in Mansfield's house. For Lord Mansfield. For him. But there is no evidence of that. And I, I didn't want to write that. Mm. But it's kind of suggested by people. Um, yeah. And that's why I bring in the Hal character. You know, she... She was protected at, at Kenwood and in Bloomsbury House. But, you know, she was a black woman and um, she would have been more vulnerable and open to quite a lot of interference. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I, oh, sorry, Ayanna, were you, I, I didn't. No, I was going to bring you in, Lauren. <sighs> well, I was just thinking, um, you know, it was, it's interesting to me that when stories are being told, um, particularly about black people in history, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it feels almost as if you have to question these, right? I mean, like Lawrence just mentioned that, um, that she, you know, there's, there's no evidence to suggest she was the bell in Lord Mansfield's house. And yet there's some suggestion that there might be, you know, when, um, when I ran across my, my research for Edward Rose, um, he was considered to be a scoundrel. Um, and yet, right. um, and yet, the the European explorers were coming back to him over and over again to take them out west. So if you don't trust this man, if you think he's a scoundrel and he's going to, then why continue to take him? And so we were constantly having to ask ourselves these questions, even when there are people of color in this you in the history we must ask ourselves is this a is this an accurate is depiction? this a reliable is this true um, yeah is this a reliable depiction of of who they are um and so you know it just it, it really um there's a there's a lot of investigation in in the in the writing and a lot of questioning um in in the even in the research when you're given the research you must then question it particularly if yes. writers of such history have a hist have, have a long standing um, <laughs> tendency to um, to a pro problems think. with the truth problems yes. with the truth well, let, let's, let's I think that's a very very good place for I mean unfortunately you know we never we start these conversations and we never have enough time because we can talk about about these novels for for many many hours I want to thank Lauren and Lawrence and Bocas for facilitating such a wonderful conversation. These are amazing books. Go out and get them. Give them to your friends. Give them to your enemies. They will be, they will be better for it. <laughs> Thank you so much. One last word from either of you before we sign out. No, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, You're it was totally wonderful welcome. to meet Lauren and to hear about her book. 
And I said he could go and try and get it. I hope I can get it in England now. Yes. Soon, if not, if not just yet. Thank you very much, Bocas. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Please stay tuned for the other items on the festival. The program is up. Find on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. We have lots more. Stay tuned with us for the NGC Bogus Lit Fest. Thanks to everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>
in the midst of the attack now. It was like a bad dream. Anya felt like she was lost in this crazy sea of people. There was so much noise and fire, sweaty, oily bodies wriggling to the beat of the pants and this was blowing. A man suddenly staggered in front of her and she gasped, letting go of her father's hand. When she recovered from her fright, she looked around and realized that a band of dancing revelers had taken her father away. She was in the dark with strangers, devils, and noise with no father in sight. And here ran in the direction of the passing ban in search of her father. She stumbled and fell. As she looked up, she saw blue devils with red mugs and jab jabs. She closed her eyes, hoping to shut out the fear. When she opened her eyes, she saw her father and ran to him. She hugged him and looked up. A strange man looked surprised and asked, Are you lost? We are your parents. She stammered and slipped away from him. She remembered the band around her wrist and what her father had told her about finding a police officer should she get lost. She began looking for a police officer. While looking for the officer, she saw her aunt who was covered in mud and oil except for her face. Auntie! She bawled. Her aunt pulled Andy to her asking, Why are you alone? Anya shouted over the music, telling her what had happened. Her aunt told her to stay with her and her father would find them. Anya's father had found a police officer and they were walking through the crowd looking for her. When they found her, Anya was covered in pain, dancing with her aunt. Anya ran to her father and they hugged, getting pain all over him. They danced together as the sun began to rise. Juve was not so scary after all. It was fun. My mother had pride. Understand what I say when I say pride. She refused to have us ride in free buses to go to school. Now you might call my mother a fool, but buses to her meant embarrassment and suffering. Because she was squanched up with about two 
much children in the bus station. So it was the bouquet of hungry breaths, danger of heads, mixed with perspiration, fused with the atomic scent for growing resentment of foreign ownership and equitable distribution of wealth. <laughs> nah. Forget all that freedom health. That scent was just Miss Betsy's daughter taking off her shoes in the bus. And Miss Betsy's daughter had this American pair of shoes in the village of Kumana. So them shoes used to be smelling high like an American pair of soldiers on top Salvatore Center watching down at the middle class. Miss Betsy used to give her daughter the same shoes that take cow down and rain water and sweat to go to school. And those American shoes were too small and couldn't fit her. I see them American shoes too small and can't fit us. That is why my mother did not want me on a bus. My mother had pride. Understand what I say when I say pride. She refused to have us ride three streets away to use the free internet cafe. Now, you might call my mother a fool, but free to her meant free food, and free food meant they had to qualify as poor to get it. So she rather take a loan for a computer set. It was not new. But that computer set was ours. You had to be careful when using that computer set for hours. It was a fire hazard. So you had to put a fan on the computer so the computer went overheat. Then put a fan on that first fan because that fan wanted to overheat. But man, we only had one fan. But understand, my mother would take a stand at a time that seemed unreasonable just to create comfort. And when we give trouble, it used to be all man Jack comfort. She was the fort that took sea breeze and cannonball, yet the thought of us children was always on her mind first. I remember all pride used to burst if one of these children was in danger. She had our futures protected before our womb was kicked in anger, in determination or desire. That is why. I call my mother super. Now I have pride. Pride for my mother and that pride I'm going to keep. I remember placing rubber bands on my stretch up socks so my socks wouldn't fall to sleep. And muckers wouldn't muck. She accumulated a lifelong of debt to fill lunch kits and stomach. So today, I may stomach any negativity. Knowing that it has been the lesson of something good. Her creativity now whirls in my veins. It is flowing in my blood. No words were created in a vacuum. These words are the buds of a loving and caring mother. The nurture and care of my superwoman. My two favorite things about Trinidad and Tobago are speed guns and tow trucks. You ever see Port of Spain when they see a tow truck? It's like, oh shucks, who foot does can't move like if the tow stuck when they see a tow truck? Shouting in the people, them store like bandits announcing a hold up PBM TD734, PBM TD734, anybody driving? PBM TD734? Because what fate befall that blue B14 could be for all. It don't even have to be your fault or your vehicle. But as soon as you see that cable pull, you feel things you never thought you was capable of feeling. To see a stranger's two front wheel in the sky, $500 go bye-bye and your pocket mourn the loss. I mean, it's not your car, but you understand the course, so you try to stop them. Of course, officer, he coming back for sure. I know him. He's my sister, brother, dog, uncle-in-law. I like speed guns too. Well, the ones who warn you from the other side. You could be pushing 120 in your little 120 wire, avert your eyes, and it's plenty lights like flickering. Unlawful fireflies, fire bun Babylon. If you want to share tickets, you need to try harder. Farah is fast, we fast. Who could drive past our brethren on a bypass and not beep, beep, beat the system that does beat? We secrets we keep for each other deplorable. Applaudable. Squat on government land because real estate not affordable. When I was younger, the current from our house came from a wall socket in our neighbor's home. And anything we had in our fridge was our neighbor's own. <laughs> Breaking law to break bread. People who look like we does never get a break, so believe we, we does bend. Contortion portions stretch food, stretch truth, stretch through and grab whatever we need to climb. Because when a system insists in you sit down, the most radical thing you could do is rise. 
This is an apology to the guy that spoke love like scripture, that made me find sanctuary in the cracks of his smile and gave me an arm to rest my head and my troubles. And even if that arm fell asleep, he never did. He made me a believer in all things divine, like his voice and his obsession with the apex predator and his random spurts of information and midnight conversations about weird family nicknames and past pets, all of which I would forget. And he would remind me again and again, and I would listen with the eagerness of a child on a grandfather's lap. You were the first person I wanted to call home, to find shelter with. You were the first person to hold me accountable, the first to unlock my doors. And at first, you showed no emotions. And I thought that meant you felt nothing. It turns out it meant you felt everything. Every sharp cut answer, every shrug, every pull away, every I love you left hanging. And I wish, I wish you would have told me that I wasn't loving you the right way. Because nothing can grow in a toxic home environment. This poem is for the only guy to ever put me in my place. Taught me to hold my tongue. Think before I speak. This poem is for the guy that was patient and slow to anger with me. He looked for lessons in every mistake, taught me to take time to teach instead of belittle. This is a letter to the first guy to leave me vulnerable. An incomplete home, open, broken yet whole to leave me wanting, in need of renovation yet content. And we often forget the importance of a first, but it's the foundation, what we begin with. It's where our ideas flourish. This poem is for the guy that taught me that love isn't always enough. There's more to it than that. And love wouldn't always get you all the way you have to work and try and cry and pray and choose to stay and choose to be solid. See, I've never been a ride or die kind of girl, but you were the first guy to make me want to say till death do us part. And they say home is where the heart is. So I've been homeless for about a year or so now. And I've since moved on from what I thought home was and started rebuilding my walls. So this apology, it's just me laying the bricks. Family is folklore. Unlikely characters creating culture, bridging gaps, setting the foundation for future generations. Family is different personalities, like Jab Jab and Papa Boa. Sukuya and Laja Bless, Mama Glow and Duen, yet still they stand as the parents of our tradition. And they may not always mesh. Because if baby doll don't like Dame Lorraine, that don't mean that the joy of the bacchanal and the adrenaline of the lacquer race top pump last laps and mass through our veins, parades on stage and pulsates the very bane of our existence. And family is messy. Like Port of Spain after Carnival Monday. And family is conflict, like a fight that break out during juve. But that is how it is. Because family will fight all those who oppose and clean up the mess for the sake of love. Love for future generations looking to us, unlikely characters, bridging gaps, setting the foundation. Everybody have a body. But not everybody body does body the same way your body does body. For instance, somebody body missing a hair, and somebody body missing some hair. But that don't mean that their body is any less body than your body, yeah? Everybody body different. You don't get to pick and choose the body that you're born into. If you could, I bet men would have picked a body that form fit. Somebody body born with an automatic forfeit. Somebody born full length and somebody body born forfeit. But if that's where you had to work with, that's where you had to work with. Bodies just kind of weird like that sometimes. Somebody body can take care of its body so it gives the body to a relative. Which, of course, in theory is relative to the fact that families kind of the same. Everybody family different. Somebody family have the means to raise the child with a silver spoon and tooth. And somebody family don't even have the means to raise the youth 
But that don't mean that we get to shun a family for not being what we want a family to be. For some, family might mean no one gets left behind. And for others, family might mean, look, we get born a step behind. You don't get to pick and choose the family that you're born into. If you could, I bet that somebody would have picked health and wealth. But if your family do family the way you like, when you get the opportunity, make sure that your family family right. Treat your family finally like your body. Give it health and wealth. Okay, maybe you didn't get to choose the family that you're born into yourself. But when you pick your family, make sure that you pick a family that suits yourself. The Bocas Festival is probably the premier literary festival this side of the hemisphere. And, and, I, and I, it sounds a bit like an exaggeration, but it's not, it's true. Um, amazing people, um, wonderful opportunities to exchange ideas, to share views, and just to feel good, you know, about being here. And, you know, we know that we all have good rum in this place here. Yeah. I haven't tried it yet, but I don't even think I need it to feel good. So, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, as a writer, it's great. Um, the, 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 there is a genuine interest in, 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 in the work that one produces um, and you get it by the feedback, by the attendance um, to the events, you get it by the kinds of questions the audience asks. But also it, 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 as an as as associate editor, it's ex very fulfilling to see writers who, whose work you've read in advance as manuscript or you've played some small part um, towards its restructuring, rewriting, refining you know, editing, honing, that, 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 that those works, you know, they arrive eventually fully formed and have, one has a sense of having, you know, played a part in that too. Uh, and of course, for me, one of my best working experiences um, is the current one, working with Jeremy Pointing and Hannah Bannister at People Tree Press. And I'm not saying this because I want to keep the job, I'm saying it because it's true. Yeah, though I do want to keep the job uh, because it's such a fulfilling one. Um, strategic People Tree Press, as you know, is probably, in fact, it's definitely the, the, the most important, strategically important press for literary fiction in particular and for, uh, and for poetry. Um, this side of the Atlantic, it, uh, it, it's, it's extremely important and it's, it's good to be part of such a strategic and what will be eventually, historically, an extremely important uh, enterprise as people treat press. So, yeah, I'm benefiting on both sides. I'm cutting it both ways. Having been to several of the events so far, what panels or readings or exchanges, either formal or informal, have really resonated with you so far? Um, the, 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 there was a So Many Islands one. Um, where we talked about the short story, um, which in fact is one of my principal preoccupations at the moment. Um, we had other forums, uh, where, and, and interestingly enough, it's not always the, the program, the events. It's sometimes it's just sitting with people that you, you, you meet for the first time, or you meet more meaningfully for the second time, uh, uh, exploring ideas, which Sometimes, as happened, for example, with uh, Jennifer Rahim, uh, who won the Fiction um, Prize at this year's uh, Bocas Festival, you know, her talking to me about her work and the ideas behind it, um, which I find impressive and sophisticated and grounded, that in itself have, has me to, 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 to look at fiction and my own fiction in an interesting way too, you know, when, when she talked about the structure of her work and, and, and the way she approached it. Uh, um, so all of these elements, yeah. yeah. There have been quite a few events. I have a very shallow memory, by the way, you know, um, but 
the impact overall, the feeling is good, you know, and one can only go by one's own subjectivity. It's fiction after all. For me, um, and has been proven, and as has been proven historically, all fiction, in my view, should be preoccupied with the, the exigencies of its time, with the, the crises, if you like, of its time. Uh, and fiction, in a way, um, can have, the best fiction do have, a kind of prescience about it, a way of projecting imaginatively into the future, uh, has a way of exploring and quite often helping us to understand consequences. Yeah? And, and the implications of what is happening at, this, at any given point in time. And it seems to me that one of the pressing themes, preoccupations, subject matter, if you like, of fiction is in fact the fragility of our island states. Yeah? Um, so we spend a lot of time talking about the political relationship be between island states. Um, and we look at the, historic, the historical commonalities. It would be for me, it is becoming increasingly imperative that we look at what to me is a threat to our very own physical existence as island states, you know, which in a way eclipses and precludes all the other preoccupations we have. Um, I am extremely exercised by that at the moment, to the extent where um, I, I, I have actually revisited a book that I've been working on for many years now and in a way reshaped it to embrace quite fully that preoccupation with the fragility of our states, the fact that it's being threatened. And that, I think people forget this, that it's not our fault, it's not our doing. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a statement about the power relations between, you know, powerful industrial nations and nations like ours who we didn't enter anybody's fight, yet the consequences of that fight in terms of, or, or, or the consequences of the excesses of, of these nations are felt by us. Um, and I think, I think in addressing that, we, we cannot help but address not simply what is happening to us presently in real time, but the causes of it and, and, and the nature of the, 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 the relationship between ourselves and other larger, more powerful states. Um, who have um, quite, in my view, irresponsibly, I may go as far as to say criminally, um, brought us to this point of danger, of vulnerability. You need to be here to get a sense of what a real community of writers can be and has to offer in terms of knowledge, generosity, warmth, um, imaginative, intellectual, cerebral stimulation. Um, for me, it's an absolutely great opportunity and a fabulous event, you understand? And you know, and you know the extent to which I love everybody here and... What me there? Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, in a very, in a really serious way, um, it is important. It's absolutely worth coming. You know, uh, Trinidad, has a, Trinidad has a lot to offer. The book has, has even more to offer because the book has is trans Caribbean. I may even say transnational.
Welcome to Raised Voices. I am Daria Ann Martino, and it is my honor to be here today with our poets Desiree C. Bailey and Rosamond S. King. I'm very excited to hear from both of their new poetry collections. Um, and I will start with a brief introduction. Desiree C. Bailey is the author of What Noise Against the Cane from Yale University Press 2021. She's winner of the Yale Series of Younger Poets Prize. She is also the author of the fiction chap book In Dirt or Salt Water from O'Clock Press 2016. And she has short stories and poems published in Best American Poetry, Best New Poets, American Short Fiction, Kalalu, The Academy of American Poets, and elsewhere. Desiree was born in Trinidad and Tobago and currently lives in Brooklyn, New York. Rosemond King is a critical and creative writer and performer. Her books, Island Bodies, Transgressive Sexualities in the Caribbean Imagination was named best book by the Caribbean Studies Association. Her poetry publications include the forthcoming All the Rage, which we are discussing today, and the Lambda award-winning Rock, Salt, Stone. King's essays have appeared in Lit Hub, the Ms. Blog, Sargasso, The Progressive, The Caribbean Review of Gender Studies, and elsewhere. She has performed at biennials, festivals, bookstores, and other venues around the world and in cyberspace, like today. King is creative editor of Essex Salon and associate professor at Brooklyn College, part of the City University of New York. So welcome, poets. Thank you for joining us. Great to be here, thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay, so I'm really honored to be chatting with both of you today. And I think we will start off with a brief reading of each of your works. We decided we will go alphabetical. So Ms. Bailey, if you will grace us with your words. Okay, hello everyone. It's again, it's really great to be here. And I'm going to read from a long poem that uh, is from the first half of my book, What Noise Against the Cane, and it's called Chant for the Waters and Dirt and Blade. And it's set uh, just before the Haitian Revolution. And I like to think of it also as, um, as a poem that is in reverence to the ocean. I am I, but I won't spill my name not here on this damned rock pushed out bloody from the bowels of the sea. Marketplace island where the clouds crest and birdsong all for sale. Profits of my black, my stewed puss on the plate in the belly of my captor. What am I? What dare I? Grease up to quiet the squeak. A howl camouflage destined to burst forth, murderous as a wave. Meet today, tomorrow cut for my inheritance of rage. My name soldiers up like bile, but I dare not allow it. Swallow it, bury it, down with the other human parts of me. I husk of girl orphan at the ocean's distant edge before ship before humid choke of hull, before trade wind splintering me off into the world's directions, a girl and I, unbroken and spotless, smooth as obsidian's kiss, oiled up and thrown down in the dirt, in the gas between the pine cloak mountains. I haunted by the land's beauty, its dark face ringing with the throat of a bell. The beauty, a curse that trails me at night, stands my hair up like men in the croon of the mapu tree. Oh, heard song of the whistling duck hunted for her eggs, knotted grasp of Grenadia vines, thin skin hibiscus that gives and gives scattering pollen like stars. 
in this garden, the white man veils his face from his gods shares the land for it to look like him. In the leaves' tender shadow, he poisons the soil with his spilling anger, his barbed sorrow. My hands, my womb, whittle to a tool to build what? A white man's skull temple, his leaning empire of ash and bone, his coffee, his cane arrows towards the death of everything. The land chewed up, the skin forest, his god within the vulture's jaw, the island made into a wicked stain, a lump in the throat of my mother. But if not here, then where, crude shadow of home, my blood, my grief glistens, the soil, the land and me stubborn kin. The land made me a new being, forge of a greedy flame, my blood already here, my gods breathing in the hills, in the slow tilt of evening, my gods stir me into a battle song, my muck, my cane, my muddy island, my life, my death, my cliffs, my body's bloom. They will say miracle when what they mean is this tongue jettying, awaiting runaway fists of rain. Miracle when what they mean is war song learn by limb before the capture, sweet mixing of herb before the capture soldier's head knotted with coordinates, strategy of flame, the haunt, the memory of how the bird taunts the river with its wing, and a sweet free thrust in a moon drunk room, juices seeping into mattress, into coconut fiber, fermenting, miracle of breath and blood miracle of a haunting freedom never forgets where it once roamed stops me till I can't sleep for want of the sea till poison floats like a fly in the tea freedom ruthless siren hurl and shriek louder than a dream what smoke what threadbare cry what child strung between what architect of light what leaf of the wound what mountain and scar, what keloid, what mother, what sweat in the eye, what sojourning soul, what thrust in the dark, what hole, what belly, what babe without breath, what root to the hills, what dance, what drum beat to call, what freedom, what body, what precipice of hope, what danger, what master, what whalebone, what poison meat, what pillage feel, what noise against the cane, what blaze, what sky, what name to call myself. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for that, Desiree. Uh, I got so um, swept up for a moment. I was about to start talking and I remembered that I muted my mic. So thank you for sharing that. And I believe we are going to have a video clip in lieu of our reading for this first reading from Rosamund S. King. Um, Actually, I'll read first and then we'll have the clip second. Thank you. Um, it's always an honor and a pleasure to be here at BOCUS. And I was thinking today that it's become commonplace to do land acknowledgements in North America and in Australia and some other places, but we don't hear that as often at Caribbean events. So I will still say that I'm in Brooklyn, New York, which is the land of the Canarsie and Nyack Lenape people, and I'm a long walk from an African burial ground. And I think that thinking about indigenous peoples as well as enslaved peoples is part of what leads to the first poem that I'm going to read. I'm going to read several short poems from All the Rage. In Rock, Salt, Stone, there was a poem called Reparations. This is called Reparations Two. You won't speak truth. Say time passed, passed for reconciliation. So, let we talk retribution. Like many of the poems in the book, this one is untitled. Sweet, Salt, bitter, sour, their umami is blood, ours. <laughs> 
when I when I wrote this poem, it was I was not thinking about Meghan Markle, but now when I read it, I think about Meghan Markle. It's called Crimson Colored Glasses. Palaces are always majestic, impressive, and gauche. Palaces leave impressions, gold slick with blood, fountains pulsing it, jewels with smears diminishing their clarity. Hold on to the railing, or you might slip. Do not complete with colored pen. Do not fold or tear. Do not write below the line. Have your traditions ready for inspection or lack of may lead to expulsion. We will protect you by turning the army into the border patrol. We will protect you by turning the National Guard into the police. We will protect you by turning the police into the paramilitary. We will protect you by attacking you in your homes. We will give you a receipt for your children. Here it is. This war never over, and others eased out carefully today and today. A muffaletta of wars, different flavors and textures, but all the meat smoked, all the moldy cheese of death. It's meant to grind us down, keep us chewing, face full to gagging, they think retching, we won't ask, who made this? Why isn't there something else to eat? And I read this untitled poem to the memory of Mark Anthony Singh, Lucia Leandro Jimeno, and Colin Robinson. Desire stronger than fear, more pulsing than threat. Desire make your liquid flame, taller than and hotter. Desire lead you by the nose hairs, promising love and panic, just there, just beyond. Desire will drown you, and as liquid becomes pummeling wave, flame still there, pulsating, crimson, sunrise, citrus, dancing, hot and hard, lovely and terrifying. And this is the last poem I'll read. Sometimes it is that simple to survive. This blood-drenched, crawling, wailing life is not possible, and neither is blinking through scars into a beaming sun without forgetting. Start with simple. Living is not possible without life. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Rosman. Um, one thing that struck me is uh, as I was reading through these books, I was so taken by how they presented visually on the page, which is why I hope everybody buys the book so they could see them for themselves. But um, hearing you all read them out loud, it was such a completely different experience. It was just like tapping into a different side of my brain almost, and the poems felt very new. So I was hoping both of you, and you can decide who wants to answer first, but I guess what is kind of the importance of kind of the oral presentation as well as the visual presentation of your poems and what you think is kind of gained or lost depending on how you present your work and how it's received? Well, I like to think of it less as what is lost than what is gained, <laughs> right? That there can be additions and more and just things, uh, the experience of reading the, the poem on the page versus hearing the poem versus seeing the poet perform the, the poem, um, that they're different, but that one is not less than the other. And I think for me, you know, when I write, the poems are not always 
left justified, lined up on the page. They're not always in the same font size. And that's a, just to me a different kind of performance, that it's a way of conveying to the reader some kind of tonal senses and different textures of the language that you don't always get if you just have the words in kind of a traditional setting. Yes, I love that. I love thinking about it as something that is gained um, as opposed to something that's lost because I think my process in choosing how to represent the poems on the page is quite similar and for me it actually is quite emotional and really varies depending on the poem and so for the poems that i read um a lot of them i really wanted to sort of break up maybe the tyranny of how we typically think of line breaks and it was really important to me with uh, material that is talking, that is dealing with resistance and liberation to, to emulate that as best as I could on the page. And so that's why sometimes it, it looks unruly. And then um, in other sections too, I, I uh, wanted to give more of a sense of confinement based on uh, what the speaker was experiencing. And so, I also like to think about it in the way that uh, we would think about music and think about song, that um, the form often follows the emotion and, and is really intertwined with that. Wow, well, yeah, I think that's great. And I kind of, I love what you said about breaking up the tyranny. I come sometimes get frustrated as a writer when I see that my poems are kind of very conventionally shaped. And so I love that idea of resistance and rebellion against it. And that kind of actually takes me into another thing that I was wondering about. You two have very, um, a lot of similar themes going throughout your your text and it has a lot to do with black resistance black liberation and unfortunately black suffering but kind of the main difference i'm seeing is the way that desiree's tends to toggle i think more between the distant and recent past mm -hmm. and you know as you said kind of opens up with this sweeping poem that starts at the is at the onset of the haitian revolution rosamund your poems feel very much in the current moment and dealing with current events. They deal with a lot of recent events in terms of um, instances of police brutality and anti-Black violence, but also even just dealing with the pandemic. You have a lot of poetry that references the pandemic. So I'm curious how the current moment factors into your writing process um, for these particular books, how it factored in for both of you? Well, you know, I have said to people more than once in the last year that I'm very glad that I am an artist because if I was not, I might be hurting myself or other people. <laughs> that it's really writing and other forms of art are how one of the important ways that I cope and react and respond to what is going on around me. So that's part of the process. But I, and, and the, the poems are absolutely, I mean, some of them you can tell very clearly are about the pandemic. Some of them are very clearly about very specific instances of state violence. And I even mentioned some names, but the concept of the abattoir of a place where black people are both the workers and the meat that is produced is something that is beyond, to me is beyond the current moment. So I think of a lot of neighborhoods that are predominantly black as being abattoirs, including a place like Laventil, right? And so I think there are ways that I hope that while the poems speak directly to this moment, that they also speak to people beyond this moment in the future, and also people in different places and times thinking much more broadly about what it means to be human um, and to live under certain kinds of conditions. Mm -hmm. That really resonates with me. I think um, 
really in the writing of this book, it was important for me to have both the the past or an event from the past alongside poems that speak to the contemporary. And I think for me, I I really needed to see that, I don't want to say progression, but uh, the way that things has or things have transpired across time for myself, not necessarily to teach anyone, but really just to see that and um, to to draw this connection for myself between an event um, like the Haitian Revolution and to um, to see its resonances into today's world. And and I think you know that was the primary I think organizing principle for me when when putting together the book. And I also think, um, you know, thinking more broadly, I also resonate with what Rosamund is saying about including these instances of, um, you know, of whether it's police brutality, whether showing these different forms of both Black suffering, but also Black triumph um, in, in the work. And really hoping that by including the past and the present together, that it opens up something and that it creates room for the future and for us to imagine the future um, in a way that actually, um, you know, will be best for us. I love that. I feel like it's, yes, what you're saying, you can't really have the future or manifest the future if you don't have some understanding of the past and same way you can't really have you can't really understand what it means to be joyful if you don't understand suffering so i love that you have that juxtaposition in your work and that is actually a really good segue into my next question which was dealing with this difficult subject matter that both of you touch on um how is it that you, and this is a question for every writer out there who's trying to write through a difficult truth, is, yeah, how do you maintain hope and joy? And is it that you are writing through this, the difficulty of the work, or is it more that the writing is what is proving therapeutic for these, for processing these difficult struggles, or is it kind of a mix? Hmm. Well, I think for me, um, the work isn't therapeutic. I am a big fan of therapy and of, you know, <laughs> of self-care in, in ways outside of the work. So I can't say that uh, this is therapeutic. And in fact, especially uh, with the longer poem, um, that, that was really difficult. You know, it was really difficult to read um, really the history of not not only the revolution but um but the history of enslavement in Haiti but also throughout the Americas and uh there were some days where where I felt really weighed down by um by the research and what I decided was that I needed to think about research in a more embodied way and and so for me I thought I need to move. I need to move my body. I need to engage with this material um, somehow outside of the outside of the books. I needed to look towards the body, towards the movement, towards the stories that are um, that are told and passed down through the body. And so that specifically, I think, with that project was my way of really not only working through the project but understanding it. Um, but also with this, there was there were a lot of times where I I really just had to to sit with the history and um, and to hold space for it. You know, not always reaching for hope. There there are times when you know I absolutely needed to do that. But I think it was important to really um, to listen and to honor what I was learning and. Um, and what I was experiencing through that process. I would agree in terms of, I think that poems that are therapy are 
usually not very good poems. <laughs> they might become better poems later on after some editing. Uh, I, the very first person I haven't, I am not a person who's taken a lot of formal creative writing classes, but the first person who taught me creative writing formally, one day came into the classroom and banged down the papers and said, people, bleeding onto the page is not enough. <laughs> And so I think about that in the sense that, again, that is sometimes the first draft, right? Or that's something maybe that gets written in the journal and stays in the journal. Um, but when we think about really writing and craft, that it is about delving into um, research. And I, and I think, Desiree, you would agree with me, different kinds of research, emotional research, as well as what we might call traditional research in terms of reading papers and, and things like that. And so I think that for me, it's definitely about writing through these, these thoughts and feelings and emotions, but also not trying to ventriloquize, right? So I'm not trying to speak for anyone else, even if I'm speaking around an experience that a particular person or a group of people had. Um, and then also wanting to, I want, I mean, the book is called All the Rage. I want to claim the rage as well as the joy. Um, as well as the desire, as well as all of the other feelings. I don't want us to, I don't want myself and I don't want us Black people or Caribbean people or anyone to only have one dimension emotionally. And so I think it's, it's really important for us to have the joy, but I don't want us to lose the rage and the anger either. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that might be a good time to talk about the poetry that brought you joy. Um, so both of you, I know that there's these poems, again, they deal with this very difficult subject matter, but um, I thought it was interesting in the intro to What Noise Against the Cane, Carl Phillips, writes that Bailey reminds us that joy has always been a good counterweight to, if not a remedy for despair. And in that particular moment, he's talking about the ambivalence kind of in that um, poem in response to Black Orpheus, or Orpheo Negro, my Portuguese is non-existent. So sorry if I butchered that. Um, but yeah, you write about being conflicted, kind of loving, the beauty of that poem and kind of also seeing this overly simplistic depiction of Black people, which is something you all touched on in your responses, especially Rosamond, what you said about being one dimensional. So anyway, with that in mind, I was just thinking about what exactly brings, was a poem that brought you joy in the process of writing or even rereading? Because you have to find some joy in your work. Or perhaps no. Mm -hmm. Do you mean a, a poem? You mean a, a poem by somebody else that we read that has that continues to bring us joy? It could be. Uh, I was thinking more in terms of your own collections, but if there's oh. somebody else, if you turn to Lucille Clifton or somebody just to bring yourself a little happiness, please share that as well. Because again, I want writers to be able to manage the tensions within when they're writing through difficult books? Well, you know, in terms of the, in terms of my own book, there are, po there are poems in the book that are funny in the, you know, laugh for not to cry kind of way. And so I like those poems and I hope it's probably going to be mostly Caribbean people and Black people who kind of get that double <laughs> you know, double emotional entendre there. But those poems bring me, um, bring me a lot of joy because they make me laugh even in the face of, of all the other stuff that's, that's going on. Um, uh, and the, the poem that, that came to mind when you asked the question was This Is You Girl by Dion Brand, right? Because um, that poem in no, in no Language is Neutral, one of her earlier books of poetry, it's, it, she talks about the land of Trinidad and different specific places, but she talks about this is you girl, this place, and also this is you girl, this violent history, and also this is you girl, this 
amazing, beautiful potential. All of it is encompassed in the this, and all of this is encompassed in the you, and all of it is encompassed in the girl. And so I see that as a really kind of wonderful um, way of, again, expressing the full range of humanity. Mm. And, you know, I'm thinking about, about this phrase, the full range of humanity, Rosamund, and I keep coming back. I'm, I'm sorry. I hope I'm not sidestepping the joy question because I'm still thinking, Rosamund, about what you said about, about rage, right? And, um, and that being an expression that really has been policed, especially among Black people, Black women, right? Um, and, and so it was definitely important for me to, to make that present um even alongside the joy and so i feel like i'm struggling to find a poem that at least off the top of my head that really um is solely about joy or that brings me joy because i find often it is wrapped up mixed up together and so there'll be joy in a poem but there there will also be other notes in there and i'm thinking about um the line of text, so, you know, folks at home won't be able to see this, but in my book, there's a line of text that runs along the entire collection, uh, the bottom margin of the book, and I call it the sea voice. And um, it's not necessarily only um, invoking joy. There are so many other notes, other dimensions in there, but I definitely had a lot of fun writing that and you know, being somehow not only theatrical, but thinking about um, about people in my family who may have um, spoken in a similar way or shared similar jokes. And, and I think that brought me a lot of comfort while writing this book. Um, but it was also challenging too. So there are so many, so many feelings wrapped up in there. No, that's right. And that's life. Everything is mixed up together. And yeah, no, this sea voice is funny. She's, I mean, not all the time. I mean, she's serious, but she's also funny. And she has this kind of auntie voice. She kind of reminds me of my auntie who has kind of a hot mouth and maybe says yes. things that are a little bit inappropriate. Um, but, you know, you can't disrespect her at the same time. But um, yes, just, I don't know. I'm holding up my iPad. Um, and if you want in the audience, you could see the line of text that runs throughout. So that's kind of its own long poem running throughout. Um, I wanted to share just a quick comment from someone following along on YouTube, Kalisa Paulson. She says, please thank them. So Rose, Rosamund and Desiree, uh, please thank them for the reflections they've gifted us with this afternoon. They will resonate. And I have to agree. I'm really grateful for that. So um thank you for sharing that so far and i wanted to i guess i'll take some time to maybe ask some questions to you individually most of my questions have been geared to the pair of you so one thing i was curious about is well desiree i'll start with you because that's a question i found on my people first is um I know you have an MFA in fiction from Brown. I believe it's Brown. Anyway, um, there's a lot of narrative and storytelling throughout your poetry. And I guess I was curious how you thought your fiction background might have helped shape the book as you were crafting it. Uh, maybe that's some, some of your rebellion against form. I don't know. Please let us know. Yeah, I think this, you know, I, I probably will be thinking about this for quite a while as I'm, I'm still trying to figure out that bit, right? But I actually think with the sea voice, um, you know, thinking about it as a story, but as um, a kind of a monologue in a way, being able to tap into different forms to really bring that into the book. I think that uh, was a huge benefit to me. And in actually both my fiction and my poetry, I always want to strike a balance between the narrative and then the lyric. And so 
Um, I want to have these really dense images, these moments that I hope sing. But at the same time, it's important to me to tell a story, even if that story isn't immediately apparent. I want you at least to come away with a story of feeling, right? And so if even if the poem is a, is a bit abstract, I want the reader to, to be transported to a particular place um, or a particular moment, emotion. And so I, I hope, you know, I feel like this is for others to say, but I, I really hope that, um, that me dabbling and working in different forms come together to, to really, um, you know, produce that kind of experience. Oh, you're muted, Daria. Sorry, thank you. No, I was just saying, I think that really comes through in your work. And um, yes, I like that kind of idea of the emotional story, the emotional journey that you touched on. Um, there's a question for Rosman from Shani Mutu via YouTube. You live in the US, but your heart is clearly in the Caribbean. Does this not split you in two? When you are in New York, can you really be there? I ask for selfish reasons. And um, yes, please, that's actually a great question for many of us in diaspora. Well, it's, a, it's an honor to get any question from Shani Mutu and you know, sitting up in the shivering Northern wetlands <laughs> to ask me such a question. But, um, you know, and I have a whole set of aunties um, who are in or who are from Nigeria and the Gambia who get very upset at me thinking that my heart is not also there as much as it is in the Caribbean. Um, but I think, you know, I, I have a saying that my home is wherever my feet are. And so that's one of the places that is home is just, I've moved around so much and I've been in so many different places, but the home also is where the heart is. And I have become very comfortable. My mother called me a Nowarian a lot when I was growing up and I never took it as an insult. Um, never entirely sure whether or not it was meant that way, but I've become very comfortable with feeling at home in many places and a part of many communities, even as those communities often will accept or reject me depending on what what they what parts of me they choose to see or highlight um, and so it probably seems complicated to a lot of other people but it doesn't seem complicated to me i understand that it's kind of this i i'm not to oversimplify but it's kind of this i'm everywhere and nowhere um poem and that's a or idea, and that kind of actually segues into um, Desiree has this poem accent that kind of talks about toggling between languages or dialects and pronunciations rather cadence. And I think both of you switch between Trinidadian dialect and standard English. You have this poem where you keep saying "banya belly, banya belly, banya belly." I don't know that statement to exist outside of Trinidad. Um, but yes, so I'm kind of curious as how is it that you determine which voice is supposed to come through in the poem and what mode of speech fits in the poem? What is it that kind of guides you? And that's a question for both of you, sorry. I think uh, for me, Again, it really, and I hope, you know, I'm not sounding like a broken record here, but it really depends on, on what I hear. And so I like to listen a lot. And, and so when I'm writing these poems, first of all, um, while I'm writing, I'm, I'm speaking them aloud. And, and that's for me to, to gauge the rhythm. Um, but also to really determine the voice that is supposed to speak. And, and so for the, you know, the C voice, it, it just seemed right that this was, you know, that auntie, that auntie voice really um, coming through into 
um, into that into those lines. But it's very much like my everyday life. And so I'm on this panel. I'm going to sound one way, right? I'm speaking to my mother. I sound a different way. I, I'm teaching a class. There's a, a different voice that comes through. And I do think that um, that Caribbean people, right, all people do this, but especially Caribbean people, we we have, you know, gotten comfortable or maybe not comfortable, but it is a part of um, of our story that we move between these different voices, these different accents, especially those of us who are in diaspora and back again. And I say in diaspora and then back again in the home country because I don't think about it as necessarily a fixed location, but um, but one that so many of us are living between, loving between, moving between. And um, and similarly with the poems, I, I think there's a, 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 a similar kind of movement depending on, on what needs to be talked about and what needs to be addressed. Yeah, I would, I would agree that it's the language that is necessary is the one that comes out in that moment. But I also think that, um, and I think that Desiree was gesturing towards this as well, that anything that is written down can be read in more than one way, right? So if you, if you see the sentence, I learned this from a boy, right? That might look like a standard English sentence, but you could hear somebody say, I learned this from a boy. And it's the same words, right? But it sounds very different. Um, I'm curious, Desiree, this is actually a conversation that I was having with Erica Doyle a few years ago. Um, and I'd like to hear your take on it. Well, we were talking about how in, narr in fiction, we often see, we see someone like an Earl Lovelace, right? Or we see someone like a Shani Mutu using the vernacular languages to talk about a range of things, right? And to talk about very serious things. But there is the perception, um, I don't think it's fully the reality, but there's a perception that in poetry, the vernacular is most often used for humor and not as much for serious, um, serious language, serious concepts or for experimentation. And, you know, I think that we have a lot of people who push against that from Basie Phillip to Brathley to Erica Doyle. Um, but I'm curious as to what your, your thought is on that as a poet and a fiction writer. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a beautiful question. It was actually a concern of mine while writing this voice that um, that someone who was not as familiar with with this way of speaking would only read humor into it. And um, and you know, I quickly had to sort of push away those fears and and really just understand that that people will make of it what they will, but, um, but I need to do my work as a writer to, uh, you know, to put my intentions into that. And I, you know, so for me, I, I, I absolutely wanted the C voice to be this voice that um, is knowledgeable about human history, about both the suffering, about the joy, to be humorous as well. And I think that goes back, Rosamund, to what you were talking about, about the full range of emotion. And perhaps um, that desire for me to put that in there also comes from, again, my observations that, you know, that especially uh, Black people, people of color in the public sphere, but also sometimes in also in the pri in our private lives, we are often allowed certain kinds of emotion and and not the full range of it. And so it was important for me to to show that broad scope in there, and also to say that um, this is a, a voice that is very Caribbean, that is very Trinidadian, and and this voice. Um, can be what she wants to be, right? Like she can be funny, she can be um, rude, body, all of that. And I think it just goes back to, um, you know, to not arguing our humanity, but just showing up as we are, as the humans that we are. 
just being like a full bodied experience. That's actually funny enough. Um, so we are going to, I have one more question from the audience, actually from Barney Capaldeo. And then we are going to talk about that and maybe in a few minutes, we will um, segue into our second reading. So this question, again, via YouTube from Vani Capaldeo, is a question about rage and emotion more generally. How do different audiences read emotion in women of color slash writing by women of color? And that's a, <laughs> whew, a very loaded question and a very, yeah. I'll let you answer that. Yeah. And Vani, I'm sure, knows... Um, some of the answer to this question as a, as a celebrated poet herself. You know, people read it in a range of ways. And I, you know, I, I enjoy performance and I enjoy different kinds of performance. So I might read a poem that is about violence and death with a big smile. <laughs> playing with, you know, what their expectations are of the angry black woman or, you know, the person who's, who, who they might expect or the, you know, to create some dissonance sometimes, not always, but sometimes. And I, to use Desiree's words, you know, I show up as my full self. So if someone, if, if an organization, an institution has invited me to be present, then I presume that they know who I am. And if they don't, then they get to know who I am. Um, but to take that kind of to a slightly different place, I have become quite particular about the structure of events that I participate in. So I do not always participate in Q and A's. If I do participate in a Q and A, I need to investigate who the person is who's leading the Q and A, um, because I am not there for other people's um, ignorance or to be the recipient of their violence or their attacks. And so I need to be, I need to have, I, I can protect myself, I can defend myself, but I don't choose to spend my time in that way, especially if I'm being asked to be present as an artist. Um, and so I've tried to do a lot more work before an event to investigate and try to avoid, people get to feel what they feel, but they, I do not have to feel what they feel. Mm. Hey, um, that was a great answer. Um, Desiree, did you have anything to add to that before we segue into the next reading? And I think for the next reading, we'd like to present Rosamund's video. But um, Desiree, just if you really wanted to say anything about uh, Vani Capaldeo's wonderful question. I truly feel like Rosamund said it all with with that because I, I feel the same way, right? People will feel what they will feel. Um, and also something that I, I would like to add when um, engaging with the way that people may perceive me as a Black woman and, and the way that um, I communicate or experience the world, I also have to think about taking care of myself and, and filtering um, and even beyond filtering, sometimes just straight up putting up that barrier because I, I understand the necessity of self-protection as a writer, as someone who, um, who's, who's dealing with um, difficult material, but really also as a Black person in the societies that we are in. I think anybody who's ever been, you know, in, at a Black author event with a mostly white audience can attest to that. And <laughs> we could swap stories after. Let's take a moment for Rosamund to introduce her video. So I'm going to allow you to do that. And then please share with us what you've got. Great. Well, it has, um, it has an introduction and credits, but I'll just say that I was very honored that uh, the wonderful Crusian from St. Croix, choreographer, performance artist, dancer, Cynthia Oliver, along with Jason Finkelman working on the music, um, set some movement to three of the poems from the book. So.
Band in Belly in Brooklyn. Band in Belly in Port of Spain. Band in Belly in Ferguson. Band in Belly in Port au Prince. In, in, in a man in uniform. An unarmed woman, an unarmed man, an unarmed child. Ball, ball at Banny a belly. Always a ball is a ball is a ball. What is a 21st century belly band? And how can we ban belly beyond the abattoir? Is the 21st century we still suck in salt? Time to spit it back. All that mouth water, all that eye water, let we stream it back to the source. We want to fire the work of suffering. But we can't when we always plan in funerals. Instead, let we fire the armed occupation. Can't kill all of we. <laughs> Them need us still, the underclass, to support the entire architecture. Let we dismantle the machines into pieces. belly band torques around the beast distending it till belly bust our detained children crawling out its twisted intestine and jagged anus we band belly till we reclaim our children and cleanse them with care Them can kill all of we. Let me dismantle the machine into pieces. That was a really interesting interpretation. I love that little kind of laugh you, you gave when you said, they can't kill all of you. And that little <laughs> cackle at the end was great. What you said about how it sounds different depending on how you read it. That was wonderful. And now I would love to hear some more poetry from Desiree from What Noise Against the Cane, Desiree, if you will. Thank you, Daria. And thank you, Rosamund, uh, for that for that film. And speaking of joy, I decided to fish a poem, <laughs> fish out a poem that maybe has a little bit of joy. So I'll just read uh, two poems here. Extra virgin olive oil after Walter Price's painting. Look once and it's her fingers that pull you in, the absence of them how they've disappeared within her, splitting her body like reeds at the river's lips. Bantu knotted American queen pedestaled at the top of the canvas. Spill of red paint, blue drip of stars pooling the foot of the nations. Look again, not a clit, 
but a book that occupies the hand. And you smile at how easy it is to mistake one pleasure for another, membrane for membrane, twin yearnings for the flesh spit of knowledge, for after all, to know is to let the sweet waters run down, down the slope, the purple mountains. Stare until the painting becomes a mirror. Until you are 16 again in your room with Jimi Hendrix plastered on the wall like a saint, you are clutching a book, blotting the ink with your sweaty palms, shoving the words into your mouth, practicing, repeating, drilling an American accent, sloughing the salt water off your tongue, speaking yourself into disappearance. And you would have disappeared were it not for the pussy's pages how turning them lit the tunnel into yourself to the books that could only be read in salt and seaweed and the touch that made you crave your own dark scent, what tiny stars you are spilling. And uh, this next poem is called Woman in Dub, and it's after Lee Scratch Perry's and Max Romeo's song Chase the Devil. Although I don't know if this one... <laughs> Uh, centers joy so much. A good song. Excellent song. The devil I see is the one I saw and nail out of fears, out of cycles of wound, dread calcifying into prophecy. I put on an iron shirt to face it, chase it, but the cop still pissed drunk with power. I put on an iron shirt, but the men on the street surveil the nipple, been hounding my punani since before I spilled my first blood. What a menace of a body I hurl blame to the husk. Is the devil real or is it of my fantastical making? The answer is not the matter. The fact of paranoia be the true violence, warfare, the very presence of the question. I want to peer inward, to take a good look at the sound system, my heartbeat echoing out of my folkloric first, my desperate belief in other realities, a B-side where I'm abolished from emotional labor, a.k.a. black woman's burden, free to surrender to my own madness, to sink down into the dub of its stripped of my first voice, reverbing outside the pain of a body, stripped of my first voice down in the dub, cop hounds my blood into paranoia, a black reality, cycles spilled, power hus, emotional woman, I, 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 I am real street, folkloric and mad, tr 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 true. Take a good look at the devil, peer into the dread, Men surrender to wound drunk, calcified, but I, fantastic, chasing echoes, nailed to system, free in sound, I, a fact, answer of my own making. Wow, thank you. I think that is the perfect note to end on. Everyone, thank you, all those out there watching, for joining us. Thank you so much, Rosamund and Desiree. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you, Boca Sit Fest and Flo, for this wonderful live stream. Everybody get out there and buy those books, All the Rage and What Noise Against the Cane. I don't think you'll regret it. Have a good Thank day. you so much. Thank you. <laughs>
celebrating Caribbean voices and preserving the rich tapestry of our culture. Through literary arts and authorship, we are free to express our vibrance, passion, heritage, and the empowering narratives of our people. As proud title sponsor of the NGC Bocas Lit Fest, we have been honored to support one of the world's acclaimed literary festivals. We celebrate your journey and salute your accomplishments.
Bocas Festival is probably the premier literary festival this side of the hemisphere. And, and, I, and I, it sounds a bit like an exaggeration, but it's not, it's true. Um, amazing people, um, wonderful opportunities to exchange ideas, to share views, and just to feel good, you know, about being here. And, you know, we know that we all have good rum in this place here. I haven't tried it yet, but I don't even think I need it to feel good. So, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, as a writer, it's great. Um, the, 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 there is a genuine interest in, 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 in the work that one produces um, and you get it by the feedback, by the attendance um, to the events, you get it by the kind of questions the audience asks. But also it, it, it's as an as as associate editor, it's very fulfilling to see writers who, whose work you've read in advance as manuscript or you've played some small part um, towards its restructuring, rewriting, refining you know, editing, honing, that, 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 that those works, you know, they arrive eventually fully formed and have, one has a sense of having, you know, played a part in that too. Uh, and of course, for me, one of my best working experiences um, is the current one, working with Jeremy Pointing and Hannah Bannister at People Tree Press. And I'm not saying this because I want to keep the job, I'm saying it because it's true. Yeah, though I do want to keep the job uh, because it's such a fulfilling one. Um, strategic People Tree Press, as you know, is probably, in fact, is definitely the, the, the most important, strategically important press for literary fiction in particular and for, uh, and for poetry. Um, this side of the Atlantic, it, uh, it, it's, it's extremely important and it's, it's good to be part of such a strategic and what will be eventually, historically, an extremely important uh, enterprise as people treat press. So, yeah, I'm benefiting on both sides. I'm cutting it both ways. Having been to several of the events so far, what panels or readings or exchanges, either formal or informal, have really resonated with you so far? Um, the, 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 there was a So Many Islands one. Um, where we talked about the short story, um, which in fact is one of my principal preoccupations at the moment. Um, we had other forums, uh, where, and, and interestingly enough, it's not always the, the program, the events, it's sometimes it's just sitting with people that you, you, you meet for the first time, or you meet more meaningfully for the second time, uh, uh, exploring ideas, which Sometimes, as happened, for example, with uh, Jennifer Rahim, uh, who won the Fiction um, Prize at this year's uh, Bocas Festival, you know, her talking to me about her work and the ideas behind it, um, which I find impressive and sophisticated and grounded, that in itself have, has me to, 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 to look at fiction and my own fiction in an interesting way too, you know, when, when she talked about the structure of her work and, and, and the way she approached it. Uh, um, so all of these elements, yeah. yeah. There have been quite a few events. I have a very shallow memory, by the way, you know, um, but the impact overall, the feeling is good, you know, and one can only go by one's own subjectivity. It's fiction after all. For me, um, and has been proven, and as has been proven historically, all fiction, in my view, should be preoccupied with the, the exigencies of its time, with the, the crises, if you like, of its time. Um, uh, and fiction, in a way, um, can have, the best fiction do have, a kind of prescience about it, a way of projecting imaginatively into the future. Uh, has a way of exploring and quite often helping us to understand consequences yeah? and, and the implications of what is happening at, this, at any given point in time. And it seems to me that one of the pressing themes, preoccupations, subject matter, if you like, of fiction is in fact the fragility of our island states. Yeah? Um, so 
we spend a lot of time talking about the political relationship be between island states. Um, and we look at the, historic, the historical commonalities. It would be, for me, it is becoming increasingly imperative that we look at what to me is a threat to our very own physical existence as island states, you know, which in a way eclipses and precludes all the other preoccupations we have. Um, I am extremely exercised by that at the moment, to the extent where um, I, 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 I have actually revisited a book that I've been working on for many years now, and in a way reshaped it to embrace quite fully that preoccupation with the fragility of our states, the fact that it's being threatened. And that, I think people forget this, that it's not our fault, it's not our doing. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a statement about the power relations between, you know, powerful industrial nations and nations like ours who we didn't enter anybody's fight, yet the consequences of that fight in terms of, or, or, or the consequences of the excesses of, of these nations are felt by us. Um, and I think, I think in addressing that, we, we cannot help but address not simply what is happening to us presently in real time, but the causes of it and, and, and the nature of the, 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 the relationship between ourselves and other larger, more powerful states um, who have um, quite, in my view, irresponsibly, I may go as far as to say criminally, um, brought us to this point of danger, of vulnerability. You need to be here to get a sense of what a real community of writers can be and has to offer in terms of knowledge, generosity, warmth, um, imaginative, intellectual, cerebral stimulation. Um, for me, it's an absolutely great opportunity and a fabulous event. You understand? And you know, and you know the extent to which I love everybody here. And what me there? Yeah. Uh, and and you know, in a very, in a really serious way, um, it is important. It's absolutely worth coming. You know, uh, Trinidad has, Trinidad has a lot to offer. The book has, has even more to offer because the book has is trans Caribbean. I may even say transnational.
Everyone has a dream, a vision of what we want, the things that make us happy and help us make others happy. Let First Citizens help you paint a brighter future, a new home, a new car, a new day of living stress-free. Make the things you picture a reality. First Citizens, we put you first. Hi, I'm Opal Palmer Adisa and I am the poetry judge, one of the poetry judges for Bocas and I was really excited to read all of those amazing books. But now I'm reading something very different. Uh, it's by a former student of mine whose name is Glodine Champion. And she was, I was her supervisor when she was in the MFA program at um, California College of the Arts, where I taught. And she has just finished a novel, which she actually had uh, submitted four chapters for her MFA thesis. And it's called Salmon Croquettes. And it's an exciting and important book. It deals with Zayla, a 12-year-old African-American who is a gender non-conforming young adult and the challenges she faced trying to navigate her parents, particularly her mother, who has very traditional expectations of what a girl ought to be. And Zayla is very clear that she likes girls. She's, she identifies uh, and shows up as a tomboy, uh, but she's very clear. It's a well-written, important book set in LA during the 1965. And um, I've just been really delighted that my student sent it to me and that she completed it. And I think it will really add to the body of work about non-conforming um, teens and adults, but just giving us that perspective, which I think is so important. So I invite you to check it out. It's going to be released this year, Salmon Croquettes by Glodine Champion. Yay! Hi, Focus. So lately I have been rereading um, all the books of poems and, and books of poems collections I would have read um, over a decade ago and at the moment I'm reading Kamal Rafford's 
going to slow horses again and uh, it really reminds me of why I started writing in the first place it's one of the first volumes of poetry that I really fell in love with and that made me kind of think of the the possibilities of writing that that made me sort of expand my views about what is possible and what a poetry collection could do and to see poetry in a completely different way to see it laid out on the page in a whole different way to read it in a whole different way and to experience um writing about islands about spaces about landscape about these places we call home in with fresh eyes in a whole new way and so i'm reading it again after almost a decade has passed and, and my own views have changed so much and I've grown so much as a writer and it's a, a it's definitely a, a book I will keep coming back to over and over again. Hi, I'm Gaitra Bahadur. I was a nonfiction judge for the Literature Prize this year. In terms of new Caribbean writing that is making me really excited. Uh, I loved Stephen Narine's short story, What in Me is Dark Illumin. It won the, the Bristol Short Story Prize this year, and uh, it's set in Guyana in the 1970s. Um, it's a really funny story and really smart as well. Um, I recognized it. I recognized the people, their ways of being and speaking, uh, the hard time they give each other. Uh, but I'm also really excited because it is historical fiction, it's political fiction that is um, very evocative and true, right? Uh, so it, it, it gives us fictional versions of Walter Rodney and uh, the, the important revolutionary figures in Guyana in the 1970s. This is really rich territory and it's also undertold. Uh, so it's exciting to me to see fiction that is mirroring the undercurrents of our history in such authentic ways um, and really um, careful about details, uh, but as invested in story as it should be. Um, so I'm just really looking forward to seeing uh, what else Stephen produces. I think that it might be part of a larger work. Uh, so yeah, thanks. <music> Hi, Bogus. Hi, Caribbean sister and brethren. I'm Tiffany Anik. I'm reading two books now. The first is Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Animals by Alexis Pauline Gums. A beautiful meditation on how we can undrown ourselves by looking at our fellow marine mammals and paying attention to our natural environment. And the other book is How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House by Cherie Jones. A beautiful book about girls learning to be independent and strong and developing into feminist womanist women. It's already won um, the Good Morning America Book Club citation. I'm really excited about both of them. Hello, my name is Vanny Capildeo and I'm delighted to share with you what I'm reading now, which is Hemorrhage by Aaron Kent. This legitimate snack which is the name of Aaron's imprint for small pamphlets from Broken Sleep Books, which he runs. This legitimate snack is about his suffering a cerebral hemorrhage and miraculously recovering from it. I love this book because, one, it is legitimate snack. It is very beautiful to hold in the hand and it's exemplary of the kind of book art that we can make and the kind of book art that Caribbean poets also are making and uh, that we can disseminate, share among ourselves, uh, poetry as friendship and our homes as our archives. I do believe this is the future face of publishing. And uh, I also love this book because of the way the poems slip between states of awareness and semi-awareness, and yet the constant is tenderness and love. Here's this, an example from A God Counting Jinxes. If we're really slipping in and out of our glasses, then I suppose we should cross our arms and hope to space between us. Hope to space between us.
Let's hope, and in hope, here's to the spaces between us and many, many crossings. Enjoy Bookcast 2021. <music> What happens is that the books are judged in different categories. Poetry, first of all, judge poetry, fiction, the novel and short story, and then non-fiction, like history or three categories. Loads of books are submitted in each category, and there are three judges for each category. They read through. The, the fiction ones read through all the novels and shows, and so on. The poetry ones read through all the books of poetry. They have a lot of books to read, and then they pick one as the winner of that category. I, as the chief judge for the Bocas, OCM Bocas, which is the overall prize, I, I read just those three books. The best poetry book, the best fiction book, and the best non-fiction book. And my other judges for that are the chairman of the judge, judges' panels for the three groups. So that I didn't have to read many books. But of course the challenge at that level, especially, is that you are now judging between three books or among three books that are under normal circumstances, in normal circumstances, all excellent and prize-worthy. So the difficulty is how to whether you can draw a line and whether there's going to be dispute, you know, among this, the four of us or the three of them and then me, about which is the best. I hear that one year for one Bocas Prize there was contention and it was settled in a certain way. Your hard work, talent and creativity plus flow equals a new way of doing things. Flow is connecting all of Trinidad, from Port of Spain to Pinal. So now everyone can work, study, and keep moving forward together. Making your home not just a home, but a place to make anything happen. Visit discoverflow.co for more information. One Caribbean Media continues its commitment to the Bocas Lit Fest with the sponsorship of the 2021 Bocas Lit Prize. Now more than ever, we recognize the invaluable role that Caribbean literature and those who create it play in our lives and do not hesitate to support their development through this continued partnership. As we navigate past these times and into the future, the OCM Group looks forward to the continued growth and success of the festival. I'm Marina Solandi Brown, and I'm the founder and director of the Bokaslit Fest, which hosts this annual literary festival, the NGC Bokaslit Fest. It's my enormous pleasure to escape from a Zoom screen to be in front of you on an actual old fashioned camera to tell you about the three prizes that have been founded by Bokas, which will be the object of this evening's event. The OCM Bokas Prize is funded by One Caribbean Media. The Johnson and Amoy Achong Caribbean Writers' Prize is funded by Dr. Kongchek Achon Lau in memory of his parents. And the Bocas Henry Swansea Award is one that recognizes people behind the scenes who actually have developed Caribbean literature and promote it, which is funded by the Bocas at Fest itself.
The OCM Booker's Prize for Caribbean Literature is actually a prize for excellence, and the Johnson Amoy Achang Prize is for emerging writers. Both of these prizes are extremely important. One actually gathers Caribbean writers from anywhere in the world um, in one place, whether they write fiction, non-fiction, or poetry. And the Johnson and Amoy Achang Prize is a unique prize because it's a prize that well, I would say it's the only prize probably anywhere, but certainly in the Caribbean, that actually allows a, a budding writer to, in, to improve their skills through mentorship and training for a whole year. And we're going to hear about all of those uh, winners and shortlisted people. And of course, we're going to start with the, um, the Johnson Amoy Achang Prize for this year. And before you hear any more about the shortlisted writers and the winner, you are going to hear from Sharma Taylor, who's a 2019 winner of the prize, and she's got some very exciting news to share. Hi, this is Sharma Taylor here, and some of you may have heard my fabulous news that I signed a two-book deal with Brago in um, UK, which is part of the Little Brown group of publishers. And I can tell you without a doubt that book deal would not have happened without the prize from Bocas, the Johnson and Amoya Chug. Um, prize, Writer's Prize, which I received in 2019. And I say this because this novel, my debut novel, which is called What a Mother's Love Don't Teach You, which is coming out God's Willing in summer next year, 2022, it began as a short story. And when I saw the call for entries into the Johnson and Amoya Chung Writer's Prize, I had an, a short story that I then outlined into a novel. I submitted it and to my surprise won. This award came at a time when I was questioning myself, do I have what it takes to be a serious writer, a good writer, a writer of compelling fiction? And this prize, the Johnson and Amoy Achong Writers Prize, gave me that yes, that yes, Sharma, you have something here, you have potential. It just needs to be harnessed, channeled, developed. And, it, and this prize gave me precisely that opportunity to do that. It gave me that impetus that I needed, that encouragement to keep writing. It also gave me an opportunity to go to the UK in October of 2019 in order to meet with agents, publishers, and who attend the Arvon course um, called Introduction to Novel Writing, which was held at Totley Barton in Devon in the UK. And that was a fantastic opportunity to network with other writers and agents and publishers, uh, including met with people from that Little Brown group. And I just want to make a very, very big push for the value of prizes like these. This, this would not have happened for me without this prize. These prizes do matter. They make a difference because from 2019 to now, um, definitely without this prize, without the tools it gave me to improve my craft, it gave me a you know, greater profile in the writing community and it gave me access to people who could say, yes, this is something that works or whether it doesn't. And that's completely invaluable. So I'd encourage all writers, emerging writers, to enter prizes like this, enter every prize that Bocas offers. I'd also encourage donors or potential donors to, to give to prizes like these. It's not just about the money, it's the world that you open up to a writer, um, the visibility you give to Caribbean literature, because when one of us succeeds, we all succeed. You are being part of a very, very important legacy you're being part of getting the West Indian voice heard, um, getting the West Indian voice out into the world on an international way, the same way that our music, our culture, our food has been, our literature deserves to be as well. Um, and I have eternal thanks to the donor of the Johnson and Amoy Achang Writers Prize, Dr. Achang Lau, as well as the organizers, judges, including Dr. Funso, the whole Bocas team, and a very special thanks to Marina, the founder of Bocas Lit Fest. Marina has been a passionate, selfless, tireless worker in the cause of advancing Caribbean literary voices. She has been committed, diligent, moving mountains to get things done. Sometimes it may be a thankless job, a stressful job, but Marina, what you are doing is what I would say, God's work. You're 
building that legacy of literature. You're making an impact in the life of emerging writers, established writers, readers, wannabe um, writers. Like you, you have made a platform for people to engage and to advance Caribbean literature globally. And that's no small feat. And long may the N NGC Bocas Big Fest prosper. Long may NGC support this venture. And long may donors come forward to support a cause like this. Thank you. Sharma's news has got to be about the best news that's happened in the last few weeks, or maybe last month or so, along with the news that the two Caribbean writers, both Trinidadian women, were on the shortlist for the Costa Book Awards. Ingrid Passard for the best first novel, and Monique Roffey for the best novel. And Monique Roffey's The Mermaid of Black Conch actually took home the prize. We're delighted for them and for all the Caribbean writers who are actually breaking through and getting recognition. I know that, um, Sharma, we're going to hear a lot more from you. So huge congratulations. We're, we're looking at you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Kongshek Achong Lau. And uh, I'm here today because uh, very shortly, uh, the winner of this year's Johnson & Amoy Achong Writers' Prize is going to be selected. So this is the third year of the Johnson and Amoy Atron Writers Prize being awarded. And uh, you know, the first year's winner, Sharma Taylor, has gone on, I'm told, to have uh, secured a two book contract with Viragra Press in the UK. And uh, I am really very excited to hear that. I, it makes me feel very, very uh, happy to know that in some form or fashion, some little way, maybe that this uh, prize uh, facilitated that uh, leap forward that she has made. And uh, what I would like to say to Sharma Taylor, to Amanda Chukwan, the second year winner, and to this year's winner coming up soon, um, don't stop there. Uh, the world is your oyster, so just reach forward and the next stop may be the Pulitzer Prize. Who knows? So it gives me great pleasure to have sponsored this prize in memory of my parents. Um, and that was done because as a child, I was taught the value of reading books by my mother in particular. My mother did not have more than four years of schooling. My father had no years of schooling, but they both uh, treasured the, the knowledge that one assimilated from reading. And as a, as a child, even before teenage years, I had the opportunity to, re to read very voraciously. I think it has stood me in very good stead. Uh, you know, that's the way you gain knowledge, certainly at that time. Now we gain knowledge uh, from the internet, but it's still the, the same source of everything. Uh, you know, you're reading material that people have written and, you know, without writers, then there's nothing to read. And uh, I think that, you know, every child uh, should be exposed to as much reading as possible. And uh, I think this is what uh, makes the the entire knowledge of the of the uh, generations keeps going forward. Now we're going to hear readings from this, this year's three finalists, but before that, we're going to hear comments from the Chief Judge, Professor Funcho Aijina, and he's also going to announce this year's winner. Good day, everyone. Uh, literary award ceremonies celebrate writers, but every literary prize needs judges. We have done this for six years now, three years as a Holly Cavan brand, and three years as Johnson and Amoy Achong brand. I have served as a chief judge, or more correctly, as a coordinating judge for all six editions. Before we get down to the real business of this occasion, I would like to take a moment to thank all the judges over the six years. For this year, I would like to thank Git Mejuk, the representative of the Achong family on the panel, Andrew Kidd 
from the Avon Foundation in the UK, Chris Wellbeloved from Aitken Alexander Associate, a top UK literary agency, and Tanya Shirley, an exciting Jamaican poet. On behalf of myself and the Bookers organization, I would like to express heartfelt gratitude to them for their dedication and generosity of spirit. Now, to the writers who are the reason we are here, albeit virtually. The quality of the entries for the 2021 Johnson and Amoy Achon Caribbean Writers Prize was uneven. This, of course, is not surprising since the prize is a developmental prize. Some of the poets have not mastered the craft of poetry. A number of them failed to sustain their opening imagery. Some deployed disconnected symbolism, inappropriate diction, and inconsistent and illogical code switching between English and Creole. But the top contenders stood out bristling with promise. They deployed history, myth, and gender as means to tease out the nature of personal and group identities. They experimented with oral tradition through the use of spoken word techniques, nursery rhymes, rubber talk, and Rasta Grandation. Of those top contenders, the following rose to the top. Akim Alexis, known to the judges as applicant number 14. Desiree Sibran, known to the judges as applicant number 18. JT John, known to the judges as applicant number 33. Hi, my name is Akim Alexis, and I'm going to read a poem called Capoeira at Claxton Bay from my working manuscript. Capoeira at Claxton Bay. We take the long route, prisoners of the white lines on the main road, destination of salt and settled seaweed, winds that lash trunks of coconut trees, shifting sand already interrupted by toes. Mysterious jetties and frustrated fishermen appear ready for a day's work. If war was started at the shore, then it can only end there. Why else would the cobble linger? Dressed in baptismal white, ebony bodies march to Claxton and storm the beach. Like Columbus stormed the Caribbean blue while flags roared in tall, breezy satisfaction. The odor of the earth heightened by the sweat of polished muscular men heralding the hope of freedom preparing to wring it from their soul, subverting the wind with their bodies. To dwell on formations and fragments is to study the architecture of dance before dance had a name, when dance was territory of the scene disguised as silent rants of madness, set to the rhythms of drums accompanied by whistling winds and anxious crapples, seeking moist solitude. So instead, we dwell on survival, not of the fittest, for they already consider us fit to die, but survival of movement. We kept our white garments in tandem with rain flies, always in motion, but close to the skin. Our home is in limbo, dwelling with our brethren, warming up, swaying in triangular. All of us practicing our ginga, footprints etching our history into the land. Everything is movement. What we danced in Brazil moved across the sea, Dance and rebellion in transit, capoeira in cargo, destination Claxton. The hills are the umpire of terrain and the sun provides a thirst for water, balanced out only by the ocean, spectator to ancestral footwork. Hi, my name is Desiree Sibaran and I'll be reading three pieces for you today. The first one is called The Sweetest Horn. All three pieces are from my a uh, chapbook manuscript called Canal Water. The sweetest horn is bloody like your tongue, 
split by half-truths and heart-sick. It is floating, rocky, probing my sex with ungentle licks, sucking away at the marrow of us. The sweetest horn is verse in iambus, a beautiful fellatio, tearing tendon from stone, womb from wound, breaking my bones into rows and rows of questions and insomnia. It is cabalistic, a dark mania of mangrove rot, sinking love's lush mouth into me, dry-eyed and enraged. The sweetest horn is unpaved, throbbing to an orphic dead end, a moor of cracked obsidian, unforgiving. It is a dragon's mouth lashed with teeth, a neonate furred with learning goo. It cries and I yield tetrameter like mother's milk. You and I and she, we move as with a metronome. The sweetest horn is made of silk, soft shroud that fits me light as foam. Now bury me, she's almost home. The next piece I'll read for you is called Sargassa. One, afraid. It happened quickly. Her mind crashed, a wave's wild petaled edge onto sand in Miaro, unfurling whip hard frothing and furious, throbbing along with the tide until she was limp. Two, hold your breath. Then, under. Buoyed by the red mass of shifting, silent wheat. Nothing is clear. Wrapped languid, the pulse eased into soft touches and symmetry. The sargassum bleeds. Three, insensate. Acres and acres of self and ten feet of salt. You are made drunk by the dominance of an ocean's flesh on your grains of sand. Four, conversions of hypoxia. There is something in the water, they say. You are not yourself. We cannot leave scorched land just to live like fish. The seaweed has grown you new ears. What you hear is salt and bloody. Why not drown here? Five, post-mortem. Sea has no branch. When the red, wet weed feeds your soft muck and you cannot think how to light on land, remember, the sea's burden grows beyond bearing. Cracked ribs of coral bleached and feeding fresh on plastic. What is land? What is air and what is seawater? They all sting her eyes. We all drown. The last piece I'll read for you today is called Bajon. <laughs> I want to walk like a Bajon, like my father, striding in a suit, fat, black and bulletproof. Blue suit and expensive leather shoes, hours of black polish and black willpower. Face up, chest high, fat, black, and bulletproof. Always clean, pressed smiles, pink, jeweled ties. You could smell my father's cologne miles away, so I know when he is ready to leave. I am never ready. We would wait for a bus in the early gray, my stomach already a pit, a swamp of worry, congealed like algae on plastic in the drain behind us. My father is always calm, always cool, sometimes warm to strangers. He doesn't like me to hold his arm. I'll crease my school uniform, he says, and his jacket. From him, I learn to sit upright, to know that being a girl, black and full of holes, is fine. My name is JT John, reading from Black Joy Planter. All of you is marshland and meadow. You dreamt up a jungle of wild things every time you blinked. Last December, 
when you magicked yourself into a vision of skin-heated umber. Nobody asked you how. You donned your flesh like fresh earth worked to a sewable tooth. It was easy to see by January, the seeds you had scattered about yourself. The way you smiled around the busy network of roots spanning the width of your jaw and chin. The promise of foliage was evidence enough. In March, when the solitude came, you were already a garden unto yourself, growing into and out of all of the grooves of our confinement. Yours was the longest season of reaping I had ever seen firsthand. A true vision of Oko manifest. June came with a clamoring strangeness, and suddenly the earth was asking for all of you back. We gathered, us other planters, and talked of negotiation. But there was no arguing with the god of the ground. You always did have a knack of falling entirely into your work. Thank you. The shortlisted entries stood out for us because of their individual styles and the acuteness and complexity of the observations in them. The poems are impassioned, deftly modulated, thought-provoking, and narratively engaging. In the end, we chose the winning entry because of the confident poetic tone and the sensitive exploration of the intersection between gender and culture in it. The winning poet is witty, evocative, and challenges orthodoxy. The lines are tight, crisp, and because they are well honed, come across as effortless and unforced. On behalf of the judges, I would like to congratulate this year's winner of Johnson and Amoy Achon Caribbean Writers Prize. The winner was known to the judges throughout the judging process as applicant number 18. The winner of 2021 Johnson and Amoy Achon Caribbean Writers Prize for Poetry is Desiree Sebran. Desiree, please accept our congratulations. Well done. We, the judges, look forward to the inevitable blooming of your talent. And now we know the winner for this year's prize. Desiree Sibaran, and I give her my heartiest congratulations. Congratulations, Desiree. Go forward and do the very best. Make everybody proud. Huge congratulations to Desiree Sibaran from all of us. It's really, really wonderful news. And of course, we wish you the very, very best. And huge thanks to Funcho and his fellow judges, Sharon, Andrew, Christopher and get me. You know, you've done yeoman service over the last three years and um, we're very sorry that you're going to be seeing out the prize this year. Dr. Konchek Action Lau was a sponsor of this prize and he was very, very generous in allowing these new writers, you know, to, to find their head. Um, it's not easy to find donors. We are seeking a new donor and if you're that person, do get in touch. Now let us turn our attention to the Bocas Henry Swansea Award. And here's my colleague, Nicholas Lockling, who's a festival program director to tell you all about two very impressive awardees this year. My name is Nicholas Lockling, and I'm the program director of the NGC Bocas Lit Fest. I'm very happy to introduce the two joint winners of the 2021 Bocas Henry Swansea Award for Distinguished Service to Caribbean Letters. This award is named for the late BBC radio producer, Henry Swansea, an Irishman by birth. Swansea was the producer of the influential Caribbean Voices radio program, originally founded by the Jamaican writer Una Marson. Swansea worked on the program from 1946 to 1954, becoming an essential figure in the development of modern West Indian literature. The Bocas Litfest established this award in Swansea's memory 
to honor and celebrate the contributions of the writers, broadcasters, publishers, critics, and others who have shaped the evolution of Caribbean literature behind the scenes. Recipients of the Bocas Henry Swansea Award are selected by the festival's organizing committee. The past awardees were publishers John LaRose and Sarah White of New Beacon Books in 2013, literary critics Kenneth Ramchand and Gordon Rowlair in 2014, editor and broadcaster Margaret Busby in 2015, publisher Jeremy Pointing of People Tree Press in 2016, bookseller Joan Dale of Paper-Based Bookshop in 2017, editor and scholar Anne Wormsley in 2018, publisher Ian Randall in 2019, and scholar and editor Kamau Brathwaite last year in 2020. The joint awardees of this year's Bocas Henry Swansea Award are the Jamaican scholars and critics Edward Bohr and Mervyn Morris, who are widely considered pioneers of the study of West Indian literature over careers that each span half a century. Bohr and Morris are both alumni of what was originally called the University College of the West Indies, and spent their careers teaching at the University of the West Indies, from which they each retired as Professor Emeritus. Professor Edward Bohr, who was based at the UWI's Cave Hill Barbados campus from 1965 to 1967, then at Mona, Jamaica, is best known as a scholar of West Indian poetry, in particular the poetry of Derek Walcott, having written several books devoted to the work of the St. Lucian Nobel Laureate. Bohr also edited Walcott's 2007 collected poems. In his book, West Indian Poetry, 1900 to 1970, a study in cultural decolonization, and in his broad ranging scholarly essays, such as the groundbreaking Towards a West Indian Criticism and the West Indian Writer and his Quarrel with History, Edward Bohr helped shape a distinctly Caribbean approach to criticism of the region's literature grounded in the Caribbean's unique historical experiences. Professor Mervyn Morris, a lecturer at Mona since 1966, became known early in his career for his championing of Caribbean oral poetry traditions. His 1964 essay on reading Louise Bennett seriously was a landmark in scholarly attention to the literature of Jamaican patois, which Morris extended in the 1970s to the growing number of Jamaican dub poets. Many of his key earlier essays are collected in the book, Is English We Speaking? Morris also served as a mentor to several generations of Jamaican poets, editing and anthologizing their work, and in 2014 was appointed Poet Laureate of Jamaica, the first since independence, in which role he worked to raise the profile of poetry across the country, highlighting the work of younger writers. Five decades ago, when West Indian literature was introduced as a subject of formal academic study at UE's Mona campus, it was considered a bold and unprecedented development. Edward Bohr and Mervyn Morris, alongside other UWI colleagues, through their research, writing, teaching, and generous mentorship, were instrumental in decisively establishing a Caribbean school of literary scholarship which has contributed to the flowering of contemporary Caribbean writing and literary studies. Both Edward Bohr and Mervyn Morris are also accomplished and lauded poets, whose creative practice has inevitably informed and enriched their research. But it is their achievements as scholars, teachers, editors, mentors, and advocates, which the 2021 Bocas Henry Swansea Award recognizes and honors. We thank them and congratulate them. On behalf of the Department of Literatures in English at the University of the West Indies, Mona, I'd like to congratulate Professors Edward Baugh and Mervyn Morris on receiving the 2021 Henry Swansea Award. We hold these former members of our department and now Professors Emeriti in extremely high regard. The enormous contributions they have made in the fields of literature, particularly poetry and literature criticism, are well known and documented. In the department, however, we also know Eddie and Mervyn as respected and esteemed former colleagues, treasured not only for their deep and extensive knowledge of Caribbean literature and their groundbreaking work in criticism, but also for their civility and collegiality. 
We know them for their stewardship of our beloved department. We know them for their kindness and helpfulness as colleagues and academics. We know them for that frequent word of reassurance and encouragement to younger colleagues and scholars. Generosity is not a word that is often used to describe academics. And yet this is a word that most readily comes to mind when I think of these two beloved professors. We thank them for their generosity over the decades and we thank Bocas Litfest for recognizing their accomplishments with this signal award. Needless to say, I am happy and honored to receive this award and to be thereby promoted in the Bocas family. I have followed the development of the festival from its inception and have the pleasure and benefit of having been invited to participate on more than one occasion. The Bocas Litfest has steadily grown as a major player in the making and development of West Indian or Anglophone Caribbean literature, and indeed of Caribbean literature in the wider Caribbean or Pan-Caribbean sense across languages. I have been struck by the fact that the festival program has made a point of including presentations of critical historical commentary on the region's creative writing, commentary which fosters productive debate and no doubt, however indirectly, creative response from the writers. The Bocas Swansea Award has made a timely mark by focusing on critics and publishers, thereby complementing the Bocas Prizes, which reward creative writing in all genres. Bocas has shown its awareness of his role by, among other things, commemorating Henry Swansea, the Irishman who edited and produced after Jamaica's Una Marson and for most of its existence, the BBC program Caribbean Voices, a seedbed of West Indian literature. Unforgettable in my own literary shaping was my listening to the half hour program on Sunday evenings in the late 1940s and early 1950s before setting out on my one mile walk to church. I can even claim to have had a handful of poems and a short story broadcast on the program. I was able to discover Caribbean voices thanks to the fact that my father had bought a second hand table model shortwave radio during the Second World War, mainly so that he could listen to Winston Churchill. So Swansea and Bocas have mattered to me, and it is with a special sense of a kind of fulfillment that I am here now receiving the Bocas Swansea Award, for which abundant thanks. I'm honored to be receiving this award from Bocas and to be joining a band of people who have supported writers in various ways, perhaps by encouraging them before they were well known, perhaps by publishing their work, perhaps by editing their work, certainly by selling their work, and of course by offering useful criticism of their work. In my case, I have been particularly happy to be shown work by people who at the time that they showed it to me were not sure about it and who I was able to praise enough that they felt free to go and offer it to the wider public so that I was in some instances able to tell them that they were better than they thought. I thank people for showing me these things and I thank Bocas for recognizing the range of supporting people who are important really to the whole, um, whole business of writing. Eddie and Mervyn, on behalf of everybody in the writing community, I want to say huge thanks for you for everything you've done. The 
OCM Bocas Prize is 11 years old this year and I would say that the writing is as fresh as it was when we started in 2011 and that is because a whole new wave of writers have been coming through writing themselves into literary history uh, with new interests and new perspectives and I hope that all of us can work to make that continue. I want to thank all 10 judges who judged this year. It's not an easy thing to judge because this is a cross John prize, but um, they've been led by Vani Capaldeo, an outstanding poet herself, um, in coming up with this year's winner. And it's quite a list, so I know it was not an easy job. Before I pass you on to Vani to announce the winners and tell you more about why they picked the, the winner they did, you can enjoy readings by the three shortlisted writers um, and they'll be introduced by the chair of each of the categories that, in which they were judged. Hello, I am Opal Palmer Adisa and I'm very honoured to have been invited to head the Boca Poetry Prize for 2021 and to share this decision with fellow judges Kai Kellogg and Daniel Badu Fortune. I have loved and written poetry since I was 10 years old and I believe the Bocas Prize to be the most important in the Caribbean and can help to ensure a poet's place in the literary canon and wider global poetry community. We were sent 14 books, 14 collections, several of them well-crafted, so I had anticipated a wrangling among us about the selection. However, to my surprise, except for the case of one text, Danielle, Kai and I were unanimous and rejoiced about Canice Lubris, the dysgraphics. People will say it differently. The language is a lightning bolt opening up spaces and meanings not previously considered in that manner. Reading this collection makes you hold your breath and dive to the ocean floor and emerge right in the waves. A journey where meaning is often an unpaved road, but the ride is richly satisfying. There is an echo of Amy Césaire, Return to My Native Land, but it is a different surrealist swim. And I certainly remember at 15 reading Amy Césaire. Everything is at risk. The lyrics fragments into multiple eyes. The lines itself rides a sinuine wave. The textual becomes visual and even coherence is beautifully coupled with noise. Amidst all of this, a concern for our world and a speaking out against exploitation and climate disaster remains central, intact and allow necessity to direct the experimentation. These are not easy poems, but there is undeniable music to them, a tidal ebb and flow beneath the complexities of language and questions of identity, place, and environmental concerns are evident. Our other choices for the shortlist Guanabec says by Celia Surihando, I'm messing up people's name, forgive me. The poems in Celia's exciting first collection build momentum, gathering strength and intensity like a hurricane, spiraling in and out searching to find language, form and expression to hold the vastness and the vulnerability of life on an island. Using destruction as both a metaphor as well as the literary reality of Caribbean life, Soriana manages to convey a collective trauma that moves through and beyond pain and loss to what is valuable and possible. All is rendered bare, not to gawk at, but rather to pick through and collect the preciousness of life that the language preserves. This collection confirms that compression and expansiveness are not exclusive. Inhabiting Brathwaite's foundational observation that the hurricane does not roar in pentameters, Guana Bex dwells in Hurricane Maria and crafts a language and a poetic form, the force of that event. Our third choice was Country of Warm Snow by Mervyn Taylor. And I like the straightforwardness of Taylor's work, grounded in a satisfying assurance, yet moves beyond the ordinary as it focuses on the ordinary, 
a clean, even tone that allows the reader to pause and enjoy what is before us, accomplished without fanfare, smoothness, clarity, and a sense of narrative that does not break with the line. These characteristics make Country of Warm Snow a rare book that reads with deceptive ease. Deceptive because complexity has been distilled into clarity and the language itself can shift between transparency and vividness, understatement and immediacy. The poems move fluidly across time and borders while being rooted deeply in place. This is a collection that builds in strength and intensity as it progresses with a stunning thread of mysticism woven through illuminating and elevating the everyday. So we are really very happy and want to congratulate, and of course I want to thank Kenise Lubris for this great collection, The Disc Graphics, which um, really speaks to many I voices, the I and I movements of the Rastafarians. Although my own poetry aims at straight talk that meets the majority of readers where they are, I must confess an admiration for those poets who blew off the top of my head. Poetry is not one thing, nor should prizes or poet elites make it this classical art that is outside the reach of the masses. But I do feel that good poetry must take us outside and beyond ourselves. It should force us to grapple with ideas in new ways. It should push us to do what we have been fearing. It should invite our divine self to communicate with the clouds and sing with the worms nurturing the soil. It should become a new song we find ourselves Amen. I know I will go back again and again to read these graphics and with each read discover more and more and so will you. Thank you for this privilege. I am Opal Palmer Adisa. My name is Kinesia Lubrin. I'm the author of The Disgraphist, which is the poetry winner um, of the OCM Bocas Prize. I would like to thank very quickly Dion Brand my editor, for all the light and language, and um, also Christina Sharp, Kelly, Anita, Jared, Ruter, and everyone at MNS for their work. Um, and low bow to my companions in this glorious affair, Macy and Andre, uh, and certainly Focus and the judges, and absolutely anyone who has had a hand, a heart, a word, anything to do with this book. You know yourselves. Is it not enough to enter ending oneself in the halving road and the fires in us blot the coasts that reject us and we sugar the desert we screed frantic for fullness if fragile if symbols if nothingness at first a doubt escalating our verbings if still ourselves a thing to become past wavering interests in peace, given only for spilling, recall that face which is no face, a craved choice, Eureka in someone's drawn God, I and the next could praise now, if I were not set ablaze enough. If that morning I hadn't the thirst to lean into the world with an ear to a mouth. Begging for the happened thing, for something disguised. What could prove this dust is freshly mouthed, not some cyclic, newly vaporized empire settling its faithless wages. Eyes masses, these bent backs. Enough. Turning homeward, on a foot two shoe sizes into adulthood, Jejun returns with fire in the veins. With a voice dug up from the middle sea, hitting the market crowd as stones. In the spirit of recklessness, in the 401s meandering, and all the shortened lives arrayed as welcome. Though it is not a welcome that Jejun seeks, nor dangles from bare hands, set to the work of measuring the distance between eyes, hips, and the descending wail of city women in the middle of the square, I says, touch anywhere, and begin, or press enter. Jejun, exhume eyes tongue from the buried records, 
and you had, as you had asked when you were ten. Except, do not lob it at the floating hand I sent there a decade earlier to wait. Now, even with a percussed tongue, I can put the world back together with the twisted timbers of a ship. Okay, maybe give I some spices. Give I the whole shape of a metamorphosis to wear. Give I the Labrador Sea and the 900 feet between the black skin and the blow it dislodges. Give I the sharp and wary self. I could sit in a boat and be cold. Fouette ces manières bêtes. Yet in this tent, I let you sicken me with song. I mean you, poet from Cyprus, to insist in these last days. You keep your fire, a mod guitar. Now they took our voices and left us, still encamped. Maybe our hope is in the poet from Finland, reseeding this Cayman in its ripped 2018, and what else to do? Still to be reminded of this unsleeping word in this unsleeping country, north of the Tropic of Cancer. Or what God's birthplace? This, such a place would be a transit town gathering us up, the embers of failed revolutions. And so what is happening now, poet? Do you make a fine noise of our unquiet in Hebrew? Make them all listen and rethink. Do the dogs mind lies? In Espanola, do they mind the black mouth weeping, speaking then? We believe they bark in Swahili, so no credit here. I have this problem dream. Then again, such brutality, verbs tragic as the margins. The weekly diatribes of rainbows in the summer. How else to live? How else these leaps in logic against a god obsessed with white? A god obsessed. This generic panic makes me want to throw paint or paint the town aflame. If I had not stumbled in this place, if homelessness too simple a condition for the thing I lived. If for the people who live this still, who I now only glimpse through this windshield, myself wanting to pull over, give them coffee, shave their chests, twist their hair into buns, or more elegant things. Needless that I should only have new money or old or whatever to survive the iota. I tell you again, I am not myself. I resemble amusement parks built for consolation, for our dusty interactions, for the mimic. Jejun, all of these words, microphone, the wordless material anyway. And the dread thing is that I forget and must do it all again. A dysgraphist. Je connais justement. I redone when the world itself awakes again. As I take a last picture of you as before, this time, Jejun, now 100 years influent in Hausa, the shutter will keep something of you inside it. It is better this way, or I would have no reason at all to write you. What folds your ear sideways to my mouth, I to slip into, wondering what we might have become, were we not so alive? Thank you. Hello, my name is Malachi McIntosh. I'm the editor and publishing director of Wasafir magazine, and also the chair of this year's Fiction Prize, um, and also someone who has not been professionally shaved or haircut in a long time. Forgive me for that. I worked alongside this year um, fellow judges Roland Gulliver and Tiffany Yannique, and it was a distinct honor to spend time with them reading and discussing and agreeing both on the shortlist and on the winners. Um, it's an honor too to be here with all of you to talk about both the shortlist and the winner 
um, albeit from a distance through virtual space. In advance of talking through the shortlist and, and moving on to their winner, I wanted to say a few words about um, the, the sum total of books which were submitted to the prize this year. They spanned a wide range of authorial backgrounds, locations, and covered a range of topics that really jumped out to us, from Venezuelan migration to Trinidad, to Haitian lives lived in the wake of the Duvalier regime, to two quite moving short story cycles, one in particular which focused on the lives of Caribbean women in diaspora, the many struggles and privations and joys, I suppose, of their experiences. There were, however, three books about which we just couldn't disagree that announced themselves as very significant pieces of work published this year. These were in order of author surname, Maisie Carr's These Ghosts Are Family, Ingrid Persaud's Love After Love, and Monique, Monique Rafi's The Mermaid of Black Conch. Something that united all of the books that we read this year was their collective focus on loss, both individual and, and more broader societal. Books from authors from across the Caribbean, which looked at the kind of close domestic experiences of loss from things like family bereavement to the inevitable, broader, more complicated losses of diaspora, a complicated interplay between home and abroad and all of the emotional um, uh, alterations that, that happen as a result of that process. In and among all of the books, the ones that stood out were all the novels that didn't just present loss, but also thought about reclamation. From The Mermaid of Black Conscious, representation of the racial and gendered cleavages from the very earliest moments in the Caribbean's history, thinking actively about how a society might grow out of those, how those things can be progressed from. In Love After Love, a very closely observed consideration of bereavement, abuse, trauma, and the day-to-day -day privations of living as a closeted person in a homophobic society, but thinking too, again, how a community and individuals can emerge from those experiences. And then Maisie Carr's These Ghosts of Families, engagement with the losses and legacies of slavery, its consideration of a lost archive, and its thinking about how we can speak into the absences in Caribbean history. Our deliberations were long. We tussled over the ideal measure by which to judge all of the books we considered. And we landed upon um, attentiveness to language, a unified vision and innovation and form. We disagreed in our personal assessments of the different merits of different features of the books, from the reasons of history, to the prescriptions they offered, to the problems of loss that they presented, to gendered and racialized politics, to, and this is a fraught and a longish conversation, their caribbean which is a very interesting conversation, especially reflecting on a space that has had a diaspora for many hundreds of years, this question of authenticity. In the circuits of our discussion, we kept coming back to one book, though, again and again and again, one that consistently surprised us, in the words of one judge, never took the easy solution to untangling its narrative knots and was innovative in structure and surprised us with its form. It was not always comfortable reading, but it was almost always excellent writing. Writing that was visceral, affecting, stirring, and had this unity of vision. So from the three of us, the winner of this year's fiction prize is Maisie Card's novel, These Ghosts, our family. I'd like to say thank you to everyone who submitted to the prize, both the individual authors and also their publishers, and wanted to make special mention to those who submitted self-published novels. It's by no means an easy feat to get your work out into the world on your own, and by no means anything less than an act of, you know, confidence and bravery to submit your work to a prize like this one. Um, your efforts are recognized and appreciated. Congratulations to the shortlistees and especially congratulations to Maisie Card on her extremely impressive prize winning debut. Hi, I'm Maisie Card, author of These Ghosts Are Family, and I'm going to be reading a selection from the first chapter of my novel. Let's say that you are a 69 year old Jamaican man called Stanford or Stanford Short who once faked your own death. 
though you have never used those words to describe what you did. At the time, you thought of it as seizing an opportunity placed before you by God. But since your wife, Adele, died a month ago, you've convinced yourself her heart attack was retribution for your sin. So today, you have gathered three of your female descendants in one house, even the daughter who has thought you dead all these years and decided that you will finally tell them the truth. You are not who you say you are. You have spent the last 20 years of your second life living in a brownstone in Harlem, running a West Indian grocery store. Recently, you shuttered the store. You have given up on fighting your arthritis pain and are finally sitting in the wheelchair Adele picked out. You are looking out of your parlor window, waiting for your daughter, the one who thinks you are dead, to arrive. It's been 35 years since you've seen her, so you study each woman who passes your house for reflections of yourself. You haven't bothered to shave, press your clothes, or comb your hair. You are ready to be still and rot. You imagine the death of Stanford Solomon, unlike the abrupt end of Abel Paisley, will be achingly slow. Already it feels like you are losing small pieces of yourself daily. To you, old age is a torture you deserve, a slow, insignificant death your matter dispersing into the air like dandelion seeds until the day there's nothing left. When you died the first time, you were still a young man in your 30s and had been working in England for less than a year. It wasn't easy for an immigrant, especially a black man, to find a decent job back then. But through a boy you'd known back in primary school, Stanford, you'd gotten a room and a job on a ship. You had no idea it was just the beginning of your streak of good luck. You and Stanford were the chosen wogs they allowed to work alongside the white men. Stanford complained often about London. He hated the cold. He missed his grandmother and the tiny village, Harold Town, where you'd both grown up back in Jamaica. You'd already escaped the countryside for Kingston and from there, London. You felt free. That sense of freedom and joy only dampened when you thought of the family you left behind. Your first wife, Vera, wrote you long letters weekly about how you'd abandoned her and left her to become a dried up old spinster. But you both know perfectly well that it was her idea for you to come to England where she thought you'd somehow become a better provider. Your son, Vincent, was still in Vera's womb when you sailed off. Your daughter, Irene, a stumbling toddler. You had barely settled in when Vera's first letter arrived with the list of things she wanted you to buy and send to them. With every letter, the list grew longer and you worried that you would never be enough. The day you died, you were running along the dock because you were late for work while a container was being lowered onto the ship. You stopped short when the container fell, dropped from the crane and thundered against the deck. You were close enough to hear the screaming who was it? You heard someone shout. One of the wogs, another answered. It's Abel. For a moment, you were confused, hearing yourself pronounced dead. It was like one of those movies where the dead person's spirit stands by watching as a crowd gathers around his body. But no, you were certain it wasn't your body, so you boarded the ship. The captain approached you immediately and said, I'm sorry, mate. No way Abel could have survived that. You almost laugh now when you think of it, the one time racism worked in your favor. The captain had gotten his wogs confused, looked you right in the eye, and mistook you for the other black guy. Abel was dead, crushed under the container, unrecognizable, but you, Stanford now, could turn and go home. Greetings. I am Rosamond S. King, and I had the privilege of being the head judge for the 2021 Bocas Nonfiction Prize. The other judges and I reviewed a broad range of histories, memoirs, and scholarly titles, and we all agreed on the three books on our shortlist. We enjoyed the romp of Gordon Roller's innovative Musings, Mazes, Muses, Margins, which tells the stories of his life through a triple protagonist and a dream diary. We also enjoyed the poetic book-length experimental essay of color 
by Catherine Agyema Agard, which provides an introspective story of her life with photographs and visual art, as well as words. Each work on the shortlist demonstrates depth of thought, literary skill, and structural experimentation, and each of them is grounded in Caribbean content. The judges were excited to choose Andre Bagu's collection of essays, The Undiscovered Country, as the 2021 winner because of Bagu's attention to language, as well as the structure of the essays and the connections he makes between seemingly disparate topics. While many of his essays are ostensibly traditional, the language, his turns of phrase, his transitions among paragraphs, makes the writing stand out. And several of the essays are successfully experimental and playful. Bagu uses erasure in his essay on Henry James, and he uses poetry in essays on Boris Johnson and Michael John Casabon. Bagu also engages the concept of the visual essay in an essay on the visual poetry of S.J. Fowler. This collection of essays is not afraid to take risks or to challenge accepted knowledge. The undiscovered country is full of insights and surprises with bursts of humor. We were struck as judges by the connections the author makes, such as between Angostura bitters and Venezuelan immigration to Trinidad, as well as by the research he presents in fresh and engaging ways, from visual art to literature to food. Essays that speculate, such as the one on V.S. Naipaul and the one on Eric Williams, are compelling and fascinating and it will be a challenge to see those figures differently after reading Bagu's collection. While Caribbeanness is not strictly criteria for the OCM Bocas Prize, the nonfiction judges appreciated that Bagu was able to take Caribbean subjects seriously on their own, to put them in dialogue with other content, such as an essay comparing Caribbean poem and Mark Twain's poem, and that Bagu also engages non-Caribbean content, from Icelandic art to Langston Hughes. The Undiscovered Country is as exciting and delightful as its title. The destination is an adventure, and both the journey and the ending are enjoyable. Congratulations, Andre Bagu. Hi, I'm Andre Bagu, and I'm a finalist for the 2021 OCM Bocas Prize in Caribbean Literature Nonfiction category. And today I'm going to read from The Undiscovered Country, which is a collection of essays. Crusoe's Island. The main ridge is said to be the oldest reserve in the Western Hemisphere. There are about 160 species of trees. At least 16 can be found nowhere else. When you walk through this ancient forest, the cool air is filled with a woody incense. The forest is on a high volcanic ridge. A mist falls, a miasma, as the primeval trees stand like sentinels guarding some dark, hidden nirvana. A sap-sweet fragrance lures you to come deeper, yet parts of the mountain terrain are impassable. I see Crusoe here, trying to make his way through the dense opulence as small golden frogs look on from the mulch, brooding, indifferent to his fate. But the idea of Tobago as a perfectly preserved Eden, is also something of a myth. When Hurricane Flora hit in 1963, about 75% of the forest was destroyed. What survives is an echo of what was left. And with its international airport, roads, ports, real estate developments, and coastal resorts, the Tobago of the 18th century has been recast in concrete. Perfect. This is the lesson, a 
of Robinson Crusoe. Wherever placed, whether in the imagination or in a physical geography, the story is a fantasy. In James Joyce's diagnosis, it is a particularly English fantasy, a colonial delusion, an imperial project, a vision of self-mastery and conquest. Unlike Joyce, I see the Crusoe fantasy as something that sails across nationality. It is a virus, a constellation of malarious ideas, the utopian notion of a pure, untouched land, the image of a man-god in Eden, and the dream of the all-conquering toxic male in virgin terrain. There's something of this Crusoe contagion lurking inside the very idea of nationalism. He represents the idea of being singled out for survival, of being able to master a plot of land bestowed by divine forces. Who is not drawn to this notion of being special, of possessing deep down the power to be one's true master? The OCM Bocas Prize is a uniquely significant and memorable award. It uplifts the literature of the Caribbean region and its diaspora in a triumph over repeated shocks of forgetting, invalidation, pigeonholing and erasure. Prizes may be associated with competition, with winners and losers, a retrogressive mindset. Prizes may be associated with celebration, which in this second year of the global pandemic certainly is good. The OCM Bocas Prize is associated with connection. The many names brought forward by the conversations around this prize, publishers, editors, trusted readers, and even judges, as well as authors, show that we all are involved in the living and ongoing formation of a canon of literature characterized by fearless diversity and by marvelous traditions of experimentation and collaboration. Yes, there can be a tradition of experimentation. No author truly works alone. Bringing prominence, recognition and support to these books creates and continues conversations. How do you remember the OCM Bocas Prize books of years past? For me, they are a string of lights across often turbid waters. Each year there are, or should be, nine long-listed books, three each in the categories of fiction, non-fiction and poetry, then three books should go forward to the shortlisting stage, a work of fiction, a work of non-fiction and a volume of poetry. Finally, there's an overall winner. However, in my memory, all of the cited names from years past remain in circulation. Outstanding, yes, but equally outstanding and in relation with our region's literature, past, present, and future. I would like to thank my fellow judges, Rosamond King, nonfiction, Malachi McIntosh, fiction, and Opal Palma Adisa, poetry. They were generous with their time during a reflective process and more than one session, and breathtakingly honest with their passionate and critical responses. We agreed to draw up a list of criteria as well as having free-form discussion, with considerations ranging from craft to pleasure. The tenth and final criterion was personal response. How profoundly and or positively were you moved, changed or challenged? Receiving a prize boosts a book and an author. That work goes out into the world. It does things. It can have a real and lasting effect on our sense of who we are, of how people can be, what language can do, the way we let ourselves think inside ourselves when we don't even know we're thinking. Nothing will seem quite the same again after that, was our feeling, after reading each of the three category winners, Andre Bagu, The Undiscovered Country, nonfiction, Maisie Card, these Ghosts of Family, Fiction, and Canisia Lubrin, 
the dysgraphist poetry. That's D-Y-Z-G-R-A-P-H-X-S-T. Our opinions remain divided, even as we chose an overall winner. As we all saw individual strengths in each of these vastly different books, the decision rarely was close. Andrew Bagu's non-fiction collection, The Undiscovered Country, People Free Press, is a work of human and imaginative brilliance. The attention to language is glitteringly constant, through forms that range from accessible essays and meditations to visual art, criticism by collaged quotations, and even poetry, perhaps writing back to the trend for poetry collections to contain prose. Both the journey and the ending are enjoyable. We are led to speculate on the connections between unusual topics, from the everyday like street food to the historical. This is a book to give to friends and to include in teaching. Congratulations and thank you, Andre. Maisie Card's novel, These Ghosts of Family, Simon and Schuster, is a cohesive, innovative and precise achievement. This bleak, compelling and haunting cycle shows originality of imagination as well as grounding in research. Without wanting to give away spoilers, we were impressed by just how far this book could travel from episode to episode, character to character, and place to place, yet finally bring about a sense of return. The satisfaction arising from this formal technique feels like closure. However, the novel is uncompromising about the impossibility of closure in the face of mixed complicity and oppression from generation to generation. The intensity and clarity of imagination, which shows people inhabited by their ghosts in very rare locations, is in the excellent tradition from Jean Rhys to Austin Clark. Thank you, Maisie, and congratulations. This year's winner, Canisia Lubrin's The Dysgraphist, Penguin Random House, is a book-length poem that exemplifies post-colonial poetry at its best. It is exciting, experimental, and maintains integrity from beginning to end. Conversation and connection with other writers and writings has become one of the traits of Caribbean and diaspora literature in our emerging heritage. The dysgraphist clearly is aware of and alive with the impulses and innovations of Aimé Césaire, Dion Brand, and so many more revolutionary thinkers with whom we have been blessed. This book changed me when I was reading it. The first encounter felt almost grueling. It was as if one of those machines that opticians use was opening up in my insides, click, 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 blurring and refocusing my eyes until I saw afresh with stunning clarity and in a greater field of vision than before. From section to section, there was this repeated process of revisioning. These poems take apart our individual personal pronoun, the I, questioning and finding new ways to feel and think and know what we suppose to be our self. Some books use language to keep running smoothly. This book shifts what language can be and do. It is thrilling to read it and to relish giving up the illusion of mastery of meaning, revel in not fully understanding, like swimming beyond the breakers in a sea full of flotsam and jetsam. Reading the Dysgraphist the second time, aware of its stunning intelligence and moral commitment, I was taken back afresh this time by the beauty of the poetry. The intelligence plays through vivid and a true ecology of being, in which a butterfly can open from an eye. Congratulations, Canisia, on the deserved recognition for your achievement. It is a humbling pleasure to say that your book receives this year's award. And what a deserving winner. In fact, what deserving winners than what a deserving shortlist of writers too. 
Huge congratulations to all of you. And I want to say congratulations to, to everybody on the long list. I can recommend these winning books to you, and I can recommend most, and if not all, of the long-listed books to you as well. Thanks, everybody, who entered the OCM Booker's Prize this year. Please keep writing. Thank you very, very much for what you've been giving us. And I really need to say a huge thanks to, to One Caribbean Media, and particularly to Dawn Thomas, the CEO, who's who really does take a personal interest in our writing and what is going on and has actually made it possible for OCM to be our media partner for the last 11 years. One Caribbean Media is very pleased to have the opportunity to once again sponsor and present the winner of the OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature. This year marks the 11th year of the prize. And we at OCM are very much committed to continue this very important celebration and recognition of our regional literary talent. This year's winners, along with past winners, are doing a tremendous job in showcasing to the world the diversity and quality of the talent of the Caribbean people. There were 53 entries for the 2021 OCM Bookers Prize this year, with many excellent titles among them and one of the best long lists to date in all the categories. It will be interesting to see what impact the pandemic may have on the 2022 prize as publishing schedules had to shift. However, we have faith in the resilience of our regional writers, and we expect that they will continue to deliver high quality submissions that we have grown accustomed to over the years. I'd like to celebrate now the three category winners of this year's Booker's Prize. Macy Card, whose novel, These Ghosts of Family, copped the fiction category prize. Kinesia Lubrin, winner of the poetry category with her collection, The Disgraphist. And Andre Bagu, winner of the non-fiction category for his essay collection in the undiscovered country. And now I would like to warmly congratulate the newly announced overall winner of the 2021 OCM Bocas Prize, Kinesia Lubrin, whose poetry in The Disgraphist is eye-opening, thought-provoking, and full of wonder. Congratulations to all of our winners, and I wish you all continued success with your future writing endeavors. Thank you. And so it's a wrap for us for today. We're back tomorrow. Uh, don't go anywhere. Go to sleep, but come back tomorrow. We'll be back at nine in the morning with um, an hour of wonderful children's programming, followed by at 10 o'clock, The Big Idea. This year, it's going to be about the way ahead in the Caribbean after COVID-19. And of course, that's going to be followed by our usual extempo debate on the same subject. So see you tomorrow.